as we know, today's technology is increasingly advanced. People are competing to apply technology to streamline their work, especially artificial intelligence technology, which is very popular everywhere. This technology can be used in various sectors, including the environment. It is time for us environmental activists to see this technological development as an advantage to manage the environment effectively and efficiently. For this reason, the International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues, and Community Development or INCRED gives a platform for professionals, researchers, and academicians to share their experiences and explore the possible influence on the future. In Korea 2023 comes with a theme of reinventing integrated solutions to environmental problems in the era of environmental intelligence, where the theme this time is very new and follows technological developments. INCRIT can be a place to build connection between researchers, students, and industry to continue working together to produce work for the environment. INCRIT 2023 provides a platform to continue exploring, discovering, and developing works that can later become a new start for environment development. INCRIT 2023 bring several topics and subtopics regarding the environment that revolves around zero carbon by implementing a circular economy in other methods, namely environmental health and safety, environmental science, technology and education, green infrastructure, energy conservation, and efficiency. Inquit progress from year to year has great hopes of becoming an international forum that can be developed by researchers, students, industry, and government to communicate their research results and exchange ideas about its basis and application in the environment. Inquit can also be a conduct for ideas to help improve technology and produce a better earth from year to year. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. May your dream fly high. Imagination will take you everywhere. The future is always beginning now. Universitas di Penogoro, UNDIP, is one of the oldest public universities in Indonesia, established on January 9, 1957, located in Semarang, Central Java, Indonesia. Since the enactment of the government regulation number 52 of 2015, the status of UNDIP is legal and it is state university. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Greeting for University di Ponegoro, the best university in Indonesia. Universitas di Ponegoro, 
as one of the universities in Indonesia, has declared to be research university with an international reputation in accordance with the vision of be become an excellent research university. As an international world-class research university, although UNIF is expected to have a good academic reputation that create globally competitive graduates with excellent competence, conduct continuous research and development for the people with continuous improvement of human resources by internal standard capacity development program. Internationally, UNDIP has ranked by the QS World University Ranking and Times Higher Education World University Ranking as the top 8 best universities in Indonesia. UNDIP was ranked in the 2021 QS Asian University Ranking. University Graduate Employability at 2020 QS World Ranking and in the 2021 QS World University Ranking by Subject for Business and Management Studies. Moreover, UNDIP also ranked by Times Higher Education World University Ranking for Times Higher Education Impact Ranking and Times Higher Education World University Ranking by Subjects for Business and Economic, Life Science, physical science, and engineering and technology. For environmental sustainability, UE Green Metric also posted UNDIP at 39th World University Rankings. UNDIP has a strong commitment to improving the quality of education towards global standards by continuously improving the quality of education for its students, increasing the quantity and quality of research and scientific publications, and contributing to society through community services. Strategic planning and efforts being implemented to internationalize UNDIP is by opening international class programs in various study programs, allocating scholarship opportunities for applicants from abroad through the Dipenogoro Master Scholarship or DIS program and Dipenogoro Exchange Experience Program or DIP cooperating with leading universities in the world concerning education collaboration such as facilitating UNDIP students to study abroad and vice versa. Faculty of Law has developed with the improvement of the education system, the increase in number and quality of teaching staff, lecturers, as well as the increasing number of facilities and infrastructure supporting the education. Faculty of Economics and Business the faculty which has an international undergraduate program and Bloomberg Collaboratory facilities was ranked 501-550 in QS World University ranking by subject 2021. Faculty of Engineering also a home for research center such as Membrane Research Center and Center for Biomechanics, Biomaterial, Biomechatronics and Biosignal Processing. Faculty of Medicine is one of the best faculties at Universitas Diponegoro. Faculty of Medicine has complete laboratories which support the student practicum. Faculty of Medicine also become the important part of the establishment of Rumah Sakit Nasional Diponegoro RSND or Diponegoro National Hospital that belongs to Universitas Diponegoro. Faculty of Animal and Agriculture Science has transformed through sustainable concept and digitalization by the development of digital farming and sustainable livestock. Faculty of Humanities consists of several study programs, include literature, language, history, anthropology, libraries, philosophy, and archives. It has several language centers such as Indonesian, 
English, and Japanese. The Indonesian History Research Center and Local Culture Preservation Research Center. Faculty of Social Science and Political Science. It has the International Relations Study Program that is well known amongst prospective students. Whereas the Communication Study Program emphasizes collaborations with local and national mass media to channel the student talents by directly practicing it. Faculty of Science and Mathematics is a home for several research centers such as Center for Plasma Research that focus on the plasma application and Center of Marine Ecology, Biomonitoring and Sustainable Aquaculture that covers a various aspect of marine ecology. Faculty of Public Health aims to create graduates with good competency and skills in the public health. It's supported by academic and research activities that are intensively conducted in the area of occupational health and safety area, health promotion, stunting, and many others. The Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science has vision to become an excellent faculty in the field of fisheries and marine tropical by 2024. It becomes the center for education, research, and community development for the coastal region. It has center for coastal disaster mitigation and rehabilitation studies and natural laboratory for fisheries study, marine conservation, and biodiversity as well as disaster mitigation and coastal management and rehabilitation. Faculty of Psychology Universitas Diponegoro also provides international exposure in the form of student exchange and summer course programs. School of Postgraduate Studies was established in order to respond to the global challenge with a multi- and interdisciplinary approach. In vocational school Universitas Diponegoro, the students were educated with curriculums that is in line with the industrial needs. Apart from that, the vocational school equipped with certified smart green building that use renewable energy as a power source along with water and wastewater treatment system for the water resources. Supporting the vision to become an excellent research university, UNDIP established the laboratory center with high-tech equipment, several research centers in the field of medicine, food technology, water and wastewater treatment, renewable energy development, health supporting technology, advanced material engineering, culture preservation, sustainable development and established marine science techno park for research and technology development in the field of marine and fisheries and the incubation for the startup business which is open for international and domestic student internship. UNDIP has various supporting facilities to provide excellent services in education as well research. International collaboration with hundreds of overseas top-ranked universities has established to support internationalization in research, academic, and community services programs.
Undip. Undip. Undip.
datang di Fakultas Teknik Universitas Diponegoro. Bapak dan Ibu yang terhormat, izinkan kami menyampaikan petunjuk keselamatan sebelum acara ini dimulai. Hal ini dilakukan sebagai wujud implementasi kami dalam menjalankan sistem manajemen keselamatan dan kesehatan kerja dalam kerangka ISO 45001. Berikut merupakan kebijakan K3 Fakultas Teknik Universitas Diponegoro. Fakultas Teknik berkomitmen untuk membangun dan menerapkan sistem manajemen K3 secara konsisten seraya meningkatkan kapabilitas proses dan produktivitas, memberikan layanan tri derma perguruan tinggi yang berkualitas, mematuhi peraturan perundang-undangan terkait K3, melakukan upaya pencegahan penyakit akibat kerja dan juga kecelakaan kerja kepada setiap personel yang terlibat, serta melakukan perbaikan berkelanjutan untuk meningkatkan kinerja K3. Saat ini, Bapak dan Ibu sedang berada di Hall Lantai 5, Gedung Dekanat Fakultas Teknik Universitas Diponegoro. Perlu kami sampaikan bahwa kondisi K3 di Fakultas Teknik hari ini akan berjalan secara normal. Tidak ada agenda safety drill atau simulasi keadaan darurat dan juga tidak ada agenda pemeriksaan peralatan keselamatan. Maka dari itu, apabila nanti terdengar alarm tanda bahaya, itulah kondisi darurat yang sebenarnya. Yang perlu Bapak dan Ibu lakukan adalah tetap tenang dan selesaikan pekerjaan dengan baik. Apabila terjadi gempa, mohon dapat mencari tempat berlindung yang aman seperti di bawah meja dan lindungilah bagian kepala Anda. Setelah ada aba-aba evakuasi dari petugas K3 kami, berjalanlah menuju pintu keluar mengikuti tulisan jalur evakuasi yang terdapat di dinding atau lantai dimulai dari tempat duduk yang paling dekat dengan pintu. Apabila terlihat asap, mohon berjalan menunduk. Sepatu hak tinggi mohon dilepas selama evakuasi berlangsung. Hindarilah penggunaan lift, sebaiknya gunakan tangga untuk menuju lantai dasar. Selanjutnya, petugas K3 kami akan mengarahkan Bapak dan Ibu ke titik kumpul terdekat. Berikut merupakan denah ruangan di mana tempat Bapak dan Ibu berada. Terdapat dua buah pintu keluar dalam ruangan ini yang dapat dibuka dengan cara ditarik. Jalur evakuasi terdekat ada di sebelah belakang Anda yang dapat diakses melalui pintu masuk hall serta di depan Anda, tepatnya di belakang area panggung. Titik kumpul terdapat di area lantai 1, atau di sekitar lokasi tempat parkir mobil. Berikut adalah nomor telepon darurat yang dapat Bapak dan Ibu temukan di lokasi strategis di sekitar gedung ini. Akhir kata, terima kasih atas perhatian Bapak dan Ibu. Selamat melanjutkan acara dengan aman. chat room. Please don't forget to fill the registration form. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, Welcome to the 5th International, International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues, and, and Community Development. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom. Om Swastiastu. Namo Buddhaya. On behalf of the steering committee, Let us welcome our distinguished guests on this event. Sincerely, Rektor of Diponegoro University, Professor Dr. Yos Johan Utama, Sarjana Hukum Magister Humaniora. Sincerely, Dean of Faculty of Engineering, Diponegoro University, 
Professor Insinyur Muhammad Agung Wibowo, Magister Management, Master of Science, Doctor of Philosophy. Sincerely, Chairman of INCRIT, Dr. Justina Metanoya Puspariskita, Sarjana Teknik, Magister Teknik. Whom we also respect, the keynote speaker. As well as greeting our international conference participants. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start, let us pray in accordance to our own belief. Praying begin. Praying finish. It is very fortunate that we can gather here in Ingrid 2023. Ingrid 2023 bringing the theme Reinventing, Reinventing Integrated, integrated solution, solution of Environmental Problems in the Era of Environmental Intelligence. We are so pleased to have all of you to be our conference participant this morning. I am Sabrian Sah Arya Pramuditya. And I am Ataya Salsabila Putri Maharani. We'll be the host of this event. Next, we would read out the rundown for today's event. First, opening. Second, singing the Indonesian national anthem. Third, greeting speech. Fourth, photo session. Fifth, the first keynote speaker and discussion session. Sixth, parallel session. Seventh, break session. Eighth, the second keynote speaker and discussion session. Ninth, wording. And the last one, closing. We are moving on to the first event, namely singing the Indonesia national anthem, Indonesia Raya. Now we are going to listen to the greeting speech, who will be delivered by the chairman of INCRI 2023. Please welcome Dr. Justina Metanoya Puspariskita, Sarjana Teknik, Magister Teknik.
Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Shalom, Om Swastiastu, Namo Buddhaya, Salam Kebajikan. To the Honorable Rector Universitas Diponegoro, Dean and Deputy uh, Faculty of Engineering Universitas Diponegoro, and Head of Department of Environmental Engineering Dipono Universitas Diponegoro. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On the behalf of the committee, I would like to express my gratitude to all college, professor, lecturers, researchers, and welcome all of you to the fifth INCRIT 2023 Reinventing Integrated Solution of Environmental Problem in the Era of Environmental Intelligence. Moreover, I honorably welcome our keynote speaker and invited speaker, Professor Arif Budiharjo from Diponegoro University, uh, Dr. Victor Gleit from University of Page, Hungary, Professor Koichi Yamamoto Yamaguchi University, Japan, Professor Zul Ilham uh, from University Malaya, Malaysia, and Tran Thi from uh, Ho Chi Minh City, University of uh, Vietnam. At this conference, we have contribution coming from five countries. We receive about 110 paper submission for presentation at this meeting. Each paper proposal was evaluated from reviewer and about 80 of these are accepted from for the presentation. The topic of this conference consists of environmental, health and safety, environmental science, technology and education, green infrastructure and energy conservation and efficiency. It is my hope that the fifth increase 2023 would be able to achieve its objective to create an international forum for the researchers, students, industries, and government to communicate their research results to share and exchange ideas on the fundamental and application of environmental sustainability issue and community development. By bringing up this theme, the Department of Environmental Engineering and the INCRIT 2023 Committee want to support sust sustainable solution for environmental issues such as waste control, resource optimization, carbon neutrality, and water using technologies, environmental intelligence for environmental sustainability. Last but not least, my deepest gratitude goes to the Advisory Board, Organizing Committee, International Scientific Committee, institutions, companies, and volunteers who gave directly and indirectly supported to the success of this conference. The committee has done a great job to make this conference success without any major obstacles. Although we try our best, to professional on the behalf of the committee, please accept our sincere apologies for the inconvenience that occurs before, during, or after this event. I wish you a very productive conference with exciting and encouraging discussion and exchange of knowledge so that together we can achieve the purpose of this conference. May God bless us with good health to make this event a successful and enjoyable one. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you to Mrs. Justina for the speech. The second speech will be delivered by the Dean of Faculty of Engineering di Penegoro University. Please welcome Professor Insinyur Muhammad Agung Wibowo, Magister Management, Master of Science, Doctor of Philosophy.
Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, distinguished guests, speakers, professor, colleagues, committee, and ladies and gentlemen, the honorable head of the department and also the honorable of chair of the committee. My name is Muhammad Agung Wibowo as the Dean of Faculty of Engineering, Diponegoro University. I would like to welcome all of the participants of the International Conference on the Environmental Sustainability and Community Development, or INCRIT 2023. I would like also to extend my warm welcome to the speaker, Professor Arif Budiorjo from Diponegoro University, Professor Mehadea Dr. Jul Ilham from University of Malaya, and then Tran Tu Pung Kuit from University of Vietnam, Dr. Victor Kildred from the Hungary, and also Professor Konichi Yamamoto from Japan University. The INGRID 2023, it provides a forum to discuss, to disseminate, and to, net, to develop the networking among the researchers, academics, professional, and students who are currently working on the issue of the environmental sustainability and also community development. The topic of the INPIT 2023 is reinventing integrated solution of environmental problem in the era of environmental indulgence. The INPIT is an annual international conference organized by Environmental Department Engineering, Diponegoro University. I would like to thank to the committee and the Environmental De Engineering Department and also on the sponsor. Finally, please allow me to end of this remark by wishing you all of the delightful, informative, and fruitful discussion during the Ingrid 2023. Enjoy your international seminar and also enjoy the Semarang City. Thank you very much. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. pencemaran udara di bidang pengendalian pencemaran air maupun di uh, pengendalian pencemaran tanah dan juga termasuk di dalam pengelolaan maupun pengolahannya program ini juga menyiapkan urusan yang memiliki latar belakang yang kuat di bidang teknik lingkungan melalui kurikulum dan metode pembelajaran yang mengumumkan mahasiswa bekerja dan belajar serta berdampingan dengan para tenaga pengajar dan para peneliti yang akan membimbing dan mengawasi penelitian mereka. Program ini juga memberikan kesempatan kepada para mahasiswa untuk berkembang secara individu melalui program interaksi dengan masyarakat profesional, kegiatan seminar, dan forum ilmiah.
Hal yang perlu uh, saya tandaskan di dalam pengembangan Departemen Teknik Lingkungan tentu uh, ke depan itu orientasi uh, terhadap lapangan itu sekarang tuntutannya harus dilengkapi dengan inovasi. Nah, oleh karena itu, tanggung jawab pengembangan inovasi di dalam konteks pengelolaan lingkungan bukan hanya tanggung jawab dari departemen dalam ini dosen dan teknik tenaga kependidikan, namun juga tanggung jawab bersama para mahasiswa dan alumni di dalam kaitan ini. Sehingga diharapkan alumni dan uh, mahasiswa memberikan kontribusi yang utuh terhadap pengembangan daripada Departemen Teknik Lingkungan ini sehingga ke depan bisa mengisi semua aspek yang berkaitan dengan pengelolaan lingkungan sehingga lini-lini pekerjaan yang mampu bisa memberikan kontribusi terhadap pengembangan keilmuan teknik lingkungan bisa kita raih. Jayalah Departemen Teknik Lingkungan, jayalah Fakultas Teknik. to for all participants online, please turn on your camera once again. Okay, here we go. We will start the counting from one to three. One, one two, two, three, three. Cheers. cheers. Thank you very much. Now, the online participant can turn off your camera. We are moving to the next session. For honorable participants, please moving on to the stage to take the photo session.
today's technology is increasingly advanced. People are competing to apply technology to streamline their work, especially artificial intelligence technology, which is very popular everywhere. This technology can be used in various sectors, including the environment. It is time for us environmental activists to see this technological development as an advantage to manage the environment effectively and efficiently. For this reason, the International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues, and Community Development or INCRED gives a platform for professionals, researchers, and academicians to share their experiences and explore the possible influence on the future. INCRED 2023 comes with a team. As we know, today's technology is increasingly advanced. People are competing to apply technology to streamline their work, especially artificial intelligence technology, which is very popular everywhere. This technology can be used in various sectors, including the environment. It is time for us environmental activists to see this technological development as an advantage to manage the environment effectively and efficiently. For this reason, the International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues, and Community Development or INCRED gives a platform for professionals, researchers, and academicians to share their experiences and explore the possible influence on the future. INCRED 2023 comes with a team of reinventing integrated solutions to environmental problems in the era of environmental intelligence, where the team this time is very new and follows technological developments. INCRED can be a place to build connection between researchers, students, and industry to continue working together to produce work for the environment. INCRED 2023 provides a platform to continue exploring, discovering, and developing works that can later become a new start for environment development. INCRED 2023 brings several topics and subtopics regarding the environment that revolves around zero carbon by implementing a circular economy in other methods, namely environmental health and safety environmental science, technology and education, green infrastructure, energy conservation, and efficiency. Inquit progress from year to year has great hopes of becoming an international forum that can be developed by researchers, students, industry, and government to communicate their research results and exchange ideas about its basis and application in the environment. INCRED can also be a conduct for ideas to help improve technology and produce a better earth from year to year.
fixing enormous food waste problem. Professor yes. Budiarjo, the time is yours. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Buditi. May I stand up? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The, my mentor, Prof. Agung, the Dean of Engineering Faculty, Ibanagori University. Uh, before I start my presentation, I'd like to say hi to some of my uh, colleagues. Uh, the Honorable Head of Department on uh, Environmental Engineering, Diponegoro University, Dr. Ing Sudarno, and also Professor Badrus Yaman. This is the new professor of our department, actually. And yeah, thank you. He just become a professor a couple days ago, so it's pretty fresh. Yeah. And then, of course, I'd like to congratulate all the conference committee uh, for their hard works uh, presenting this uh, conference to us. Uh, actually, this is the fifth conference that has been held by Environmental Engineering Department. <coughs> in five consecutive years. So I think this is a remarkable uh, achievement. Yeah, I just remember a couple of years ago when I was the uh, chairman of the conference for the first in grid. Yeah? And finally, after the fifth one, uh, they asked me to talk in this conference. They asked me to be a speaker in this conference. So this is a quite... Uh, Reliefful for, for me because finally uh, I have an opportunity to speak in front of all of you guys. All right, so I like also deliver my uh, gratitude to Rector of Emeritus Borgoro uh, and also Engineering Faculty for supporting us, supporting the environmental engineering department in all aspects, not only for this conference and also in other uh, aspects. So, and this is, a, this is a big support for us so we can grow faster and grow bigger as a department. And as you know uh, that our rank is quite good if you check the hiring education or if you check the uh, any other uh, ranking in, in education, actually environmental engineering department in Indonesia leading uh, at least a uh, number one environmental engineering department in Indonesia. I think that's a quite remarkable result. All right. Uh, before I start my presentation, I like to share my story, a little bit of story. Uh, when I tried to prepare my presentation, actually, I remember a couple years ago, perhaps about 10 years ago, my boy asked me during our dinner, actually. He asked me, Dad, uh, what happened if I cannot finish my food? Okay, and then easily I, I answer him that I'm going to throw all the remaining food to the waste. Uh, to the bin, yeah. And then he asked me back, is there any effect to the environment? I remember that conversation that happened 10 years ago. And now, I want to share with you what sort of problem, what sort of uh, issues that generated by remaining food that we cannot finish, or we call it food waste. So in this occasion, actually, I would like to discuss with you related to the food waste problem. Uh, excuse me, I cannot see my slide here. Would you please just uh, present my slide to, this, to the screen?
because we we have the offline and also online uh, attendance. So I do believe that the online attendance can see the uh, my presentation, but the offline one still cannot see the slide. All right, yeah. Uh, oh, this one. Is it working? No. <laughs> Hopefully. All right. So, uh, I better talk to the operator. That's fine, Miss Titi. That's fine. All right, uh, I bring up my, uh, the title of our small role in facing enormous food waste problem. So this is not a, not a uh, big topic, but I do believe that uh, this topic actually, this issue actually uh, relate to us in our daily activities and also our, in our daily life. So that's why I prefer to bring up this uh, topic in our discussion today. Right. Okay. Uh, sorry for a bit interruption. So uh, when we talk about food waste, actually we have to uh, understand the terminology of the food waste. Uh, I do believe that anyone here is a food waste generator. Yeah. Some of you, I do believe that ever and finish your meals. You put some of the food as a waste, as a leftover. So when we talk about food waste, actually there are two terminologies. The first one, we have to make a difference between food loss and food waste. What are the difference between these two? Actually for the food loss itself, it's kind of loss uh, post harvest, but before packaging or at retail level or before consumption. So after harvesting the veggies and other things, before it comes to our plate, we can say any loss during this uh, phase. Actually, we we can say that we can tell that this this one is called food loss. But when we mention about food waste. This kind of terminology goes to any leftover after we consume. So remaining food that we cannot finish is categorized as a food waste. So this is a two different terminology. But now we are focused on the food waste itself. So we are focused on after consumer uh, consume their, their food and what happened after that. Every year, actually, this is a big fact. A big fact: 1.3 billion tons of food are lost or wasted every year. Can you imagine 1.3 billions? This is actually a huge number. Yeah, this data is uh, gathered from the FAO, uh, Food and Agricultural uh, Organization. And if we put in a comparison, actually. If a food waste is a country, it will be the world third largest emitter of greenhouse gases behind the United States and China. They will place as the third country that generate greenhouse gases. Okay. Uh, yes, I present here uh, figures. Actually, uh, my discussion here will be focused on Indonesia. But before we go to Indonesia uh, issue, actually, I like to go a bit general in the world issue. Indonesia itself actually uh, stay in the middle of the as a, on the other hand, yeah, world hungriest countries in South East and Southeast Asia. Hopefully this one 
working. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so actually, um, if we go with the World Hungriest Countries Index, Indonesia score 17.9, and Indonesia is in the middle among other countries. It's uh, referred to the Global Hunger Index 2022. On the other hand, we talk about food waste. We throw away quite a lot of food, but in another hand, we are also facing hunger issue. This is quite interesting, actually. Yeah. If we talk about the world hunger, actually, the number of people who are affected by hunger raised from to about 828 million in 2021. You can see from the figure, actually, in 2005, the number of people affected hunger went down up to 2019 and then rise again up to 2022. What happened with us? Yeah, that's a big issue, actually. Hunger is a big issue. And also, hunger is also mentioned as a, one of the goals in a sustainable development goals. On the other side, actually, we also generate quite a lot of food waste. Yeah. Global average food waste in a year, actually, in total up to what is it? 931 million tons. Can you imagine this number, actually? This is pretty huge number. Yeah. Thank you, Prof. Agung. Thank you for your coming. Thank you. And yes, thanks. <laughs> Nowadays, we're facing two things. The first one is related to the hunger, and the second one related to the food waste. We throw away a lot of food, but on the other hand, we, some of our uh, people, actually, they, they find difficulties to, to feed themselves. This is a big issue that we need to resolve. Yeah. And if we, if we look at a little bit detail related to the food waste generation per region, actually, uh, the, big, the biggest contribution, contributor of food waste generator is goes to household area. It means that Household, including us, is the biggest generator of food waste. So we have to be responsible to our waste, including our food waste. Yeah. Keep in mind that uh, we contribute to this issue. We are the bigger, uh, the biggest contributor to this issue. All right. Okay. So if we uh, put in calculation, actually. How many waste, especially food waste, is generated by each person? We can calculate it's about 106 kilogram per year per person. This is uh, a freight food waste that are uh, generated by people around the world. But what about the case in Indonesia? In Indonesia itself, we generate much more, 1.5 times than people in the world, we generate about 150 kilogram per person per year. This is a quite big number. All right. So then what we can do, what we can contribute to solve these issues, we go back to the solid waste figure. We do believe that in Indonesia, more than 50% of the waste categorized as organic waste. All right. 
But among uh, more than 50 percent, 40 percent is coming from food. So 40 percent is food leftover that are sent to the landfill. If we can solve this problem, actually, we can reduce the number of solid waste that have to be sent to the landfill. Because landfill is now is become uh, one of, not one of, uh, most of the waste in Indonesia goes to landfill. The treatment is the limit. Uh, the process is not quite uh, improved. Most of them goes to the landfill directly. All right, so what about the effect on the environment? Actually, if we compare or if we calculate or if we convert into CO2 equivalent, actually, some of the treatment related to the food waste can be identified as the first one is goes to landfill, the second one goes to heat moisture reaction, followed by incineration, anaerobic, uh, sorry, composting, and then anaerobic digestion. And landfill generate plenty of CO2 equivalent, plenty of greenhouse gases, including methane and sort, uh, uh, and other gases. But if we convert to the CO2 equivalent, actually, uh, the CO2 equivalent that generated by the landfill is quite I cannot imagine that if we can reduce the what happened at the landfill, if we can reduce the uh, the amount of solid waste that goes to the landfill, actually we can reduce quite a lot of CO2 that are generated during this process. All right. Uh, if we compare to the greenhouse gases generation, in general, actually, food is responsible for approximately 26% of the total greenhouse gases that are generated. Big number, right? Yeah, this is a quite big number. If we can finish this food waste problem, we can reduce about 26%. Yeah, this is our homework, actually. And what can we do? I'm not going to talk about the advent technology. I'm not going to talk about the advent action, but I'm going to ask you to think big, but act small. So there are so many ways to minimize or to reduce the amount of food that uh, goes to the landfill. The first one, we can promote the education field. People must be educated. It can be through the prevention campaign, prevention to generate waste, consumer education. All the consumer must be educated. How to consume food wisely? Is always food is the best. This is me. <laughs> I always finish whatever on my plate. That's why I become like this. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this is a, a, a proof that uh, I'm not only talking, but I'm doing something. Yeah, back to old days. Actually, I remember that my grandma told me when we had uh, when I had meal. Actually, she told me that Arif, you have finished whatever you have take and put on your plate. And up to now, whether it's already gone uh, 30 years ago. Up to now, I still remember that thing. And this, she said, this is a Javanese wisdom, actually. She said that if you cannot finish your food, your chicken will die. And I know that I don't have any chickens. But I still remember that thing. And now, whatever I put on my plate, I will finish it. This is a, a local wisdom that, that uh, affect me up to now. And then it's related to the policy. 
When we talk about policy, we can do so many things, including incentive, economic incentive, flexibility in quality standard, uh, policy that rules all the producer and also consumers related to food uh, packaging and so on. Or we can start our food donation. This is quite challenging, actually, because we cannot keep food for quite, some, uh, quite long time. It will decay. It will decay and rotten. We have to find, we have to find a technology, we have to find a way how to preserve food for quite some time. We have a canned food. If you remember, in Indonesia, actually, we have the idol Adha, uh, at least uh, once a year. Now, the Kurban actually not uh, distribute directly, but they put in a can, so it will, it can reach remote areas. This is uh, one of the innovation that, that actually it's happening now. We can reuse our food waste. Seriously? Reuse the food waste? We can use as an animal feeding. Feed the animal. We can keep animals, we can keep uh, chicken, for example, and we can use that thing to feed our animals. This is quite high protein and also the other vitamin and also mineral as well that will be quite good to uh, our feed stock. I remember one of my colleagues actually, um, he is already uh, retired. Uh, Pak Indro, yeah, I remember Pak Indro. I tell you a local story actually. Um, someday he found that uh, his neighbor is a cake maker, bread maker, yeah. And they waste quite a lot of bread. And then he had an idea to fit his cows because he he, uh, he keep some cows actually uh, in remote area with the bread. So you can imagine animal eat bread. But it happened and it works. And he can reduce the operational cost. But, before, but we cannot fit to them directly. We have to do some present, uh, fermentation for quite some time and then we stop at a certain point to make sure that the protein is still there, the all other content is still there, and it's pretty safe to the animals. But it's happened and it's already, uh, it's already taking place a couple years ago. What else that we can do? If you are a student or if you are a researcher, there are so many research opportunity in this field, actually. Me, myself, and my team, actually, we start to have a look in detail related to the food waste problem. And we found that this is a quite interesting field, not only for engineers, but also for the social researchers, for economic researchers as well, because so many things that we can explore related to the food waste uh, issues. Another thing, actually, we can promote a better connectivity between experts. So we can develop more solutions to this issue uh, with regard that the key is their implementation and connectivity. We are not only talking, but we have to, we need to take action. Yeah, even small action. What kind of small action that we can take? I'm going to go a bit faster. We can start from small change in our household. Do you know that plate size, uh, plate size and also plate shape will affect the number of food, the amount of food that, that we put on our plate. We can see this fact actually. 
If you have round plate with size of nine times nine inch and has surface area about 63 inch square, and compared to the oval one, the oval one have a bigger, so, uh, uh, sorry, smaller surface area. If we compare this type of plates, actually, small plate generates on average 30.4 of this, while the large plate generates 19.2% on average. This is a small thing that we can try. But remember, this number will have a greater impact, about 5% in difference. If we can reduce 5%, we go to the previous number. 40% of the organic waste coming from food waste, if we can reduce that amount, we only have about 35% of the food waste. It means that we have already reduced 5% of the total organic waste that are generated during our activities. This is 5% is big number, guys. Without a small effort, change the plate size into the smaller one. Okay. And what happened? What, when, what can we do if we cannot reduce the thing? We end up with the end of pipe treatment, actually. There are some technologies that are available at this time. We have, I'm not going to say landfill, because landfilling is uh, the last option. We have uh, anaerobic digestion, we have the composting, we have the incinerator, incineration, and also we have a heat moisture reaction. Yeah. But, at this time, actually, me, myself, actually prefer anaerobic digestion as the first choice. Yeah. All right. Uh, we come to the end of our uh, discussion today. Actually, if we talk about food waste, we also, if we take action on the food waste, actually, we also contribute to the sustainable development goals. Reducing food waste actually relate directly to the sustainable SDGs number 12, which is responsible consumption and production. Most specifically related to SDGs 12.3. As we know that SDGs 12.3 is related to the global food waste at retail and consumer level that we need to reduce by 2030. But except this goal, actually, dealing with food waste, reducing the food waste, will also contribute to other goals, which is related to the goals number one, no poverty, zero hunger, uh, SDGs number 10, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. Inequality, number 10, 11, sustainable, sustainable cities and also communities. Life below water. I hope you got uh, what I said when I said life below water. How can food waste connected to life below water? Actually, about 20% of the food of the organic waste that are generated end up in the sea. From uh, bring up the river and then end up to the sea. So it will affect the life under the water, life below the water. It will also affect to the SDGs number 15, life online, and also it will affect to the climate action. All right, I think uh, this is the uh, what I can share to all of you guys. 
uh, hopefully you enjoy the rest of the conference and I'm pretty open to the uh, next discussion. But before I uh, finish, actually, I at the beginning, I forget to say hi to other speakers. Uh, we got the uh, international speakers coming from Malaysia, uh, Hungary, Japan, and also Vietnam. So we are pretty honored to have them as our speaker for today's conference. All right, uh, thank you very much for your kind attention, and hopefully you enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for Professor Pudiarjo for giving us such informative and interesting presentation in uh, and also all uh, ideas for facing enormous food waste problems. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please hold your questions for after the next uh, invited speakers. So uh, our next presenters is Professor Zul Ilham bin Zulkifli Lubis from University of Malaysia. Uh, I'm sorry, University Malaya, Malaysia. Professor Dr. Zul Ilham bin Zulkifli Lubis completed his bachelor degree at University Malaya, uh, Panasonic, Panasonic Scholar for Master of Science and Jaika Scholar Net for his doctoral degree at the Department of Socio-Environmental Energy Science, Graduate School of Energy Science, Kyoto University, Japan. His current research interest is in the field of biomass energy, with esteem awards from Japan Institute of Energy and American Oil Chemist Society. Professor Zul Ilham also serves as associate editor for academic, very, uh, I think, many number of high reputable journals, and also special issue editor for process. As, alumnus, as an alumnus of the Young Southeast ASEAN Leaders Initiative Professional Fellows Program, he volunteers regularly in promoting energy literacy, renewable energy and climate change action to youth and community, including being the country coordinator of the Asian Students Environment Platform, a project supported by ION Environmental Foundation. Uh, among his recent accolades are Asian Science Diplomat Award 2021 by the Asian Secretariat and Fulbright Visiting Scholar in 2022 and 2023, Visiting Associate Professor at the Department of Biological and Environmental Engineering College of Agriculture and Life Science, Cornell University, USA. Uh, I think I will just give the time for Professor Zul Ilham bin Zulkifli Lubis. Uh, Professor uh, Lubis, the forum is yours. Thank you, uh, Ms. Chairperson, Ms. Titik. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Yes. Yes, very clear. Thank you. Assalamualaikum and salam sejahtera uh, buat sahabat-sahabat di Indonesia. Uh, so I will start by sharing my screen uh, for my presentation. Okay, I believe uh, that the screen is available to all of you. Uh, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi taala wabarakatuh. And salam sejahtera uh, to members of the floor. I would like to say thank you to the uh, chairman uh, of the in fifth increase 2023, uh, Dr. Puspa and Undip uh, Semarang for inviting me as the keynote speaker uh, for today's conference. Uh, it will be better if I could be there, uh, but well, uh, I'm here online, 
and I would like to say uh, hi to to uh, friends uh, who attended this conference in Indonesia. I believe that I have uh, a few friends from my Kyoto years. Uh, I think Pak Haryono, Pak Fajar Gembira. And okay. Uh, anyway, today I will speak about. Uh, the role of tropical biomass for bioenergy in the Southeast Asia's carbon decarbonization transition. I really love uh, the theme of the conference, reinventing integrated solutions of environmental problems in the era of environmental intelligence. Uh, it's futuristic and I'm also uh, working hard to incorporate uh, AI into, into my research too. I am Zuid Ilham from uh, Environmental Science and Management Program, Faculty of Science, University of Malaya, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. A little bit about myself. I believe that Ms. Titi already mentioned uh, a lot about uh, me. Thank you, uh, Ms. Titi. Uh, I just would like to highlight uh, to the participants today uh, that I received training, not only from the eastern part of uh, the world, UM, uh, Kyoto later on in Japan uh, but recently I I went to Cornell University in New York uh, for six months in 2022 as a Fulbright scholar and I will also promote a certain journal uh, that I'm the associate editor Malaysia Journal of Science Progress of Energy and Environment Journal of Society for Association of Automotive Engineers Malaysia and Journal of Indonesian uh, Sustainable Development Pla Planning, uh, which is hosted by BAPENAS, uh, Processes and Frontiers in Bioengineering and Biotechnology. Uh, we have a special issue uh, in certain of the journals, so please check it out if you are interested to submit your paper and you can also contact me. So, uh, as a start, I will have to uh, promote a little bit about uh, University of Malaya. So, we are actually uh, uh, a university that started in 1949 in Singapore, but later on, uh, due to uh, we split, so University of Malaya maintained its campus in Singapore, and in Kuala Lumpur, and the existing University of Malaya in Singapore became National University of Singapore and US that we know today. So we are located in the middle uh, of, not really in the middle, on the east side of uh, Kuala Lumpur and it's not far from the Petronas Twin Tower, uh, 30 minutes right uh, with LRT in the area of Bangsa, the green area of Bangsa. Uh, please uh, do come visit us whenever you are in Kuala Lumpur. We are very near to KL Central when you arrive uh, at the airport. So, a little bit map of the university and a little bit of pictures of the university. Uh, we also uh, have 20 faculties and 4 institutes and currently hold the rank as the best university in Malaysia. And we also uh, hosted international academic staff, 240 of them in our campus, as well as undergraduate and postgraduate students, either local and international. Of course, we hosted, as a public university, we hosted more local students than international students. So if you like to do your postgraduate study, we welcome you to come to UM2. So enough with the promotional uh, message. So I am in the field of energy and environment with particular emphasis on biomass science and by and today i will talk to you about biomass for bioenergy uh, although i also uh, participated in other uh, researches uh, related to biomass for biomaterial biomass for future food too so we are currently living in the age of anthropocene if you ever heard of the word anthropocene or anthropogenic nowadays it has become the buzzword of the day. And it is not really that new because it is an old idea by George Perkin Marsh in 1874. In his book uh, entitled The Earth as Modified by Human Action. But then later on, 
the Nobel Prize winner Paul Kratzen make it popular again in the year 2000 where he mentioned the word Anthropocene a few times in order to describe the age where we are currently living right now. It refers to the age where human alters most of the parameters. Either it is social environmental parameters, but also earth parameters. That is changing the world that we are currently living on today. So as you can see, the age of Anthropocene started after the industrial era and it represent it first represented by the uh, increase in atmospheric co2 uh, which could be detected at low dome ice core uh, in the antarctic where they drill uh, bore a hole into the ice where we can measure the carbon dioxide level of uh, each era and uh, also supported by the atmospheric co2 in hawaii Amazingly, this type of graph also shows similar trend for other socio-economic trends and earth system trends that I'm currently showing to you on the slide today. As you can see on the left side, with the increase after the Industrial Revolution, our world population increase. And so do the amount of people living in the urban urban population i'm turning on the pointer urban population and of course when people live more people live in urban area it also reflected the amount of energy being used water being used paper production and transportation people have cars people can move everywhere every, everywhere and this also give an impact into into our earth system trend right i see that there is a hand gesture is it mine <laughs> anyway uh yeah please ignore that okay anyway earth system trend uh carbon dioxide nitrous oxide methane also showed the similar trend of increasing Let me just check my zoom. Okay, never mind. Just ignore the raised hand by me, okay? So it shows the similar trend to other system trend and social economic trends. So this represent this showed that we are currently living in the age of human where human could alter not only a system parameters, but also social economic trends of the world. As I've shown you before, the increase in world population leads to increase of people living in urban areas, Jakarta, Kuala Lumpur, Manila, Singapore, increase our water use, transportation, and energy. That what we will discuss today. So this is related to I believe, like a uh, professor uh, that mentioned in his uh, keynote speaker just now, we are also looking at sustainable development goals, 17 goals by the United Nations in the time frame from 2016 to 2030, 15 years for us to help uh, the world. And I would also encourage all the participants, researchers, students today to position yourself among the 17 sustainable development goals because it, it is the world agenda and if you position it well uh, it will help with your career as well as your research too as for me i'm focusing on sdg 7 affordable and clean energy as well as sdg 11 sustainable cities and communities and sustain sdg 13 climate action uh, i will not speak about how it evolved from MDGs to SDG. It all started with Millennium Development Goals from to the year 2000 to 2015 with only 8 goals which later evolved into 17 goals and can be divided into a few sectors, Dignity, People, Planet, Partnership, Justice and Prosperity. Uh, in Asia, 
we are living in the Southeast Asian country, Malaysia, Indonesia, and other participants too. So we also have our own Asian plan of action for energy cooperation, where we like to increase the component of RE, uh, renewable energy, as well as in reduce energy intensity in terms of increasing the energy efficiency uh, in our daily life. In the Southeast Asian region, we are blessed with a lot of agricultural biomass. And the biomass production is five times higher in tropical and subtropical area, such as the area we live in. When I go on a trip from uh, on a van, on a transit from Jakarta to uh, Bogor uh, on a van, I can see green area and indonesia especially have a lot of uh, wonderful uh, resources of biomass and it is sad if we could not really utilize all of this biomass uh, to improve our livelihood as well as to improve the environment malaysia ourselves has more than 150 million tons of biomass collected per year uh, biomass that are mostly agricultural residues, not uh, including uh, animal fats and residues. So it's a complicated structure uh, bonded by beta-1,4 glycosidic linkages. And it contains a lot of uh, components that can be utilized such as hemicellulose, uh, sugar compounds, lignin, uh, which is the protection agent for the plant and others lipids oil in, in plants so it is actually not that easy as this uh, figure showed uh, but rather the reality the molecular architecture of plants and well is rather complicated and it is a challenge for all the researchers to utilize it all find ways to utilize it all or separate it so that it can, uh, we can add value and we can produce something out of it. So major biomass resources in Malaysia, oil palm also in Indonesia, but in Europe, they are looking at rapeseed and soybean. So whenever I presented overseas, people will ask me, why do you work on oil palm? Uh, it, it's not sustainable, it kill orang utan, uh but after at first i will just feel like oh yeah we should we should look into other biomass too but then uh after these few years i believe that we should work on what we have at our place we should not follow the trend the global western trend uh that would like to support more of their business for example european would like to love to work with rapeseed oil because they plant it a lot so do americans they work they have vast areas of soybean oil so that's why they are promoting soybean soybean oil while our oil palm is not bad at all so we should work on what we have and i believe in that way and i brush off all the allegations uh, about sustainability we could improve in that manner but we have to work on what we have the most uh, on other parts of the world, they are being blessed with corn, sorghum, sugarcane, switchgrass, wood chip, sawdust, which could also be converted to many uh, things. Uh, but amazingly, for Malaysia and Indonesia, we are also blessed by God with other several non-edible oil seeds. Uh, some have been studied, some have not. So it's also our challenge to explore and see what are the other available non-edible oil seeds that we can use. Uh, I listed the scientific names of the, the seeds here, but I believe uh, some of you uh, in the uh, the participants could could actually realize uh, what kind of uh, uh, seeds they are. For example, Lucina Lucifala on the right. Lucena, Lucena, Lucifala. This seed is ipil-ipil, you call it, or 
we call it Petai Belalang in Malaysia. And we also have Anona Murikata. We tell this to Prisma, Nyamplong. Uh, we have Pongamia. So those are the non-edible oasis that you also have in in Indonesia. So we have met a lot of conversion route to to convert this uh, product into heat, electricity, or fuel. And palm oil is an abundant biomass, but still very popular as cooking oil in Malaysia and Indonesia. So how to prevent food versus fuel? Because people will say, oh, we should use palm oil for cooking oil. Why do you want to use it for energy, right? Because it's staple to us. So in my uh, presentation today, uh, I would like to suggest using alternative biomass from tropical trastokaitrit. So uh, I will not explain about the generation of biofuel, uh, but if you like to hear about it more, you can ask about it uh, later. Uh, I will introduce trastokaitrit. It is an osmo heterotrophic marine protease, uh, commonly known as microalgae. Although it doesn't have, it is lack of chloroplast. Normally, when we mention about microalgae, it must have chloroplast, so it must be green in color. But trastokaitrit is yellow. So, in my approach, I categorize it as oligenous microorganism because. It is a fungal-like algae. It acts like fungus, but uh, it lives like an algae. So for now, they could not really put trastokaitrit uh, in the kingdom uh, fungi or kingdom protease. So they put it in kingdom stranopila, which is another kingdom, not fungi, not protease. So for protease is micro originous microorganism. For fungi is uh, uh, fungal uh, and microalgae also in, in another kingdom. So, however, uh, this trastokaitrit has been isolated from mangrove area in Port Dixon in Gismilan and also Morib in Selangor. So, I believe in mangrove area in Indonesia, you might have other species of trastokaitrit too where you can isolate. And the amazing thing about trastokaitrit is that it has a fast growth. It is capable of producing high amount of uh, fatty acid, long chain, long chain saturated fatty acid, uh, and also other unsaturated fatty acids. So, by mentioning fatty acid, meaning it can produce lipid, it can produce oil, right? If grown. Uh, so our approach is not to grow it uh, on ponds or on a raceway or something. But we would like to grow it landless. We would like to grow it in bioreactor, in buildings, so that there will be no competition with, with agriculture. Because we already have oil pump, uh, which will produce cooking oil, staple to us and other products too, right? Nutella, uh, margarine or something, or food products. Uh, so we don't want to compete with food. So we would like to grow trastocratic in uh, bioreactors. So when we choose the strain selection, we isolated a few. The UM ACC T004, this is the cat we, because we UM uh, explore it, so we name it UM ACC T004. We, ha we have a few strains. Uh, in the paper, I believe we have 30 strains, and then we have to find which strain has the best uh, amount of lipid in order to produce uh, oil. So we found UMACC T023 uh, with the highest uh, total fatty acid content at 85.9%. And most of it are saturated fatty acid, 77.2%, uh, followed by uh, monounsaturated fatty, fatty acid, uh, only acid and polyunsaturated fatty acid, linoleic, uh, linolenic and stuff, right? So we study the factors affecting the trastokaitic growth, salinity, pH, temperature, carbon source, of course, when you want to grow it in bioreactor. Nitrogen source, you have to feed it with yeast extract, yeast extract glucose, 
dissolve oxygen and agitation. So we isolate it as you can see in the methods. We optimize it in shake flask and later grow it in 1.4 liter enforced uh, state tank bioreactor. And we study the lipid extraction and just see the potential of it to be converted to biodiesel and check it properties. Uh, that is the common route whenever we find a new food stock, we will go into that direction. Uh, but the idea is that not to grow this on raceways or in ponds or in we would like to grow this in bioreactors so that it is a landless production. So we also study response to phase methodology over one factor at a uh, time uh, study. Uh, I think I believe that all of you as engineers already know why we uh, favor RSM over one factor optimization. Uh, we use RSM uh, and you guys know the, the way we do. Uh, we did some ANOVA in order to, to see the significance of the factor uh, in growing UMACC T013. These are the response phase profile. So what I would like to say uh, later on, after we optimize it in shake flask, 250 ml shake flask, we grow it in 1.4 liter enforced uh, stirred bioreactor to see to, to upscale it. I know we should we should do uh, bigger too uh, in the future. As you can see, trastocatrate is not green like normal microalgae that you uh, you always see. It is it doesn't have chloroplast, so that's why it's not green, right? So uh, it's amazing. So it, we grow it to see how it could produce a high total lipid and under stress, uh, actually it could be, it could produce more uh, lipids. Uh, in comparison to other uh, species, Sizal, Citrium, Orentio, Chytrium, Trastochytrium. So Trastochytrates have other strains too. Uh, and other peoples are also exploring it. Uh, based on the location where they are. Koreans are also studying trastocytrate, uh, Indian, Indian researchers too. But because it lives in the tropical and subtropical region, so it is our responsibility to study. We couldn't live, it, it, gone through the time where we need Westerners to do things for us. In the Southeast Asian region, because we have been uh, occupied for so long, so we always have the mentality that somebody else has to to do it first for us. Somebody else have to teach us. Oh, this plant good for this. While we already have our local wisdom, so we should go into that way into exploring our own land and utilizing it for our own people. So uh, after we validate it in in a mid scale one point four liter, we harvest the cell. We extract the lipid and we did some assessment of biodiesel properties. As you can, you can see on the slide, the kinomic, it is a little, the oil from Tassocatric is a little bit viscous, although it still meet the EU, EN standard and US standard, but it is at the borderline of 4.8 millimeter squared per second where it could, it, it is a little bit viscous. Uh, I thought it is due to the satur high saturated fatty acid. It might be, but normally oil with high saturated fatty acid will have good oxidation stability. But in this case, uh, it doesn't fit the EU and US standard. Uh, it fit the US standard more than three. It 5.8 hours oxidation stability. Oxidation stability means how the biodiesel could be stored. It could be stored longer. Higher values means you can store it longer. It will not degrade. Uh, but lower value means it will go rancid. So if you realize if you keep cooking oil for too long or you add some water into the cooking oil uh, and when you cook it, you taste it a little bit rancid or different, right? Uh, that, that is what we call uh, it has been oxidized. It has been rancid if you cook uh, banana fritter, so pisang goreng inside it, then you feel it different because the oil has been uh, oxidized. So in biodiesel, you want it 
not to be oxidized so that you can store it longer. So normally, oil with high uh, saturated fatty acid, like uh, what we showed here, like from trust to cartridge, should have higher uh, oxidation stability. But in this case, uh, it, it doesn't pass the EU uh, standard. So perhaps the biodiesel can be used in Asian countries uh, better. Because if it's too viscous, uh, when it's winter in Europe or in America, then it will solidify. It, it is high in saturated fatty acid. So uh, that's the point. Okay. Uh, I'll move to towards the end. Significant of research, this study may be a blueprint for optimizing media composition to grow tasocratic landless uh, in bioreactor. Uh, it will have... a group of people working on each of every resources, right? Uh, so for further information, you can access uh, the papers uh, available. Or you can just contact me. I, I can share uh, you the publications that we have published in Journal of Applied Psychology and Biocatalysis and Agricultural Biotechnology. And uh, as I got the chance to deliver this uh, keynote speak, speech today, I will also to share with all of you some other types of interesting renewable energy throughout my throughout my my travel I've seen I've seen a lot so I would like to to share with all of you I believe that waste to energy should be uh, looked into account too in in Asia uh, like the time when I visited Ningbo city uh, in China I believe Indonesia has looked into this you guys have a few waste to energy uh, power plant according to uh, SUS environment. I visited SUS environment and they said that they also have a few plant in, in Indonesia. So it's good. Uh, and the power plant is nice, looking nice, like a uh, shopping mall here, right? And it doesn't smell that bad when we, we walk down there. So we should go into this way because uh, Indonesia, Indonesia, Indonesia especially has high population meaning you produce more waste. So I, I believe the previous speaker also mentioned about food waste, right? Food waste could be uh, reduced or could be utilized for other purpose, but this is about domestic waste. We can burn, produce energy. Another thing is the one that I'm working now, which is landless biodiesel feedstock. We don't want to grow biodiesel feedstock on land anymore because it's gonna, uh, this is gonna disturb our food production. So we grow it inside. We grow it in bioreactors. We go. We we can grow it in in tall structure rather than have to be white. So I'm also studying a few uh, strain of mushroom too, not only for biodiesel, but also as a future food products. Uh, because as you know, with higher population, uh, we also have threat into into uh, food resources like our previous uh, prof, professor mentioned. So another thing is green hydrogen uh, in Malaysia. Sarawak is looking towards producing hydrogen as they have a huge uh, hydroelectric dam. So they you can utilize the green energy from their Bakun dam in order to produce uh, electrolysis of hydrogen. And that hydrogen could power up. I think they, they have started using some hydrogen bus in Kuching Sarawak too, and I, it can be the way forward. Another thing uh, that I'm also interested, and my student, as you can see below, is also studying, uh, with regards to biomass dye, as it is dye, where we can use agricultural residues, for example, uh, if you can see below the picture of dragon fruit, so you eat the flesh, but later on you throw away the skin, the skin has some color, uh, again, microalgae or trastorcatrate or banana peel, you can take up the color, the dye, and use it, use the dye to, to be used as a sensitized solar cell in order to produce a lower voltage uh, energy. 
and as you can see on top it's the green machines of course for now it could only produce a uh, very small amount of uh, energy but i believe as the future goes on we will have a better and better research somebody has to start somewhere we it is actually a, a term of biomimetic or biomimicry where we try to imitate leaf natural leaf on the left side uh, during the day take in water and carbon dioxide use light photons to convert into oxygen and sugar but then we try to make artificial leaf and in the future might be a bionic leaf uh, where it could combine light harvesting tech with microbes too in order to produce plastic biofuel and pharmaceutical so let's work with me uh, together to explore uh, the wonderful field of biomass so there are also major challenges life is full of challenges so we should look into the availability of it stop if you don't have this trastocytate at your place you don't work on it uh, because uh, it won't be reasonable if you work on something uh, that belongs to other parts of the world you work with what you have uh, at hand or you can have uh, good access to it and we also need finances uh, to study and to support if it were to make into a commercialization later on, we need an ecosystem, sustainability requirement and certification uh, because uh, sustainability, apart from being a good team, has also been weaponized by industry or economy, economic power because when they say, oh, this is not sustainable, so you couldn't sell it to Europe. For example, if palm oil doesn't fit the RSPO, Roundtable Sustainable uh, palm oil certification, then you could not sell it in Europe. So it has been weaponized uh, to stop the trade, uh, to hold us from evolving. Uh, so we have to meet the requirement in order to play uh, the game. So we also should look into low value utilization of biomass by local industry, encourage local industry to use own biomass in their own place so that, so that the carbon uh, footprint will be lower rather than importing something to grow we grow it by ourselves and using our resources so the challenges is to bridge all these uh, separated sectors uh, build road build bridge and later on so that we can realize a connected bio-based economy from field to end consumer so with that uh, i end my presentation uh, if you have any questions later on, uh, I'm happy to discuss uh, with all of you. If you would like to contact me, you can contact me at ilham uh, at um.edu.my. And thanks again for having me here. Uh, have a good day, everyone. Assalamualaikum. Thank you very much for uh, Professor Zul Ilham for giving us such informative and very interesting insight and presentation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think now we come to the question and answer session. I would like to give you time and please raise your hand for the offline uh, participant. Please uh, Ask question maximum maybe for this uh, term three question, Okay, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. I want to ask a question to Prof. Arif. Your name uh, first, please. Your name and institution. Okay. Uh, th thank you so much. My name is Anisan Rosa Sikirana, and I want to ask a question to Prof. Arif. And the question is, is it possible that we also apply food donation or selling food for a cheaper price after close or to its expired date, just like in Singapore, and how? Thank you so much. 
thank you for your question. Other question? I'm also waiting for question from the online participant. Ah, yes. Uh, yes, I, please. I want to ask to Prof. Arif Budi Harjo. Uh, uh, Prof. Arif Budi Harjo suggests for uh, food waste, waste management is uh, anaerobic disaster. But what if uh, if wanna if we if want to uh, manage food waste in our university? What uh, waste management we can apply in our university? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Sahrul. And then uh, another question. Ah. Uh, um, my name is Danaya, and I want to ask to Prof. Dr. Zul Ilham. Uh, the question is, what are the criteria of sustainability requirement and certification for biomass utilization, particularly in Malaysia or Southeast Asian countries? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, two questions for Professor Priarjo and one question for uh, Professor Zul Ilham. Uh, please, uh, do you, are you ready to... Uh, answer the question now, Professor Pierjo. The first question is, can we donate our almost expired uh, food with cheaper price, uh, such as in Singapore? All right. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Actually, our donation is one of the solution uh, to prevent any food loss or food waste. Actually, uh, as long as it's still not expired, I think it's okay to go with the donation. But the thing is, um, uh, I I read somewhere I read, I, I, in France or in UK. Actually, uh, they abandon the they stop uh, groceries or any supermarket to throw away any uh, nearly expired food. So rather than they throw, they better to put in a donation and uh, distribute to the uh, unfortunate people uh, in that area, actually. But then again, I do believe that uh, in this uh, uh, modern era, actually, uh, with the development of any kind of uh, media of communication, we can reach a remote area easily using the technology, and then we can exactly uh, send uh, any nearly expired uh, food or product to the people who really need the things. I think uh, in the future, I, I expect that there is a, a sort of platform uh, who gather uh, people who like to donate something or either people who really wo uh, need something in the one place and then they can easily distribute uh, directly to them. I think, yeah, I expect that thing actually. Then I, and I do believe that uh, in some part of the world, uh, the thing is already occur. I think uh, that's for the first question. And I also like to go to answer the second one, actually from uh, Sahrul. It's related to the managing the food waste in the university, right? Uh, he mentioned that uh, when I said about anaerobic digestion, it's the preferable treatment for the uh, to treat uh, solid waste or especially for food waste. Actually, we have to have a look, uh, go back to the the concept of solid waste management. Uh, the first one is the uh, prevention. We have to prevent uh, the thing happen and the waste occur. The second one is minimization. So, uh, 
prevention can be done in such ways. Uh, for example, uh, but we need to put some effort uh, to do the thing. Uh, for example, uh, we have uh, some uh, canteens in this university, actually, and we have to uh, educate them so they can put the exact portion that will be needed by the student. For example, if we want, uh, if we want to uh, reduce the the occurrence of uh, food waste, but if we go to the some restaurants or warung, uh, so in surrounding area is actually, uh, some of them offer like uh, self service, all you can eat self service. You can take the rice as much as you can. But remember that uh, sometimes, uh, at first, when we are hungry, uh, actually the the hungriest one is our eyes. When we see the food, we like to take everything, but we we have the food in front of us, on in front of us, and actually we cannot finish all of them. So, yeah. Uh, but the thing, sometimes we have to go uh, work together to solve this problem. Uh, the university also have to educate the the member of the uh, stakeholders in this university actually to to promote the waste reduction and also waste uh, minimization. I think uh, the Ponorogo University also uh, face the same problem with other university. We also facing uh, solid waste problem in here. Actually, we still send some of our waste to the landfill directly without any uh, treatment on-site treatment. But we go to the better, uh, I think the right direction because we are one of university in Indonesia that have like a, a wastewater treatment, uh, integrated wastewater treatment on site the campus. So we spare it, we segregate, and then we treat our waste uh, before we put the residue to the, we send the residue to the landfill. Yeah, I think uh, to answer your question, actually we go to the, solid waste management hierarchy, the first one, prevention, and then go to minimization before we go to the next action. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Pudiarjo, for the answer. And one question for Professor Zul Ilham. Uh, could you please uh, repeat your question? Sorry, I cannot catch your uh, question. The question is, what are the criteria of sustainability requirement and certification for biomass utilization, particularly in Malaysia or Southeast Asian countries? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, Professor Zulilham, uh, answer the question from, uh, what is your name, please? My name is Denaya. Denaya, okay, thank you, Denaya. Okay, thank you, uh, Miss Denaya, for your question. Uh, it's a good question to ask about the current uh, sustainability certification for biomass, uh, especially in Southeast Asian region. However, to tell you the truth, there is not yet a clear certification for traded biomass. Uh, currently, uh, I believe uh, Asian Center of Energy uh, could look into it. But however, we have a list of criteria that was developed by the International Energy Agency as a guideline. The issue is that it is very hard for the world to come with international consensus on universal sustainability requirement, especially on biomass because uh, the difficulties of setting up certification scheme that could be feasible for all countries in the world. But I believe uh, in order for us to venture into this, we should follow three principles. Uh, the first one, the biomass shall be produced in an environmentally responsible way. 
by saying that the biomass shall be produced or harvested in an environmentally responsible way, we should cover whether there is a use of chemical, uh, we should also look into forest and land management planning, uh, biological diversity, protection of areas with high ecological value, water quality, and also regeneration following harvesting if it involves energy crop. Principle number two is sustainable management of social capital. So it should cover the customary and traditional rights of indigenous and local people, especially when we go uh, and explore uh, biomass in uh, an area belong or located uh, nearby indigenous or local population. It has to protect the health and safety of employees and we must also provide information to increase public awareness about how we're going to use these uh, biomass resources. What will they benefit from it, right? And we should look also into particular historical or cultural or spiritual values. You know, you can't just go and take it. You see, you can produce it energy without taking care of the people part of the technology. Principle number three, of course, biomass production uh, should be economically viable. Uh, so it should include maintenance and how it could easily tap into the uh, existing chain of production. Uh, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So having said that, I believe, uh, yeah, we, I'm not a proponent of having a standard for all the countries in the world because, because it's going to be one-sided for certain part that uh, suggested it. But we ourselves should look into the three principles that I've mentioned. It should be produced in an environmentally responsible way. Uh, includes management of social capital, people around it, and it should be economically viable. By monitoring this thing, I believe we could also fit into the new trend uh, in the upcoming years, which is the ESG. I believe uh, the wave has already came to Indonesia too, that everybody is looking toward uh, environmental sustainability and governance. Uh, reporting uh, so that uh, everything must follow this ESG requirement uh, in order for it to be accepted in the market or uh, in uh, trading and stuff right so if we follow those three principles I believe that we can easily fit the certification of or standard when it comes later on thank you uh, Miss uh, Diana is now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Zul Ilham, for your answer. Uh, are there any questions from the online participant? Please raise your hand. Ah, okay, one question from offline participant. Uh, two questions, okay. Please. Uh, from this left side, first, please. Uh, thank you, moderator, for uh, chances to letting me ask my questions. My question is from uh, Prof. Zul. Uh, there are, uh, is there, uh, are there any suggestions for student student like us to do research trend research trend in biomass in, especially in Southeast Asia? Thank you. Uh, sir, question from uh, can you repeat your question, please? Uh, Are there any, any, can you repeat your question, please? Are there any, Are there any suggestions? Suggestion. Suggestion? Yes. Oh, okay. Are you interested to Thank do you. research in UM, University of Malaya? Yeah, I think I'm interested. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, sir. 
So they are still, uh, interestingly, there are still uh, a lot of biomass uh, that should be explored and should be studied by us. So as a suggestion, uh, normally for Indonesian student, uh, not only to come to University of Malaya, you can also do it in uh, universities in Indonesia or other universities in the world. But first of all, uh, if you want to work on something uh, local, then it is better to be near to the to the subject matter, right? Like I've mentioned, if you want to work on trastocytrate or microalgae or particular species that live around you, so it's good to study in universities near to the resources. Uh, but then again, having said that, you can also go abroad in order to receive the training and skills, which later could be brought back in order to study the particular resources, right? So it, it could be either way. So you are asking for suggestions on which way to go. So I believe it's, of course, if you, you are interested into research, you will have to go uh, into uh, pursuing your higher degree studies uh, in biomass science. There are many uh, good schools uh, if you would like to. And there are also a lot of opportunities uh, nowadays. Uh, Indonesia have LPDP. I have one student uh, coming in that have this LPDP scholarship from Indonesian government, right? They, they paid you. Uh, handsomely to study so that economy, uh, money is will not be a problem. When I was in Cornell, I met a few uh, young, brilliant Indonesians too, uh, doing research in uh, Cornell University uh, by LPDP and some other scholarship too. So uh, I believe uh, that in the university, Undip Semarang also have an office that explore on these uh, opportunities to study abroad uh, and uh, you should go for it. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Zul Ilham. Actually, we still have two questions, but unfortunately, we have to uh, wrap up this uh, session because the plenary the parallel session will be start uh, so uh, i'm so sorry for the question for for the uh, participant maybe you can contact to professor ilham zul ilham or to professor Budiarjo. okay uh, thank you for all your participa participation and engagement in this plenary session uh, i i like to thank our guest speakers, Professor Budiarjo and Professor Zul Ilham. Uh, once again, thank you for the valuable insights. And finally, give applause for the keynote speakers and, and also for you all. Uh, I hope this first plenary session uh, informative and useful for us and we look forward to seeing you at our next even at INCRIT 2024. Have a nice day and thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Salam, Miss Kiki from Budi Harjo. Thank you. Uh, now, let us to deliver certificate for our keynote speakers. First for Professor Insinyur Muhammad Arif Budiarjo. Uh, who should give? Oh, okay. <laughs> and the certificate will be given by myself. And also online certificate E certificate for Professor Zul Ilham. Uh, I think I already closed this session. I'm so sorry because uh, maybe so many. Yeah, yes, this certificate for Professor Zul Ilham. Very nice to meet you on Zoom meeting, Professor Zul Ilham. Thank you very much. 
Oke, okay, thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, we would like to say thank you to Mrs. Titi Istirohatun, Sarjana Teknik, Master of Science, Doctor of Philosophy, as the moderator in this session. And also thank you for the amazing material session from Professor Insinyur Muhammad Arif Budiarjo, Sarjana Teknik, Master of Engineering Science, Environmental Engineering, Doctor of Philosophy, Insinyur Professional Media from Indonesia, who already gave the material regarding food waste. We also would like to say thank you to Professor Matia Dr. Zul Ilham bin Zulkifli Lubis from Malaysia, who already gave the material regarding the role of tropical biomass for bioenergy in South East Asia's decarbonization transition. We hope that the knowledge will be useful for our future. Now, moving on to the next session is parallel session. To all participants, please enter room according to parallel session classification. For parallel session, offline participants who get G class is in this hall. For parallel session, offline participants who get H class is in meeting room in fifth floor. For parallel session, offline participants who get I class is in teleconference room in fourth floor. For parallel session, offline participants who get J class is in theater room in fourth floor. Also, for par parallel session, online participants, please enter the breakout room according to divided room. <coughs> Before that, we will inform you after the parallel session, we're going to have a break. All the participants may get back to the room again after the parallel session and break time is over at 12.55 in GMT7. We'll remind to the participants that after the parallel session, we're going to have a break and all the participants may get back to the room again after the parallel session and break time is over at 12.55 in GMT7. Thank you.
Oke. Okay. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning everyone. Oke. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the parallel session of the fifth International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues, and Community Development in Crete, 2023. My name is Budi Prasetyo Samadikun, as a moderator for this parallel session. Today's program is reflected in your program book, but we will deliver more details. For the first is opening parallel session by moderator or by me. And secondly, is our presentation from its presenter, led by the moderator. And third, or the last, is closing for the parallel session. And I will read the rules of this offline parallel session. First, the time given to deliver the material is 10 minutes and 5 minutes for a question and answer question. Secondly, moderator will remind the presenter 2 minutes left for the presentation time. And the last, in a question and answer session, participants are expected to raise hand, fitur, or maybe in this uh, room you can raise your hand whether maybe you have question to the presenter. After that, the moderator will invite the participant to speak. Okay, before we start, I'd like to uh, the participant if you are still in the behind of the line of the third line, you can go to first line, go to front, front line, please. You can go to front line. In my right side, you can go to first line, please. You can feel the empty chair. Okay? Yes. For the first, please welcome Miss Alda or Miss Mrs. Mr. Mr. Alda, Mr. Alda and Miss Weekend. Okay, please go to the member. You can present uh, your paper, yeah. The paper title is about the study of the potential use of dry leaves waste in the Undip Semarang area as raw material for the bio pellets. Okay, you have 10 minutes to present. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, let us introduce ourselves. My name is Wiken Mayarati, and here is my research partner, Alda Putra Bagaskara. And we both are from Bachelor of Environmental Engineering, Diponegoro University. So, on this occasion, we would like to share to you guys about the result of our research titled the study of the potential use of the dry leaves waste in the Undip Semarang area as raw material for the bio pellets. Okay. 
So this is the first part of our presentation. This is introduction or the background of our research. Diponegoro University is the one of the universities is in Indonesia that has a large of green space area and it contains so many kinds of biomass such as dry leaves, grass and trees and many more. The dry leaves waste, as we know, it only collected and ended up in dumping site. So in this research, we want to explore about the potential of dry leaves as a raw material for the bio pellets. Uh, so talk, talking about the bio, bio pellets, the bio pellets is one of type of uh, alternative fuel that made from compressed solid biomass with uh, commonly it shaped cylindric cylindrical and with diameters approximately eight to 10 millimeters. And by using bio pellet, we can also reduce the use of coal fuel. To produce the good bio pellet, it should have a moisture content approximately by eight to 13 percent. So in this research, we use four types of leaves. There are banana leaves, thick leaves, jackfruit leaves, and ketapang leaves. And all the sample, both fresh and dry leaves, test the moisture content with moisture analyzer in our environmental laboratory. It is Shimazu MOC 63U Japan. And then it dried with oven for five, 10 and 15 minutes and naturally dried with sunlight for three, five and 24 hours. Okay, now we move to the result of the research. So after collecting the fresh and dry leaves, we test the moisture content of them. And the result show in this table. This test used four types of leaf, both dry and fresh. Based on the table, dry leaf have a moisture content of 18 to 21 percent, while the fresh, well, the fresh leaf have a moisture content of 16 to 18 percent. This it so that dry and fresh leaf do not meet the criteria as raw material for bio pellet. Okay, therefore, with dry only dry leaf using an oven direct sunlight with three variat variation time. Uh, after testing the moisture content of often dried leaf, only leaf that were often dry for 10 and 15 minutes meet the criteria as a raw material for bio pellet. Uh, and third test is testing the moisture is testing the moisture content of leaf dry using a sunlight for three, five, and 24 hours. Based on the value on the table, as we can see, only ketapang leaf dried for 24 hours meet the criteria for a bio pellet. Okay, the last but not least is the conclusion of our research. So based on our research, from the research is the drying process with oven is more efficient than the sunlight drying process in reducing the moisture content of its samples. And with this result, all are meet the criteria as raw material for bio pellets. 
Thank you for your attention. Do you, if you have any question, please. Okay, please, everyone, if you have question, you can raise your hand. Okay, please. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Alma. I would like to ask to Miss Weekend and Mr. Bagas. From all the research you guys have done, which one of lifts that most potential as raw material for biopallets and why? Thank you. Okay, you can answer it, okay. please. Thank you for the question, Miss Alma. So I will uh, answer your question about the which the most potential lifts, uh, which the most potential lifts are. Uh, as a raw material for bio pellets. So, uh, based on our activities, there are two leaves that uh, poten the most potential for a bio pellet. The one uh, is from the oven drying process, that is uh, banana leaves, and the moisture content approximately of 9%. And the second uh, method is from the sunlight drying process, that is ketapang leaves, and the moisture content uh, is approximately of um, 11 percent. So the two of the this uh, dry leaves is meet the criteria as raw material for bio pellets. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Miss Weekend. Do you satisfied with the answer? Okay, thank you. Is there any questions? Okay, please. You can introduce yourself first. Okay, uh, thank you for the opportunity. So my name is Vira. So I would like to ask a question for Miss Weekend and Mr. Bagas. How do you guys do for the sunlight drying process for 24 hours? Is it real time for 24 hours, like real day and night? Thank you. Okay, I want to answer the question. Uh, for drying process 24 hours, we took three days for drying process. With eight hours per day because we follow the length of sunlight. And when the sun set, we keep the sample in Ziploc bag, Ziploc bag with a silica gel. So the moisture content is maintained. Thank you. Okay, that's all. How about the Miss Already satisfied? Okay. Is there any question? Still any questions? Please, everyone. No? How about the time? Okay. Uh, maybe closing statement for both of you. You have closing statement maybe from your research. Um, from our research, I think um, the dry leaves in the Undip area, I hope uh, in the future we can utilize them as a alternative fuel to reduce the use of uh, coal fuel. So it is also safe for our environment. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Weekend and Ms. Radha. Give applause, please. You can sit. Okay, thank you. Okay, now we go to the next presenter. Please welcome Mr. Axelino Farel Andika with the title of the paper 
the influence of ecoenzyme bioactive fetal addition variations on compost volume reduction using biopore infiltration holes. Two persons or just one? Two persons. Okay, please. Yes. Okay, thank you, moderator. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this presentation. My name is Exelina Farrell Andika, and here's my research partner, Mustika Balkis. We are delighted to um, have the opportunity to share with you uh, our research study titled The Influence of Equenzyme Bioactive Factor Edition Variation on Compost Re Volume Reduction Using Biofor Infiltration Holes. The presentation, maybe? Okay, uh, the overview. Uh, in this presentation, we will delve into re the research we conduct, the methodologies we applied, the significant result, and conclusion we have obtained. And the part one is introduction. Uh, the waste issue in Indonesia is a pressing environmental concern. With organic waste, especially food waste, dominating at 41.97% of the approximately 68.7 million tons of waste produced annually. Mismanic waste can lead to disease, pollution, and the release of methane, a potent greenhouse gas. Ecoenzyme derived from fruit and vegetable scraps with brown sugar offers a solution by transforming organic waste into valuable products. Community level organic waste management can also be achieved through composting. And the composting not only reduces the burden on landfills, but also lowers methane emission and Reduce surface and groundwater, groundwater contamination. To expedite composting, ecoenzyme can be used as bioactive factor. This research aims to determine uh, the optimal ecoenzyme dosage for organic waste composting within biofor infiltration holes. Uh, focusing on reducing waste and offering a sustainable waste management solution. Okay. Uh, on the part two, uh, now let's delve into our methodology. In the pre preparation phase, we selected suitable location for biofor infiltration holes and determined the number of holes for the study. The material and tools required for creating the biofor holes, composting, ecoenzyme production, and monitoring the waste reducing. The research was conducted at the Environmental Engineering Department of the Ponegoro University, where we set up the biopore holes in the central yard, ensuring they achieve ample sunlight. In the implement implementation base, we use compost made from leftover fruits and vegetables collected by students of the Environmental Engineering Department. Uh, the collected waste was shredded and mixed before being loaded into the biopore holes. The study involved eight biopore holes, each treated with a different dose of ecoenzyme. Except for the biopore one, which serves as our control. The ecoenzyme dosage ranges from 5 milliliter to 100 milliliter. And we added the ecoenzyme liquid back to its hole at the same time dilution ratio every week. On the monitoring phase, we focus on monitoring the waste hack reduction within the biofor holes as an indicator of the organic waste decomposition rate into compost. This reduction was observed in relation to the application of ecoenzyme at various concentrations, which was then, then compared to a control without any ecoenzyme. Subsequent measurements were taken every day during the first week and every day thereafter, resulting in a 15 days of data or 28 measurements. Now let's on the part three is result and discussion. 
uh, on table one, data refill significant compost waste reduction after 25 days use of the using the biofour infiltration method with eco enzyme. Hole six saw the highest reduction followed by hole seven, hole eight. On hole five and three had reduction respectively. Reduction percentage gradually decreased in subsequent holes. Hole two, hole one, and the lowest in hole four. Initial composting days saw substantial uh, waste reduction, notably hole seven, which reduced by six centimeter in three days. Reduction in other holes were around one until two centimeter daily, except for holes with 60 milliliter, 80 milliliter, and 100 milliliter ecoenzyme doses, which had more significant reduction of two until seven centimeter. The rapid initial composting was due to organic matter mineralization by microorganisms raising temperature to 30 until 50 degrees Celsius. Okay, next uh, for based on uh, figure one, and we can see that uh, illustrated of effect of enzyme on waste re reduction uh, in case on consistent increase in the reduction of organic waste within the holes, notably when the comparing holes one uh, being controlled with the uh, echo enzyme and the other with the echo enzyme treatment with different dosage. Uh, and uh, for the most substantial reduction occurred in hole 6, uh, followed by hole 7, 8, 5, and all another, uh, which receive a high doses diluted for echo enzymes, which means the 16, uh, 16 milliliter. Uh, this higher dose proved the effective in reducing waste volume within uh, in the before infiltration holes uh, and the, the ecoenzyme derived from originally rich material and microorganism, microorganism uh, accelerates organic waste decomposition into compost uh, during composting. Uh, consequently, a higher ecoenzyme dose accelerate our organic waste to compost uh, process. And for the conclusion, uh, we can look that optimal uh, echo enzyme doses in a 60 milliliter echo enzyme significantly uh, indicate the doses of a, a echo enzyme to expect organic waste decomposition into compost with it uh, before infiltration. And this dosage uh, led to subtitical reduction in waste volume, demonstrating a faster composting. Due to process the introduction of numerous microorganisms by the ecoenzyme for the research, for the research another, uh, we should interpret uh, influence of moisture content with the various ecoenzyme variation on compound volume, a reduction in biofuel infiltration, host to deepen uh, our understanding for composting process. Okay, the, two minutes left. These findings uh, underscore uh, the importance of ecoenzyme as a valuable bioactivator for accelerating uh, organic waste composting, which can significantly uh, enhance sustainable waste manage and promote environmental friendly approach to handling organic uh, waste. Thank you for attention. For next, uh, I will back to moderator. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Okay, everyone here, is there any questions, please? Okay, please, you can introduce yourself first. Uh, th Thank you for the opportunity. My name is Taskia and I wanna ask, why you choose this title as a research, and maybe you can give a specific reason why you choose this title. Thank you. Okay, is, is it clear? Is it clear? Okay. Okay, you can answer. Uh, 
Thank you for your question, and I will try to answer your question. Uh, the re best uh, beside of our introduction, uh, we like to choose the uh, title because uh, first of all, we have to uh, found another uh, bio activator. Uh, so, echo enzyme can be, uh, for another research. It can be a bio activator. Uh, and for uh, solution for another photo waste uh, because echo enzyme is based or food waste yeah, that can be found in household. So uh, from the echo enzyme is can form the solution for the food waste in household, right? And the second because uh, biofar is uh, mostly using in the household for uh, rain harvesting. And uh, besides being a uh, rain harvesting, it can be the places or media for uh, uh, put it another food waste in household. The reason why we are uh, uh, choose this title because it can be applied in household in simple story. Thank you. Okay, satisfied yet? Yes. Okay, thank you. Is there still any questions, please? Okay, please, you can introduce yourself first. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Anissa Doro, and uh, my question is that you have mentioned about rapid uh, composting uh, with or, uh, microorganism. So how do uh, the microorganism contribute on uh, the mineralization process of the organic matter? in the composting process. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Anissa, for the question. Uh, talking about the microorganism, microorganism, uh, this microorganism have uh, import, important roles uh, inside composting process. Because uh, microorganism can break the complex organic component, so the organic matter uh, is easily decomposed. Uh, therefore, uh, therefore, why uh, microorganism uh, can accelerate the composting process? So uh, that's the reason why we choose uh, ecoenzyme, because ecoenzyme is rich of microorganism. So that's the reason why we choose ecoenzyme as object or research. Maybe that's the answer. Okay. How about this? Feel it's, satisfied? It's clear. Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Is there still any questions, please? Audience? No? Uh, from Mr. Axel? If or Miss? What is your name? Miss Mustika, have last uh, statement maybe. Please. Okay, as uh, same as our purpose, uh, hopefully uh, our research is can be applied simply to where uh, for the household uh, for, uh, and be more impactfully to uh, it's like a, a single step or, or small step for bigger step because uh, from household, as we know, is produce uh, the more food waste. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Axel and Ms. Mustika. Give applause to them. Okay, let's continue to the search presenter. Please welcome Miss Ayu. Putri Cahyati, with the title of the paper, A Review of Smart Agricultural Transition to Achieve Sustainable Development Goals, Smart Irrigation System. Time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the moderator for having me. I am Ayu Putri Cahyati at the Fifth International Conference in 
Environment, Sustainable Issues, and Community Development, I will present our study title, A Review of Smart Agricultural Transition to Achieve Sustainability Development Goals, SDGs, Smart Irrigation System. Then is the table of the content. Talk about part one is introduction, part two methodology, part three result and discussion, and the last part is conclusion. Okay, starting for the introduction, uh, smart agriculture is important in achieving the SDGs, especially food and water. Uh, the sustainability of nation food security can occupy a more stable condition if the optimization of the agricultural system can be achieved by increasing the availability of water resource need. Because agriculture in food production is considered significant, using 70% of fresh water resource and 20% of the world irrigated agricultural land. So, important to adopt advanced ways to use water efficiency in agricultural sector. A smart irrigation system is an integrated irrigation process with automatic technology and IoT that drives the development of smart agricultural technology in UPET. So this transition to use a smart irrigation system is highly recommended uh, considering that this transition can optimize agricultural production by automating IoT-based technology. Therefore, this study aims to highlight types of effective water saving irrigation system that have been carried out review to serve as guideline for choosing the effective and precise type of the agricultural system and support many indicators of saving in the SDGs. Okay, for the methodology, uh, this study use a qualitative review based on literature study of relevant research with the criteria index journal, review article or research article, and then publication within the last 10 years. I highlight the discussion and description of smart irrigation system as smart agricultural uh, in nation and international journal. Uh, article was compared and summarized to find IoT system in smart irrigation, effective types done before, and smart irrigation as smart agricultural in SDGs perspective. For the research and discussion, uh, for the first, IoT system in smart irrigation uh, use the types of irrigation control is open loop and closed loop. And then irrigation monitoring, use the soil moisture monitoring, weather monitoring, and plant monitoring. The effective irrigation to the recommendation uh, for, the first one, for the first is smart IoT enabled drip irrigation system, uh, where the system use the sensor fusion technique, microcontrol microcontroller, and node mm -hmm. MCU. Uh, this system making the testing facility more effective and demonstrating experimental results show that this system is approved and may be used to assist the various plant harvesting. Uh, and the second is smart IoT based learning irrigation system. Uh, this system uses wireless sensor network and physiologic controller uh, ensures the individual plants receive that exact quantity of the water necessary of their optimal growth while simultaneously offering a simulation assessment of the soil truck several sensor. Okay, smart irrigation as smart agriculture in SDGs perspective. Uh, the goal of SDGs uh, achieve through smart irrigation show good result. Uh, 11 indicator were achieved and at the monitor show the role of smart irrigation in achieving the SDGs. For the goal of the, goal, the one 
for the one uh, no poverty by increasing agricultural output and farmer income by utilizing cutting edge technology like sensor drones and internet of things zero hunger precision agriculture which increase crop yield and overall agricultural output help achieve food security and in hunger uh, good health and well-being smart agriculture and cross their appropriate usage usage to minimize the determinal effect of agro agro effect agro chemical and fertilis on human health and environment this uh, clean water and sanitation farmer may reduce water waste save water resource and increase access to clean water by employing precision irrigation steam system which align with goal six affordable and clean energy uh, incorporate clean and renewable energy resource reduce, reduce reducing the sector reliance on fossil fuels and promoting access to affordable and clean energy and then decent work and economic growth uh, open up employment opportunity in the agriculture and technology industry and then promote economic development in rural area uh, next for industry innovation and infrastructure uh, encourage the cre creation of new infrastructure and promote a cultural ongoing innovation and research in the agricultural industry sustainability and communities uh, building intelligent irrigation system effective effectively to create sustainability cities the 12 responsible consumption and production Maxim, maximizing uh, resource utilization and reducing waste, making agriculture more sustainable over time. And climate action, climate change by lowering greenhouse gas emission, protecting soil health and increase carbon sequestration through better land management practice. Smart agricultural practice can help lessen of effect of climate change. And, and the last is life on land, uh, enhance the quality of output of the farm while ensuring a steady supply of food. Okay, the next is challenges and future prospect of smart irrigation system. For the challenges is the real-time monitoring of multiple parameter and precision agriculture. Necessary uh, the use of costly, high quality and high precision sensor and equipment. On the, on the one hand, system in agriculture must adopt a varying environmental uh, due to variety of landforms. Therefore, the future prospect is this approach is expect to lead to higher crop production will simultaneously reducing the, um, the amount of water required for irrigation. Okay, two minutes more, please. For the conclusion, uh, the review has been developed around smart irrigation as smart of agriculture, uh, as brief of start of art IoT related development of smart irrigation, smart, smart, smart IoT enabled irrigation system, and smart IoT based zoning irrigation system was chosen as effective irrigation to the recommendation. Okay, uh, this is the last we're going to talk, and thank you. I hand to the moderator. Okay, thank you. Miss Ayu Putri Cahyati. Okay, everyone here. Is there any questions from you, please? Okay, two questions. Okay, you can introduce yourself first. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Alma, and I would like to ask a question to Miss Ayu. Uh, as you mentioned before about open loop and closed loop irrigation control, what is the difference between open loop and closed irrigation control? Uh, explain more about it. Uh, okay, thank you, Mrs. Salma, for the question. Uh, okay, in IoT system, in smart irrigation, use the type of controller is uh, open loop and then closed loop. The difference of the controller is uh, in the open loop, uh, the operator provide on the amount of water that will be uh, applied, and then uh, when the irrigation when the irrigation will take place. Uh, so this information is then. Um, 
program into the controller and then uh, can make the uh, schedule of the irrigation. Mm, open loop system uh, either based on volume based and uh, time based. So uh, this, uh, this controller uh, have a clock uh, is used to uh, know uh, where, when uh, irrigation is start and stop uh, to irrigate the plant. Uh, therefore, uh, for the uh, closed loop controller, uh, a control strategy for irrigation decision is uh, uh, is developed. Having defined the strategy, the control system take over the make irrigation scheduling decision. Uh, in this control, uh, based on the comparison of the uh, current condition of the system and the uh, specific design state. So uh, this kind of the control uh, irrigation IoT um, use the many of sensor. Okay. okay, satisfied yet? Okay, thank you. Okay, please, you can ask question. You can introduce yourself first. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I would like to ask Ms. Ayu about your presentation. In your presentation, you recommend two types of irrigation. There are drip irrigation and zoning irrigation. So the question is, which type is suitable for Indonesia? Thank you. Okay, thank you for the idea. Uh, for the question, uh, talking talking about the uh, suitable suitable irrigation for uh, Indonesia. Uh, actual, actually, uh, in the study, we are not uh, we are not discuss about the type of uh, based on the uh, country condition, you know. uh, But uh, so far, we are. Uh, review this paper. Uh, drip irrigation uh, is uh, applied in uh, southern Asian country like India. So uh, I think uh, the same of the geographical and then the type of the plant uh, in Indonesia and India. So the drip irrigation system is. Uh, available to suitable to uh, apply in Indonesia. Okay. okay, that's all. That's all. Okay, satisfied? See it? Okay. Is there still any questions from everyone here? No. Okay. Give applause to Miss Ayu Putri Cahyati. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Okay. Now we go to next presenter. Uh, please welcome Mr. Irham Akbar Shaifullah with the title Analyzing the Potential of Implementing Automatic Watering and Fertilization in a Fruit Plant Nursery using SVWOT. Please, time is yours. Okay, thank you uh, for the change, uh, Mr. Brigi Prasetyo. Uh, okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good morning, uh, I'm Irama Kbersheyevla from uh, Environmental Sustainability Resource Group, Department of uh, Environmental Engineering. Uh, in this time, I will present about uh, our uh, journal uh, and about environmental science technology and uh, education with the title uh, analyzing the potential of implementing automatic watering and fertilization in fruit plant nursery using SVOT. Uh, this is a review journal. Okay, uh, next. Okay, uh, number one. Uh, uh, start from the first. Uh, there are a table of content. Uh, the first of one uh, in introduction which contains background, the second we have a uh, method and scope, and the third we have a uh, result and discussion, and the last uh, is uh, conclusion. Okay, now the introduction, we have uh, include some point uh, of the background from the journal. 
number one, uh, the role of agriculture is important in supporting in the provision of food and human needs, especially in the needs of fruit and vegetables. Uh, global fruit uh, availability is becoming important factor in the food system transitioning from quality to from quantity to quality, uh, health and environment. Uh, the development of fruit demand is expected increase and be profitable, especially in Indonesia. Okay, and the second point, uh, the condition of fruit farming in the world tends to fail to meet demand. Uh, this condition applies mostly in the Europe and America, while the demand of for uh, fruit in Asia is sufficient but in not consistent. And the next point, uh, on the number three, uh, decline on the fruit crop quality climate change using chemical and embracing cultivation techniques. Okay, uh, the three costs in of fruit crop quality decline are interconnected. Extreme climate change will result in the climate uh, change in the pre precipitation, rainfall, and psychological temperature. So the plant relationship with uh, water also susceptible. Uh, to being affected, especially on tropical region, in uh, especially in Indonesia. Unfortunately, uh, the problem climate change is agricultural will not widely understood by farmers, uh, so it's necessary to carry Scandero to increase the knowledge and strategy uh, to minimize the danger of climate change. Uh, for example, water source in the extreme droughts and increase soil quality. Uh, the technology to develop can be overcome to problem of the declining crop production levels, but there are need uh, embracing the cost of adopting the technologies to make them affordable. Recently, uh, set has uh, has begun to decline, and the trend organic cultivation has increased there in on the point number three. Uh, sorry, number four. Uh, Organic farming, supported by the application technology, can overcome the problems experienced by farmers and can improve the quality of uh, agricultural product. And the fifth point, uh, there are many studies on the automatic watering implants with various model and base. Uh, uh, there are a humidity sensor of the plant media, temperature sensor, and real-time o'clock or RTC, uh, combined with IoT. Uh, the application of the technology to support above uh, the problem from uh, point one to number point four, uh, namely in irrigation and fertilization, uh, is automatic watering and fertilizing uh, fruit plants seedling. Scheduling, uh, scheduling the fertilization and watering or irrigation of fruit crops uh, is climate ensure uh, quality fruit production because fertilizer and water will greatly affect plant growth, uh, photosynthetic characteristic, and fruit production. Okay, from the uh, five point uh, and the adaptation of uh, IoT-based technology review, uh, review in prof, uh, previous study, and analysis is carried out to determine of uh, potential of automat automating watering and fertilization uh, technology. Next. On the part two, uh, method and scope, uh, we have a method using SVUT, uh, strength, uh, weakness, opportunity, and treat. Uh, the SWOT analysis identifies uh, the step of be taken each issue of the technology selected and give a clear view of the situation. The SWOT process was carried out with review relevant articles and research, carried out previousness, namely in introduction in conducting the analysis, mostly for accredited journals, uh, accesses through uh, Google Scholar, uh, Springers, and Elsevier. And then uh, the journal review are open access journal, a full text journal, and index journal, and published in the 10 last years. Okay, and the scope, uh, the scope is review on the focus on agriculture, the technology use IoT, and the influence on the environment. Okay, uh, part uh, three, uh, result and discussion. For the first, we have uh, explained the strength. Uh, little maintenance uh, required because only cleaning on is done on valve and or solenoid. Uh, Sensor-based automatic irrigation system uh, does not require much water because uh, plant water needs are optimal. 
the rest is no excess water. In addition, uh, the water process times faster uh, than manual watering system, so is more efficient increase. Uh, it can be solved problem appropriate with excess and adequate uh, water supply, thus uh, allowing no water shortcut uh, to convenience can be felt uh, the automatic uh, is system is reliable. The automatic watering system applies uh, to vertical indoor and vertical and indoor farming, uh, making appropriate for use in fruit uh, plant nursery. Okay. Uh, the system can work on a small piece of land. In, it is environmental friendly as water collection can be done during a rainy season so that it can be done by all farmers on household. Okay, and then on the weakness, uh, automation technology in agriculture will require the device to expose a harsh condition such as chain uh, changing temperature, uh, rain, uh, extreme humidity, uh, high solar radiation, and condition that can damage the uh, device. The device uh, that manages valve opening and closing automation must always be active and function reliability uh, for long time uh, with a power source must be ensured to supply power continuously. Okay, uh, and then uh, the data gen uh, generate and the store with uh, will increase power consumption so uh, that the cost required are also increasing. It can be boomerang for uh, boomerang if a, the small scale. Okay, two minutes more. Two minutes more. Two minutes. Okay, okay. Uh, and then on the opportunity, uh, the technology research in agriculture has been from 2019-2022. Uh, uh, most which uh, research published in journal High Science with uh, President uh, perception that uh, AI technology will can combine it with an effective, efficient, and sustainable uh, agriculture system. Okay, uh, on the treat, uh, we have uh, the treat on the technology is data security. Uh, security in automatic uh, watering and fertility system is very important, especially access to right information presented, many data uh, from sensor and data related. Uh, to business plan for institution cannot be published on retrofit by authorized parties if the system on the application or website running. Okay, and the uh, next conclusion. Uh, research on automatic watering fertilization has achieved many positive results uh, and generate great potential if this implement some weakness and threat can be still addressed in technology implement seriously by looking at long-term prospect. Uh, automatic watering and fertilization in fruit nursery has got a great uh, potential because the weakness and the threat is technology. Again, this technology are easily solved. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Irham, for the presentation. Okay, let uh, as no, that there is there any question from this room, please. Okay, please, Mister. You can introduce yourself first. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. My name is Muhammad Rafi, and I want to talk to ask uh, Mister Akbar why you choose what analysis for the reviewing journal, and what can be the most highlighted from the review result receiver. Thank you. Okay. So is that two question, right? Yes. Okay. Please, you can answer, please. Okay. okay. Uh, why I will uh, answer the first uh, question? Uh, why we choose uh, SWOT analysis? Uh, because the SWOT analysis is easy to understand. Uh, it does need a special training or uh, technical technical knowledge to understand the content to, of the result. So SWOT, uh, uh, under some reason, uh, SWOT analysis will help plan uh, be implemented and how step can be taken to maximize the plan. The uh, understanding by strengths and opportunities, uh, we can choose a strategy that best switch of uh, the scope of pre precision agriculture. And then uh, this is help, uh, avoiding not 
uh, effective or uh, relevant strategies. And then, uh, whereas the in the technology plan is in agriculture, uh, effective is uh, so important uh, factor. Then by understanding weakness and uh, treat, uh, we can plan uh, appropriate risk reduction measures uh, avoid uh, potential problems in the future. So from uh, SWOT analysis, we can find uh, the description of or the review of the automatic uh, watering and fertilization technology uh, in fruit plants nurseries at the at this time, and we can more uh, easily which uh, condition need to be fixed and improved. That's why we choose uh, SWOT analysis for the method in this uh, our uh, review journal, and then. Uh, the hike like uh, with much uh, the much uh, hike like the most uh, the hike like the most is uh, import uh, in the opportunity and the strengths, but uh, especially in the opportunities of this technology because there have been many application of the technology in agri agriculture activities previous uh, previous in the uh, research and journal uh, if. Uh, applied uh, together uh, will be uh, include activities between farmers or farm entrepreneurs and it be good advance on the, their agriculture and by learning where uh, what uh, has been uh, done and obtained during the farming and they will be have data and recept, uh, will use uh, advance or increasing their production of uh, uh, fruits, maybe uh, some like uh, Google Google make uh, AI for uh, agriculture. Okay, thank you. Is that all? Yes. Okay. How about you? Are you satisfied yet with the answer? Okay. Is there still any questions? Everyone here, please. Okay, please, Mister. You can. Introduce yourself first. Uh, okay, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I'm Samuel, and then I want I want to ask you something. Uh, can this technology uh, been can this technology applic applicated in Indonesia? And if this technology have been applicated in Indonesia, uh, right? How the result? I think that's all. Thank you. Okay, uh, I will uh, answer. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, some uh, research about uh, fertilization, uh, fertilization and uh, watering uh, is uh, so many research. Uh, uh, we can search on the Scopus, uh, and we uh, uh, can uh, easily easy to find the result of the research is so positive and. Uh, when we uh, research on the uh, previous uh, research, uh, the negative uh, results is uh, so hard to find. Okay. Okay, that's all. Okay, the time is up, and please give applause to Mr. Irham Akbar Shefule. Thank you, Mr. Irham. And then now we going to the next presenter. This is Miss or Mrs. or oh, Mrs. Martini. Please, you can go to the podium. Mrs. Martini with the paper title Implementation of Community Based Total Sanitation, or we call it STBM, related with their hair incidents on, <coughs> I'm sorry, on toddler. Okay, times is your, Mrs. Martini. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, the Marauder uh, today, uh, and also uh, thanks to the community that I have uh, opportunity to present uh, my research, our research. Yeah, uh, we have study about uh, Daria. Diarrhea is the public health uh, problems in our community. This is my uh, team, our team. 
we are we are from public health of faculty of uh, universitas di Ponegoro. Yeah, um, we know that, uh, and I explained uh, previous that uh, the real this is a common uh, problem in our uh, community. Yeah, you know that the visitors to the uh, primary health care is we call uh, Puskesmas. This this is, is uh, the second, maybe the second, um, yeah, uh, higher cases in Puskesmas. Uh, in Central Java, and then we have uh, the data from uh, these uh, cases of the area, the global and also the national and uh, the province uh, in Central Java. Yeah, such. Uh, yeah, I, I don't see uh, clearly the what is it? <laughs> uh, my slide here. Because it uh, seems it's small, yeah. Um, yeah. Two billion cases, uh, and this uh, fatality is very high yeah, because uh, five hundred twenty-five uh, thousand um, deaths from uh, the community, and the high cases. Yeah, when and uh, we can uh, look in the. Yeah, and the uh, structure of the uh, disease that uh, infant on our shoulder is uh, the most yeah, uh, cases of diarrhea. And then the uh, impact, yeah, the impact uh, of this uh, disease uh, can uh, several uh, impact that we know, such as uh, fatality, uh, death, and, and then the, uh, the uh, this, uh, what is it, such as yeah, and the chronic disease, it can be uh, happen in these cases. Uh, we, know th we, we all also know about the factors, yeah. also mainly uh, the factors is uh, our uh, sanitation in our environments and also the, yeah, the practices, uh, public health practices, uh, like the washing uh, our hand, uh, using soap and the other factors. Yeah, we put on the data, uh, I'm sorry, and it's still in, in Indonesia because we uh, catch in the data from the uh, health authority in the province, uh, Central Java province. Yeah, uh, we want to to know about um, the factor of diarrhea in, in the infants, uh, and we use the indicator of program of sanitation. We call the S, uh, STBM. Yeah, uh, this is the name of community-based total uh, sanitation. Yeah, this research uh, done, uh, I think, uh, yeah, last year. And then we uh, have a look, uh, we had a location in the rural area yeah, in, Banyu, uh, in Banyumas uh, Regency. Yeah, the condition of uh, our uh, setting, uh, sample setting, is uh, yeah, near with the rifle and then the poor sanitation. So we want to know about the uh, incident of these cases on the infant, at, uh, on, on infant's uh, setting. We do. Uh, we, uh, we did uh, observation study. We uh, with the cross-sectional approach. Yeah, there is uh, many uh, variables uh, based on yeah based on uh, the sanitation uh, indicator. Yeah, we we can uh, see about the characters uh, of the infant and the mothers uh, or. Uh, caregiver of uh, the uh, infants, that uh, the characteristic of uh, this uh, result, yeah, about, about, the, uh, about their age, uh, age and then 
uh, the background of the mother, yeah, we can see the most of, yeah, most of uh, them is the is still the yeah the lowest of education. Yeah, uh, and then the factors. Uh, how the fa uh, about the factors of uh, the item of sanitation uh, support of the diarrhea uh, incidents? Yeah, we can see uh, here about the uh, about the situation of sanitation and also the practices uh, public health uh, public health practices. Yeah, what the uh, washing by soap and then the other that I mentioned uh, before. Yeah, we know that the several of yeah several of uh, factor we use. Uh, uh, this is analysis bivariate analysis and several of, uh, factors uh, significant see, uh, significant, significant uh, the factors to uh, support the diary incidents. Yeah, and then uh, yeah we. Uh, compare with the several of uh, reference, yeah. That uh, that like uh, what is it? The defecation of uh, the infants uh, not using uh, the the fixed toilet. Yeah, he, uh, they they can uh, do defecation in uh, near with the rifle. Yeah, we we document uh, this research. Yeah, and then we also see about the uh, near with the river because the location is a uh, rural area. Yeah, defecation uh, care. What is it? This is yeah. Can support uh, the available of bacteria can infect it uh, to the infant that the. Yeah, swim in the river and then wash the wash her uh, their hand, and also uh, oftenly uh, they uh, play in the river. So uh, this is can uh, infected of uh, the bacteria to the infant. Yeah, uh, we Mrs. can Martini, see. Yeah. Two minutes more. I'm it's sorry. More. Okay, thank you. This is. Um, Reference uh, told that the uh, adequate hand washing facilities is a uh, sport uh, to their uh, status, uh, uh, healthy status of the children. And then, yeah, uh, we can also about the yeah covering of the uh, use, using a dr uh, drinking in the uh, household. Yeah, if they not. Uh, uh, cover this uh, container so it can be infected by bacteria yeah and so also we can uh, know about uh, seeing the garbage in the uh, household yeah it can uh, interact the vector to come in the in their house yeah and then uh, the house is complex near with the yeah uh, what is it the household uh, canal so so there is, um, yeah, can, uh, yeah, uh, the order it can appear in this situation. So the factor can um, come uh, to the to their house. Yeah, with uh, this is our conclusion about about the analysis of some uh, several factor uh, factors to uh, increasing of the diarrhea in the infant. Yeah, we can see in the habit of tol uh, toddler of uh, defecation about the defecation, uh, and also about the how the uh, they are washing and on the so, uh, storage condition in the has household and the food storage also uh, trash condition, uh, the presence of garbage in the uh, yeah, surrounding of their house, and also on the uh, separate uh, condition, and then yeah. We uh, give a recommendation yeah, to the uh, respondent, the, our community, to uh, do the best practices to, yeah, to uh, prevent this uh, disease. Yeah, also to the uh, staff, uh, health uh, staff in the primary health care to educate uh, to them. Yeah, I think it's not just 
not uh, uh, the one per, uh, one time, but uh, maybe uh, continue. Yeah, because we know the uh, people on the, our community is still help, uh, is still have uh, less education. Uh, that is my uh, presentation about our research uh, about the uh, diarrhea in the uh, our, in the uh, toddler. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for your attention. Uh, maybe if uh, you have a question, yeah. Okay. Thank you, receive. Mrs. Martini. Yeah. Everyone here, is there any questions? Please, you can raise your hand. Everyone, please. Okay, please, Mrs. Sri Sumiati. Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Budi. Uh, Bu Martini, I have two uh, question for uh, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Uh, Martini, Bu Martini. Uh, what specific reason did uh, you choose uh, Banyu, uh, Banyumas Regency uh, as location? Uh, and then, are condition similar to your research uh, location in Semarang City? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Busri, <laughs> yeah, for uh, your question. Yeah, this is very uh, a good uh, question yeah, about uh, these about your um, items. Uh, to uh, to a question, yeah, at here. Yeah, about about the yeah background uh, our research how do in uh, Banyumas yeah uh, yeah we we choose the Banyumas because Banyumas is the highest of diary diary incidents yeah in, in Central Java and then we can uh, see also the factors of uh, uh, especially in, in sanitation yeah indicator. Yeah, we know that uh, Banyumas and then uh, the surrounding of Banyumas is uh, having uh, the less of yeah, uh, sanitation con uh, condition based on the parameter of the um, Minister of Public Health. So we choose uh, the one, uh, one location in uh, Banyumas uh, Regency. Yeah, uh, I think, yeah, where, 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 uh, where we want to uh, re do the research about the uh, diarrhea or the uh, other of infection disease, I, th I think uh, it is similar, yeah, sim uh, because because uh, when we we uh, determine of the factor uh, risk factor in the certain situation, certain certain uh, place, uh, example, we can uh, also uh, can uh, get the the finding the, the same the similar find, finding yeah but we uh, we should uh, see about the uh, situation of the uh, location setting yeah uh, uh, such as my research yeah, uh, the uh, the village uh, near with 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 the rifle and then yeah uh, the uh, the less of uh, organis uh, uh, organized about the uh, sewage uh, or garbage in in the household complex. So this is a factor. I think if if we want to uh, do the research the other uh, yeah, location, I think uh, the uh, finding is uh, the same or similar. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Maybe this is enough. <laughs> okay. Your question. Yeah. Are you satisfied you. yet, Mrs. No. Sri Sumiati? No. Yeah. Enough. Oh, enough. No. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mrs. Sri Sumiati. Okay. Is there still one minute. Is there any question again to Mrs. Martini? No? Okay, Ms. No, please give applause to Mrs. Martini. Thank you, yeah, Mr. Thank you. Martini, for Mrs. The, Sun, yeah, for the presentation. My problem with my okay. eyes, <laughs> we can <laughs> catch the, on my slide. Okay, thank you. Yes, yeah. that's okay. Okay, now we're going to the next presenter. 
is Miss Jenny. Okay, Miss Jenny Dwi Cahyani Hutagaul with the paper title Review of Refused Refuel Fuel as Municipal Solid Waste Treatment in Developing Asian Countries, Current Condition and Challenges. Please, time is yours. Um, okay, thank you for, uh, the, for the change, moderator. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jenny Dwi Cahyano Tagaul. Uh, I'm one of the co-author and the representative of other author of uh, this paper with title Review of Refuse the Refuel as Municipal Solid Waste Treatment in Developing ASEAN Countries, Current Condition and Challenge. Okay, uh, here there are four parts in this paper. The first one is introduction, the second one is method, the third one is discussion, and the last part is conclusion part. So why we interested to choose uh, this uh, idea of our paper? So the first one is refuse their full is an alternative full and one of the most cost-effective uh, sub full substitution. So municipal, municipal solid waste uh, shows a possibility of being an energy, energy resource and with RDF technology it can be it can be achieved. And RDF itself can provide uh, economically feasible uh, substitute full uh, production. And the second one is RDF has gain popularity in developing country. So some research show that um, RDF manufacturing has been constructed in some developed country, such as Turkey, Egypt, and um, Iran. And the last one is the high moisture content of municipal solid waste in developing countries makes RDF production difficult. So uh, the composition of uh, the waste of each waste uh, varies depending on income level. So uh, when we talk about high income countries, uh, the, high co uh, the waste composition show high, lower uh, high moisture. And for the, ascend uh, for the developing country or upper middle country, uh, we can uh, show that uh, the waste composition has high moisture. And, the, uh, for, and according to some writers, uh, it showed that this um, fact uh, makes the production is difficult. So uh, for this paper method, we use um, literature review method. And uh, for the criteria, criteria for our uh, for our review method uh, is first our index journal, the second one is review article or research article, uh, and the third publication within the last 10 years, and the fourth is publication from developing ASEAN country. Uh, figures in screen uh, show the waste generates of each income level country, and uh, we can uh, see that um, the waste composition in high income level has a lower high organic uh, waste and in the upper middle country or um, lower middle country has high moisture content in its waste composition. And because of that uh, difference of each uh, waste composition, uh, RDF4 and RDF5 is this suitable RDF uh, for a developing country. Uh, this is the current condition of RDF implementation. So, um, developing country like India, Indonesia, and Thailand have also shown interest in utilizing energy recovery from municipal solid waste. Uh, in this paper, we review three countries uh, in ASEAN that um, considered as developing country. The first one is Indonesia. 
So in Indonesia, um, Jeruk Legi Landfill in Celacap and Semarapura City Material Recovery Facility in Denpasar City has adopted palliative, palletized RDF. And the, uh, they use bio-drying method for the pretreatment RDF. And um, RDF is mostly used as a um, cement factory. The second one is iron um, from Waste Asia. So RDF has been used by iron as a substitute full source for a cement factory. The lotion cement factory utilizes RDF from rust residue, and research indicates the rust waste have the capacity to produce 168 tons per day of RDF for the lotion cement production. And the last is Indonesia, India from South ASEAN. So in India, RDF alone is capable, is capable of producing up to uh, 7.5 a megawatt of power, and RDF is primarily employed for managing waste in the pulp, paper, wood, and sawmill industry. Okay, so what the challenge that RDF has to face in, for their implementation in ASEAN developing country? The first one is the expense of product shipping. So research that, research that was conducted by Dianantha Prihandoko showed the utilization of RDF in the Puyungan landfill. And uh, this research demonstrates the economic viability of uh, RDF. They address the possibility of unviable projects when they incorporate transportation expense into the economic evaluation of the project. Uh, so the RDF products must be delivered to off-takers elsewhere if the RDF plan are less possible off-takers. The other challenge is handling high moisture, municipal solid waste is more expensive. So the composition of municipal solid waste is greatly influenced by demographic and income level. So uh, when municipal solid waste has high moisture content, um, there are some pretreatment that has been conducted uh, to treat the waste itself, and which affects RDF price since the pretreatment of food and green waste with high moisture content is more costly. Next is some industry hesitate to utilize RDF, so developing nation, nations uh, encounter increasing difficulty in waste management, including issues related to waste collection, transportation system, and the, the implementation of homemade waste processing method. Additionally, due to the diverse background of RDF users, different industry sectors and companies might have the unique approaches to implementing the RDF specification. The lack of proper testing and evaluation of different types of RDF by waste management companies has made customers need more certainty about its composition. Uh, and the fourth is chlorine in RDF is an environmental risk, especially in cement production. So two uh, minutes more, yes. Mr. Huda, Mrs. Sudagol, Mr. Sudagol. Research, uh, research from India and followed it, the effects of employing uh, RDF as an alternative fuel in cement production. So chlorine in RDF is uh, serious because it's, it can deteriorate uh, the cement. Uh, factory machine. Okay. Uh, so the conclusion of this paper is a recent study demonstrate the emerging ASEAN country like India, Indonesia, and Ireland have huge RDF production potential, notwithstanding its high moisture municipal solid waste composition. So by drying increases municipal solid waste color value, so uh, it it has been used in this developing country. Uh, and uh, there are some challenges that uh, they have to face regarding to uh, its implementation, uh, such as um, at the F economic viability depends on plan proximity to RDF of takers. Uh, the second one is demographic and economic level also affect municipal solid waste composition with which affects RDF price. 
and the third is uh, developing nation nations also require assistance with garbage collection, improved transportation system, and residential waste pre-sorting. And the uh, fourth, IDF chlorine causes system deterioration. Okay, that's all from me. I give it back to moderator. Okay, thank you, Miss Jenny Dwi Cahyani. Everyone here, is there any question to Miss Jenny? Please, you can raise your hand. Okay, please. Thank you, Mr. Budi, for the opportunity. I would like to ask Ms. Jenny about your presentation. Uh, I heard you mention in Indonesia uh, has implemented this waste treatment in Jeruk Legi and Semarapura. So have the result been utilized? Thank you. Okay, is it clear, the question? Yes. Okay, please, you can answer. Okay, uh, so there are some results from uh, this RDF utiliz utilization in Indonesia, especially in Jeruk Legi Landfill and Semaratura, Semarapura MRF. So um, the RDF from Jeruk Legi Landfill uh, has um, made cement holes in Indonesia and cement grassic in Tuban interested to substitute substitute their full. So for cement grassic in Tuban, they are willing to replace uh, some of their full with RDF with a substitution rate up to 10%, while cement holes in Indonesia, cement holes in, in Indonesia considering a substitution rate up to 15%. And for uh, RDF from Semarapura City Material Recovery Facility, uh, they uh, achieved to uh, make RDF with the colorific value of the substance is 3,904 uh, 3, calorie per kilogram, and this um, exceeds the expectation of um, the calorific value of um, RDF uh, based on cement industry requirements. So the cement rec industry requirements, a minimum calorific value of 3,000 uh, kilocalorie per gram. Okay. okay, is that all? Yeah. Okay. Are you satisfied yet about the answer? Okay. Thank you. Is there still any questions from this side, maybe? From right side, from me. Please, anyone? Okay. Mr. Samuel. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, uh, Mr. Ui. Uh, I want to ask you about, uh, you mentioned before, uh, the chlorine, chlorine, and how to treat the chlorine so uh, it cannot uh, risk the environmental. I think that's all. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so for uh, chlorine treatment, uh, from some research uh, show that for uh, chlorine treatment, they have to uh, make a different composition of their RDF. So RDF uh, itself uh, uh, regularly has a composition consists of paper or maybe uh, cardboard or maybe other organic material uh, and some um, waste uh, that in the RDF composition uh, contain uh, uh, chlorine. So if you want to reduce the chlorine content in the ways uh, you have to uh, make a different composition and some research from India show to um, treat the chlorine in their cement factory they use by by Pascal to reduce the chlorine content in this uh, RDF okay how about the answer 
Mr. Samuel, are you satisfied yet? Okay, thank you. Okay, because time is up, we give applause to Miss Jenny. Dwi Cahyani Hutakao. Thank you, Miss Jenny. Okay, you can have a seat. Okay, for the next presenter, please welcome Miss Dara Khalifa. Okay, with the paper title is Smart Controlled Irrigation Using the Internet of Things and Challenges for Increasing Water Usage Efficiency, a review. Okay. Times is yours. Thank you, moderator. Good, after, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dara Khalifa, and I would like to share the result of our review with the title is smart control education using the internet of things and challenges for increasing water usage efficiency. First of all, these are the points that we will discuss. The first one is introduction, the second one is methods, the third is results and discussion, and the last is conclusion. So, education is one of the key factors that must be prioritized to promote agricultural productivity. Conventional agricultural education system that waste farmers' time and energy have an unfavorable environmental impact by using water less effectively. In implementing sustainable agriculture, an agricultural system is needed, especially an effective and efficient irrigation system, so that the water used can be utilized as well as possible by minimizing the wastage of water use. A technological approach is required to implement more efficient irrigation, increase agricultural productivity, and also more environmentally friendly. In order to conduct this study, relevant papers on smart irrigation were reviewed narratively. There were numerous research articles on smart irrigation. The articles discussed several subjects, irrigation system, monitoring techniques, and the IoT. So next is results and discussion. The first one is Internet of Things for Agriculture. So the integration of various agricultural equipment and gadgets facilitates the establishment of a network, enabling them to collaborate and make informed decisions on irrigation and fertilizer supply. Smart solutions enhance this precision and efficiency of equipment for monitoring plant growth. Using sensors and intelligence system it enables the surveillance of meteorological parameters, assessment of fertility conditions, and accurate estimation of optimal quantity of fertilizers necessary for promoting crop development. And the next is irrigation scheduling in real time. Recent study indicates that growers who employ manual, volume-based, and time-based irrigation scheduling as their prim primary scheduling strategy experience significant water losses. Real-time irrigation scheduling plays a crucial role in water saving by effectively adjusting the quantity of irrigation provided to meet the specific needs of plants. Smart irrigation system monitoring. The first one is sensor of soil. Several soil moisture sensors are used to analyze parameters such as conductivity and acidity. Crop yields can be predicted by measuring soil conductivity because soil texture and organic matter can be indirectly estimated. These two factors are close to water availability. Next is sensor of thermal. Some plants susceptible to temperature changes. High temperature can affect shoot and rot growth in a short period. The fluctuation in soil temperature directly influences the, the absorption of soil nutrients. 
And next is sensor of moisture. Moisture monitoring is necess necessary to predict water loss due to evaporation that essentials for plants photosynthesis. Humid conditions encourage the growth of mold and bacteria that can cause plants to die and crop failure. Next is the, the challenges. The first one is concerns on devices. The standardization of device plays a pivotal role in promoting the extensive, extensive integration of technology across. Diverse outcomes may arise as a consequence of misunderstandings resulting from coding mix match. Standard, standardized machinery can effectively mitigate the difficulties linked to interoperability across diverse applications, system, tools, and products. Next is concerns on cost. The expenses associated with implementing IoT technology in the agricultural sector can be categorized into two main components, hardware cost and software cost. The high expenses associated with hardware and software cost uh, significantly obstacles for farmers in implementing, in implementing tools and technology. Consequently, reducing system cost remains a prominent difficulty encountered by several studies. The next is concern on data. The primary focus concerning data transmission for IoT devices is the issue of reliability in order to make well-informed judgment. Device must gather and transmit dependable data effectively. Inaccurate measurement will significantly diminish the dependability of system. And the last is concern on system. It is crucial to recognize that sensor nodes deployed in the field are susceptible to environment fluctuation, which can significantly impact the precision of the gathered real-time data. In certain instances, device compatibility may be hindered by persistent fluctuation in environmental condition or hardware malfunction. Next is the future. So the paper highlights the potential of, for academics and farmers to utilize the advancement in the IoT for purpose of real-time monitoring and data collecting. This can enable machine learning, data-driven control and deep learning techniques to be applied in order to intelligently forecast various agricultural processes, including weather, yield, and water consumption. Investigating advanced digital irrigation technology is significant in establishing a reliable, reliable appropriate, and economically valuable system for conventional farmers. And for the conclusion, is the global concern surrounding global warming and climate change has gained significant global attention, mostly due to its far-reaching repercussion on the critical matter of water shortage and food security. Acknowledging this consciousness has prompted researchers to incentivize their efforts in advancing advanced methodologies for life monitoring and regulation in precision agriculture. These strategies have been developed to mitigate the effects of this unavoidable phenomenon. This research examines the monitoring and control techniques employed in precision irrigation system, drawing on past and pertinent studies that have concentrated on improving water conservation in agricultural practice. It aims to evaluate the potential research prospect in this field, specifically, specifically, specifically focusing on enhancing water conservation, optimi optimizing crop output, and improving energy efficiency in irrigation practice. That's all for my presentation, and thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Dara Khalifa. And now, audience turn. Who will have a question, please? Okay. You can introduce yourself first. Okay. Uh, thank you for 
the opportunity to ask. Uh, well, my name is Ariadne Yovita, and my question is, I want to know that on soil, on soil moisture sensors, what, what is the function of measuring conductivity of the soil? Thank you. Okay, is it clear, the question? Yes. Please, you can answer. Thank you for the question. Uh, the function of measuring conductivity of the soil is so crop yields can be predicted by measuring soil conductivity. Uh, the reason is soil texture and organic matter can be indirectly estimated. There are the two factors that close to water availability and the presence of potential pest plants. Therefore, mm, the amount of herbicide applied to the soil can be estimated by measuring the electrical conductivity of the soil. Yeah. Is that all? Yes. Okay. Okay. Are you satisfied yet? Okay. Okay, next question, please. Thanks for the opportunity. My name is Weekend Mayarati, and I will ask to Miss Dara. Talking about um, one of the monitoring for plant growth, why is the temperature monitoring is very important for plant growth? Thank you. Okay. That's all? Yes. Are you satisfied yet? <laughs> no, eh? not, not yet. Not yet, not, oh, not yet. <laughs> Please. Very tired. Oh. Long detail. Long detail. Please. <laughs> so, why temperature is important for plant growth? Because. Uh, Plant growth in indoor or outdoor smart agriculture is affected by temperature, making monitoring important. Uh, some plants are susceptible in temperature change. High temperature can even affect shoot and growth growth in a short period. The fluctuation in soil temperature indirectly influence the absorption of soil nutrients and the maintenance of soil moisture levels. The soil temperature significantly influence several physical processes occurring within the soil. Okay, done. You done answer. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Are you satisfied yet? Okay, thank you. Is there still any question? We still have one minute. Anyone, please? No one? Okay. If no one, please give applause to Ms. Dara Khalifa. Thank you, Ms. Dara Khalifa, for your presentation. Okay, for the next presenter, please welcome Miss or Mrs. Miss Rosana Margaret Kadarianti. Not come yet? Okay, Miss Dara? Eh, sorry, sorry, Miss Rosa, I mean. Miss Rosana, Margaret Kadarianti? Okay, not come yet. Okay, we go to the next. Oh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, okay. respected to our oh, moderator and video. the research Please. colleague. Let me introduce Please. myself. I am uh, Rosana Margaret. Kadarianti, and I apologize for not being able to attend the seminar in a person. Regarding of this condition, let me explain the result of my research about the characteristic of Lucy sediment and its distribution pathway in a Porong River. Sediment character Sediment characteristics are important in a river research because they are related to the sediment source and can reflect sediment transport process. One of the important sediment characteristics for transporting sediment is a grain cess. 
The, it is important to know the grain size to understand sediment source and transport. Research on basic material characteristics is important, especially in river in Indonesia, which have uh, various characteristics, and one of them is uh, Porong River. Porong River is a river that has a variety of sediment source, comes from Brantas catchment area and Lucy Outfall. The flow of Sidoarjo Mat Volcano, Lucy, through the river impact increasing sediment source since 2006. This figure is a Lucy Outfall number two and number three in a Ginonjo area that through the mud into the Porong River. The flow of Lucy in Porong River causes deposition along a river and estuary, and it's affected the morphology change in the Porong River. This figure shows the morphology change, especially in estuary. This morphology change will affect change in river hydrodynamics and hydrodynamics play an important role in the riverbed sediment transport process. As a result, the discharge of Lucy into the Porong River caused change in the morphology, hydrodynamic and bed material characteristic. So, to address the issue this study aimed to investigate the characteristic of riverbed sediment material around the Lucy Outfall by analyzing nine cross sections to obtain bed material data sediment. This is a study area. This one is Sidoarjo Mat Volcano. The Sidoarjo Mat Volcano. Lucy is a massive ongoing eruption of the mud, water, and gas in East Java, Indonesia, triggered by a drilling accident in 2006. The eruption has submerged 16 villages over the 100 hectare of the land that belonged to the resident and public facility. It was a large damage caused by a mud volcano eruption. This is the Lucy Outfall number one, number two, and number three. The Lucy Outfall is a channel through which the mud and water from the Sidoarjo Mud Lucy are released from the eruption site to the Porong River. The Porong River is a flooded canal or floodway with a length of 46 km and a width of 100 until 150 meters. This is my research location in the Porong River. I do the bed, I do the research is located on the Porong River with a upstream observation range start from the cross section one and moving straight from the Lucy Outfall site to the downstream of the Porong River with a cross section distance is one kilometer and so the total length is 9.5 km in 9 cross section. The methodology used in this study is divided into two. Number one is field investigation and the second is laboratory testing. Field investigation were conducted to collect the sample of the riverbed material at the nine cross section. And the, for the laboratory um, testing, we do the sieve and hydrometer analysis to get the grain size distribution of the sediment material. The bed material samples were taken from the nine cross section and at each cross section, the bed material sample are observed in three layers using the bottom grab tools. In one cross section, bed material are collected from the river left. 
the code is A and the middle is B and the right bank using the bottom grab tools is a C. I show you the following figure is a sample of the bed material sediment in cross section 8 with a material such as sand, silt, and clay. The sediment type of bed material is classified by analyzing grain diameter. An observational shift and hydrometer analysis is performed to determine the percentage of grain that pass through a shift number, specific shift number. Based on the distribution and size analysis result, we use a sediment classification system ASTO. Bed material sediment is the main thing discussed in this study, and the grain size of the bed material sediment is an important factor in river morphology change. This figure presents the result of shift and hydrometer analysis conducted on three different sections. One is section upstream. The two is cross-section around the Lucy, and the last is the cross-section 9 in the downstream of the observation site. Material size distribution in the cross-section 1 in upstream, we found the average diameter of at the point 1 on the left is 0 0.075 mm, in center river is 0.047 and the right bank is 0.50 mm. Material size distribution around the Ginonjo outfall or the cross section 2 we found the average diameter in the left on the left is 0.2 mm. Center is 0.1 and the right bank is 0.06 millimeter in the downstream area or the cross section 9 we found the on the left are 0.05 millimeter center river is 0.33 and the right bank is 0.02 millimeter this is a various material distribution we have found from the field investigation it comes to cross section 1 to cross section 9 the material presentation in the color which have gravel sand silt and clay in observation bed material in upstream or the upstream porong river silt was dominated in left and middle bank of the river while sand material was found on the right bank of the river. Moving to the Ginonjo outfall near Ginonjo outfall area or the cross section 2 we found the bed material which is dominated by sand by sand on the left and middle bank of the river while on the right bank is dominated by seal. Moving to the downstream area, the type of sand material is only found in the middle of the river, while the right and left bank of the river are dominated by seal. In this cross-section 1, the composition of the river bed material is affected by erosion in the upstream area or the Brantas catchment area and sand mining. Sand mining. Sorry. At this observation point in cross section 2, there is a bridge abutment and riverbed safety structure in the form of 
a ground seal. Change in the type of material, especially in the cross section after the Ginonjo outfall, are probably due to the presence of bridge abutment and ground seal around the observation site. Local scoring around the bridge and ground seal result, result in the displacement, displacement of sediment material and the sand material to follow a different pathway, especially on the left bank of the river from the cross section 2 until the cross section 3. In contrast, we found observation at the cross section 4 until the cross section 9. Sedimentary material in silt was generally found in the Porong River in the riverside area and sand sediment sand sediment were usually found in the middle of the river the best material from point 4 to the 9 in the downstream area is dominated by seal with a percentage reaching 49% So, in this study, indicated that the bed material sediment in Porong River primarily consists of the sand, clay, and seal. Local scoring on the bridge, pillar, and ground seal result in concentrated sand on the left and middle bank of the river at the cross section 2 and 3 and sediment from the Sidoarjo Mat Lucy outfall is concentrated on the Porong River bank, especially from the cross section 4 to the cross section 9. Thank you for your kind attention and your time. If you have a question about the research that I did, please contact via the email listen in the presentation video. Thank you. Have a good day. Good afternoon. Okay. Thank you for the presentation. Miss Rosana, Margaret Kadaryanti with the video. Yeah, we can have a question to her because uh, this is video. If you have any question, you can send an email to her yeah and the next presenter maybe mr usep already here mr usep okay good morning prof please you can go to the podium to present your paper it's about tourist travel constraint and environmental motivation to be involved in voluntary tourism please welcome prof Usep Suhut, how are you, Prof? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, please. The time is yours. So, uh, projector? No, I mean, how to. Maybe you can see here? Yeah. Okay. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, uh, Sorry, Bapak Moderator, and also ladies and gentlemen, I just arrived, I just landed in Semarang and directly from the airport to this building. So thank you for Inas who helped me a lot, okay. guiding me to, to arrive just on time. Yeah. Very on maybe time. I was late, yeah. Maybe no, no. I was late. You are not late. <laughs> okay. On so. Time. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, my research is about volunteer tourism. So if you are not aware about volunteer tourism, volunteer tourism is about intersection be between tourism and volunteering. So it is about people who go somewhere, not just for holidaying, but also for volunteering. For example, if you, are, uh, if you live here in Semarang 
and then you go to Bali, for example, for some reason, for doing uh, volunteering, that's absolutely you are volunteer tourist. Yeah. So uh, actually, this is a part of my doctoral dissertation uh, 10 years ago. <clears throat> So it's kind of uh, nostalgic for me to to do uh, present, to, to do this this kind of presentation, and I believe and I uh, I consider that the topic is still uh, niche. So that's why I keep doing uh, some research on volunteer tourism. Okay, so uh, as I said earlier, that volunteer tourism is. Uh, can I? So volunteer tourism is a combination between volunteering and tourism, between volunteering and holidaying. People, uh, it, it, uh, volunteer tourism is different with volunteering. Yeah, it's, it's very different with volunteering. If we do volunteer, it means we only focus and dedicated our time, our energy, just doing volunteering. But volunteer tourism, we you know, we have intention to spare our time in the, a destination by sparing our time for doing volunteering and also uh, holidaying. For example, people, uh, people come, uh, I mean, people from Australia come to India. They spend one month, one month, uh, two weeks doing volunteering and another two weeks for holidaying. Or they have different uh, different composition of time. For example, um, in a week they do volunteering Monday to Thursday, and then starting from Friday to to you know to to Sunday they do holidaying. So it depends on their intention, and also it depends on the program. Uh, because commonly, volunteer tourism, it, it de it's depend on uh, the, the agency, yeah? Uh, if you browse, if you search in the internet, you can find so many agencies around the world uh, providing volunteer tourism programs, like for example, uh, commonly in developing countries and under developing countries, like for example, in Cambodia, in India, in Africa, also in Latin America. Um, commonly, yeah, people spend time and also they pay all the costs. They pay the, the traveling costs, they pay the, accommodate, the accommodations, and also they pay for the project itself. So if they want to build a bridge, for example, because uh, engineering students, uh, civil engineering students want to, for example, they want to, to build a bridge in a developing country. They have to, you know, uh, they have to provide the fund by themselves. That's uh, the, the real uh, duty of volunteer tourists. So, <clears throat> there are many, Platform. There are many patterns um, of volunteer tourists moving around. Yeah. Uh, uh, in this slide, I mentioned about six types or six patterns of volunteer tourists moving from one place to another. Um, as I said earlier, if you are if you you are in Semarang and then you go to Bali or to other part of Indonesia. So it means you, you are volunteer tourists within a de developing country. But if the tourists from, for example, from Australia in Melbourne, and then they go to other part of Australia, like for example, they go to Perth or to Sydney, uh, still they are volunteer tourists, but within a developed country. And there are so many examples, people coming from developed to developing countries, and also from developing to developed countries. Yeah, there are a lot of patterns. Uh, some of them funded by themselves, some others funded by the agency, or there are so many 
actually there are so many uh, <clears throat> funding uh, organization to help participants to get the, the payment. Um, since this is my quantitative study, uh, so I chose three variables. The first one is constraint, travel constraints. I'm wondering about what kind of constraints can cause, yeah, cause the volunteer tourists or potential volunteer tourists to stop joining this volunteer tourism project. So um, I cite many, actually there are many uh, preview studies and I, in here, I divide this kind of volunteer, uh, volunteer tourism within two different constraints. The first one is intrinsic and the second one in, is extrinsic. Intrinsic means uh, the constraints coming from inside the, coming inside from the, the participants. Like for example, just because they have no money, just because they have uh, bad health, or even sometimes because they have no interest and they, the constraint just about in their mind. And intrinsic constraints uh, commonly comes from uh, outside of the participants. Like for example, they have no uh, friends to come together and also uh, for example because they engage with their family and with their job. The second, uh, the second variable I chose is environmental motivations. Actually, uh, in my big dissertation, I divide uh, motivation into different, yeah, into different uh, aspects. The first one is about giving motivation. It means when we, yeah, when the participant, when the tourist, uh, <clears throat> They intend to go to somewhere for holidaying, for fulfilling their needs. Yeah. So we talk about our self, our selfishness. We talk about ourselves. For example, I want to go to Bali for uh, getting air, fresh air. Yeah. I want to go to uh, Semarang because I want to get benefit from my traveling. And the other, the other side is giving, uh, taking, sorry, uh, what I said earlier is taking motivation. It means we want to take benefit from our action, from our uh, activities. And the other side is giving motivation. When volunteer tourists intend to go for volunteer tourists, for, for, for volunteer tourism because they want to give uh, something to the community, they want to help, they want to contribute. Yeah, so it's it's kind of contradiction. Yeah, it's like giving and taking. And the other side is uh, environmental motivation. That's on the the best on the basement. Environmental motivation is uh, you know combination between giving and taking. I want to help. Uh, for example, I want to go to volunteer tourism because uh, because. By doing so, I can help the environment. Yeah, so I'll help the environment, but also uh, on the other side, I also take benefit by, for example, because the nature, because the ecosystem, because the the environment giving me back. Yeah, just for example. And then on top is about religious motivations. Religious motivation is very different motivation because it's like because we <clears throat> we want to you know we we want we thankful to the God because uh, our condition so that's why uh, that's why uh, this motivation is uh, I separate with others uh, basically and <clears throat> basically I have uh, I mean. I drew this, this scheme, this figure, because I have done the quantitative study. So I have um, identified every single aspect of motivation and they cannot come together. So that, that's why I have to separate. 
uh, one by one. So this is uh, part of the result, um, profile of the participants. And this is the validity and reliability test for the, the first hypothesis, uh, the first variable, which is uh, motivation, yeah? Uh, sorry, this is for environmental motivation. And then this is for the result for validity and reliability test for the travel constraints, either intrinsic and also extrinsic. So this is the, the hypothesis result, the, the structural model. So, <clears throat> okay, I forgot to tell you about the intention. So I, I chose three different frame of intention. Intention within a year, intention within three years, and also intention within five years. It means uh, the question is about do you have any intention to be involved in volunteerism within, uh, within one year? Yeah, within one year. And <clears throat> this is the result. The participants tend to have no intention to be involved in volunteer tourism within one year. Yeah, and then uh, the interesting thing I also asked the participants about their, their intention to be involved in volunteerism within three years. Still, the results saying that they have no intention within three years. <clears throat> but, contrastly, when the question comes to the, the, <clears throat> the, the five years frame, do you have any intention? Yeah, do you have any intention to be involved in volunteer tourism within five years? So it means uh, they said yes. Yeah, the results saying yes. It's been the hypothesis for the first and the second years. They have no intention. It means that <clears throat> uh, motivation uh, failed to predict intention, but uh, intention for the first, uh, for the one and the three years, but for the five years, it works properly. So, uh, coming to the conclusion, it means that volunteer tourism, so this is for, you know, for contribution for the manager, for, for the programs managers. So, if they do marketing, if they want to promote volunteer tourism projects to people, to to potential uh, volunteer tourists, it means they don't have to, ask, to expect the, the participant coming within one year or even within three years. So you have to, it means you have to come back within five years. So it's, uh, of course, for the theoretical uh, contribution is very um, vital. It is very uh, important because this paper uh, has not been, I mean, there's no research yet about this part, so that's why uh, this paper is very high recommended to be, to be presented here. So uh, I think the, uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for the moderator and also for the participant. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Usep Suhut. And now, please, audience, if have questions to Mr. Usep Suhut? Maybe one or two questions, please. Okay, please. Miss Jinai, Jinai or Jenny. Jinai Nayunggolan. Jinai Hutagal. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, thanks for the change. My name is Jenny. Um, uh, I want to ask a question. Uh, we know that volunteer identic with developing country, but you mentioned before that this volunteerism can be applied for um, going to developed country to other developed country too. So I just want to know what's the reason or the urgent behind this kind of uh, volunteerism. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> can yes. I? Okay. You can answer. So um, why they do 
why they do volunteer tourism, why people engage in volunteer tourism, and then why they want to go to other countries to do volunteer tourism. I think there are so many reasons. Um, actually, my, my research is a mixed method. So I, do, uh, I did uh, qualitative and also quantitative. So it is interesting. When I ask some, some participants, uh, participants are is international volunteers, international tourists. So they, are, they were from Australia, from Africa, from China, from some other countries and some other nationalities. Um, when they, they were asked about their motivation, why they want to go to uh, go abroad for volunteering, just because they want, just because uh, some of them say that it's like uh, they want to fulfill their dreams. Yeah, I want to go to Africa for years, for many years, and then I did. So it means because they want to fulfill their dreams to go to Africa, not just for holidaying, but also for volunteering. Because they, uh, like for example, uh, because they know what, what situation in Africa. Yeah. And some others say that be, uh, they involve in volunteer tourism abroad because um, the assignment of the, from the campus. Yeah, they want to, because they, as I said earlier, uh, there are some students from civil uh, engineering. They have a project to do something, yeah, to do, like for example, they have a bridge design and they want to implement. They want to build a bridge. And the, some others say about uh, why they did volunteer tourism abroad because um, Actually, there are so many reasons, yeah. Oh, oh, okay. Some others say it's a kind of a gap year. In, in Australia, in America, and also in many other developed, country, other, uh, developed countries, um, from high school, after they graduated from high school, some of them didn't go directly to university. They commonly take one or two years as a gap year. They want to go traveling. They go to. They want take a, a break. And then after they have some ideas what to do after graduating, they uh, they just go to uni or to get work, just like that. Thank you. Is there any other question? Okay. Is there any question? Please. Mr. You can introduce yourself. Thank you for the interesting uh, presentation. Uh, myself, Muhammad Junaid Iqbal. Uh, I am from Pakistan. Uh, actually, you talk about more uh, civil engineer in your presentation, and uh, I am also a civil engineer. So, uh, and I am also maybe a, a volunteer tourist uh, because I came to Pakistan here. So uh, if uh, I want to build a, uh, you talk about a, a bridge construction. So if I want to build a bridge in here in Smarang, so maybe there are a lot of uh, barriers here who stop me uh, to build this bridge. So what do you think about it? Okay. Did you, did you get the question? No. Can you repeat uh, more loudly? Slowly and loudly. I'm sorry. Okay, okay. Uh, you talk about the uh, bridge construction. So if I want to uh, construct a bridge here in Simarang, so uh, maybe there are a lot of uh, barriers here to stop me to build this bridge. So what do you think about it? So how can we uh, overcome to this uh, situation? Okay. Yeah, I think I got it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> The case I took was in, not in Indonesia, yeah. Uh, at that moment, when I asked some, some, some expatriates or some, volunteer, some volunteers, yeah, I said volunteers, not volunteer tourists, some volunteers from Australia to Indonesia, they, they say that they've, they've they face many difficulties 
The first one, the big, the big problem is about the visa. The, the Indonesian government uh, do, did not grant granted the visa for volunteering. There is no option for volunteering here in Indonesia. Only for holidaying, for work, and also for studying, not for volunteering. So that's why you cannot do here in Indonesia. It's very difficult. But in some other countries, like for example, I said in Cambodia, in India, and even in Africa, people just, uh, if you go to travel agents, our volunteer tourism international, our volunteer international agents, they have some, there are so many options to do. If you want to go to Orphan, Orphan House, Orphanage, you just chose it. Uh, even what kind of position you want. For example, there is a project building a house or building a school, and then you just apply for the manage, for to be a manager or to be supervisor or to be just construction uh, or just handyman. And then uh, they, they would give you a certain rate. So if you want to be a manager for this uh, construction, for example, a construction project, you have to pay certain amount. Yeah. Uh, and as a manager, it means that you don't have to be uh, stand alone because they, they are a real professional to help you manage the construction project. Yeah. So uh, if you wish, if you want to do, as I said, like for example, you, you want to, do, to, to build a bridge here, it's made, it is better if you work with local here because uh, and apply not just a volunteer. Uh, I, I mean, uh, obviously not volunteer. So you have to, I don't know, maybe uh, come together with the students and academic staff here as a community outreach. I think that's a better way. Okay, thank you, Mr. Usep Suhut, for the presentation. And I think the time is up. Okay, give a big applause to Mr. Usep Suhut. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, Mr. Usep is the last presenter and alhamdulillah all presenter have present their respective article thereby we approach at the end of the first session at this room and ladies and gentlemen thank you very much for your participation in parallel session we do hope that you enjoy this program I am Budi Prasetyo Samadikun, on behalf of the committee, do apologize for any inconvenience during the parallel session and to fully appreciate to all presenters. After the parallel session is over, we will return to the main room and awarding from the committee. Please do not leave the room and see you at the next increase, six increase next year. Good afternoon and thank you very much for your contribution. Best regard from us. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Today's technology is increasingly advanced. People are competing to apply technology to streamline their work, especially artificial intelligence technology, which is very popular everywhere. This technology can be used in various sectors, including the environment. It is time for us environmental activists to see this technological development as an advantage to manage the environment effectively and efficiently. For this reason, the International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues, and Community Development or INCRIT gives a platform for professionals, researchers, and academicians to share their experiences and explore the possible influence on the future. In Korea 2023 comes with the theme of reinventing integrated solutions to environmental problems in the era of environmental intelligence, where the theme this time is very new and follows technological developments. INCRIT can be a place to build connection between researchers, students, and industry to continue working together to produce work for the environment. INCRIT 2023 provides a platform to continue exploring, discovering, and developing works that can later become a new start for environment development. INCRIT 2023 bring several topics and subtopics regarding the environment that revolves around zero carbon by implementing a circular economy in other methods, namely environmental health and safety, environmental science, technology and education, green infrastructure, energy conservation, and efficiency. Input progress from year to year has great hopes of becoming an international forum that can be developed by researchers, students, industry, and government to communicate their research results and exchange ideas about its basis and application in the environment. INCRIT can also be a conduct for ideas to help improve technology and produce a better earth from year to year. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. May your dream fly high. Imagination will take you everywhere. The future is always beginning now. Universitas Diponegoro, UNDIP, is one of the oldest public universities in Indonesia, established on January 9, 1957, located in Semarang, Central Java, Indonesia. Since the enactment of the government regulation number 52 of 2015, the status of UNDIP is legal and it is state university. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Greeting for University of Ponegoro, the best university in Indonesia. Universitas Diponegoro 
as one of the universities in Indonesia, has declared to be research university with an international reputation in accordance with the vision of be become an excellent research university. As an international world-class research university, although UNIF is expected to have a good academic reputation that creates globally competitive graduates with excellent competence, conduct continuous research and development for the people with continuous improvement of human resources by internal standard capacity development program. Internationally, UNDIP has ranked by the QS World University Ranking and Times Higher Education World University Ranking as the top 8 best universities in Indonesia. UNDIP was ranked in the 2021 QS Asian University Ranking. University Graduate Employability at 2020 QS World Ranking and in the 2021 QS World University Ranking by Subject for Business and Management Studies. Moreover, UNIP also ranked by Times Higher Education World University Ranking for Times Higher Education Impact Ranking and Times Higher Education World University Ranking by Subjects for Business and Economic, Life Science, physical science, and engineering and technology. For environmental sustainability, UE Green Metric also posted UNDIP at 39th World University Rankings. UNDIP has a strong commitment to improving the quality of education towards global standards by continuously improving the quality of education for its students, increasing the quantity and quality of research and scientific publications, and contributing to society through community services. Strategic planning and efforts being implemented to internationalize UNDIP is by opening international class programs in various study programs, allocating scholarship opportunities for applicants from abroad through the Dipenogoro Master Scholarship or DIS program, and Dipenogoro Exchange Experience Program or DIP, cooperating with leading universities in the world concerning education collaboration such as facilitating UNDIP students to study abroad and vice versa. Faculty of Law has developed with the improvement of the education system, the increase in number and quality of teaching staff, lecturers, as well as the increasing number of facilities and infrastructure supporting the education. Faculty of Economics and Business the faculty which has an international undergraduate program and Bloomberg collaboratory facilities was ranked 501, 550 in QS World University ranking by subject 2021. Faculty of Engineering also a home for research center such as Membrane Research Center and Center for Biomechanics, Biomaterial, Biomechatronics and Biosignal Processing. Faculty of Medicine is one of the best faculties at Universitas Diponegoro. Faculty of Medicine has complete laboratories which support the student practicum. Faculty of Medicine also become the important part of the establishment of Rumah Sakit Nasional Diponegoro RSND or Diponegoro National Hospital that belongs to Universitas Diponegoro. Faculty of Animal and Agricultural Science has transformed through sustainable concept and digitalization by the development of digital farming and sustainable livestock. Faculty of Humanities consists of several study programs, include literature, language, history, anthropology, libraries, philosophy, and archives. It has several language centers such as Indonesian, 
English, and Japanese. The Indonesian History Research Center and Local Culture Preservation Research Center. Faculty of Social Science and Political Science. It has the International Relations Study Program that is well known amongst prospective students. Whereas the Communication Study Program emphasizes collaborations with local and national mass media to channel the student talents by directly practicing it. Faculty of Science and Mathematics is a home for several research centers such as Center for Plasma Research that focus on the plasma application and Center of Marine Ecology, Biomonitoring and Sustainable Aquaculture that covers a various aspect of marine ecology. Faculty of Public Health aims to create graduates with good competency and skills in the public health. It's supported by academic and research activities that are intensively conducted in the area of occupational health and safety area, health promotion, stunting, and many others. The Faculty of Fisheries and Marine Science has vision to become an excellent faculty in the field of fisheries and marine tropical by 2024. It becomes the center for education, research, and community development for the coastal region. It has Center for Coastal Disaster Mitigation and Rehabilitation Studies and Natural Laboratory for Fishery Study, Marine Conservation, and Biodiversity as well as Disaster Mitigation and Coastal Management and Rehabilitation. Faculty of Psychology Universitas Diponegoro also provides international exposure in the form of student exchange and summer course programs. School of Postgraduate Studies was established in order to respond to the global challenge with a multi- and interdisciplinary approach. In vocational school Universitas Diponegoro, the students were educated with curriculums that is in line with the industrial needs. Apart from that, the vocational school equipped with certified smart green building that use renewable energy as a power source along with water and wastewater treatment system for the water resources. Supporting the vision to become an excellent research university, UNDIP established the laboratory center with high-tech equipment, several research centers in the field of medicine, food technology, water and wastewater treatment, renewable energy development, health supporting technology, advanced material engineering, culture preservation, sustainable development and established marine science techno park for research and technology development in the field of marine and fisheries and the incubation for the startup business which is open for international and domestic student internship. UNDIP has various supporting facilities to provide excellent services in education as well research. International collaboration with hundreds of overseas top-ranked universities has established to support internationalization in research, academic, and community services programs.
Undit. 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 As we know, today's technology is increasingly advanced. People are competing to apply technology to streamline their work, especially artificial intelligence technology, which is very popular everywhere. This technology can be used in various sectors, including the environment. It is time for us environmental activists to see this technological development as an advantage to manage the environment effectively and efficiently. For this reason, the International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues, and Community Development or INCRIP gives a platform for professionals, researchers, and academicians to share their experiences and explore the possible influence on the future. INCRIP 2023 comes with a theme of reinventing integrated solution to environmental problems in the era of environmental intelligence, where the theme this time is very new and follows technological developments. INCRIP can be a place to build connection between researchers, students, and industry to continue working together to produce work for the environment. INCRIT 2023 provides a platform to continue exploring, discovering, and developing works that can later become a new start for environment development. INCRIT 2023 brings several topics and subtopics regarding the environment that revolves around zero carbon by implementing a circular economy in other methods, namely environmental health and safety environmental science, technology and education, green infrastructure, energy conservation, and efficiency. Input progress from year to year has great hopes of becoming an international forum that can be developed by researchers, students, industry, and government to communicate their research results and exchange ideas about its basis and application in the environment. INCRIT can also be a conduct for ideas to help improve technology and produce a better earth from year to year. Today's technology is increasingly advanced. People are competing to apply technology to streamline their work, especially artificial intelligence technology, which is very popular everywhere. This technology can be used in various sectors, including the environment. It is time for us environmental activists to see this technological development as an advantage to manage the environment effectively and efficiently. For this reason, the International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues, and Community Development, or INCRIP, gives a platform for professionals, researchers, and academicians to share their experiences and explore the possible influence on the future. INCRIP 2023 comes with a theme of reinventing integrated solution to environmental problems in the era of environmental intelligence, where the theme this time is very new and follows technological developments. INCRIP can be a place to build connection between researchers, students, and industry to continue working together to produce work for the environment. INCRIT 2023 provides a platform to continue exploring, discovering, 
and developing works that can later become a new start for environment development. In CREA 2023, bring several topics and subtopics regarding the environment that revolves around zero carbon by implementing a circular economy in other matters, namely environmental health and safety, environmental science, technology and education, green infrastructure, energy conservation, and efficiency. Inquit progress from year to year has great hopes of becoming an international forum that can be developed by researchers, students, industry, and government to communicate their research results and exchange ideas about its basis and application in the environment. INCRIT can also be a conduct for ideas to help improve technology and produce a better earth from year to year. As we know, Today's technology is increasingly advanced. People are competing to apply technology to streamline their work, especially artificial intelligence technology, which is very popular everywhere. This technology can be used in various sectors, including the environment. It is time for us environmental activists to see this technological development as an advantage to manage the environment effectively and efficiently. For this reason, the International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues, and Community Development, or INCRE, gives a platform for professionals, researchers, and academicians to share their experiences and explore the possible influence on the future. In CREA 2023, comes with the theme of reinventing integrated solutions to environmental problems in the era of environmental intelligence, where the theme this time is very new and follows technological developments. INCRIT can be a place to build connection between researchers, students, and industry to continue working together to produce work for the environment. INCRIT 2023 provides a platform to continue exploring, discovering, and developing works that can later become a new start for environment development. INCRIT 2023 brings several topics and subtopics regarding the environment that revolves around zero carbon by implementing a circular economy in other methods, namely environmental health and safety, environmental science, technology and education, green infrastructure, energy conservation, and efficiency. INCRIT progress from year to year has great hopes of becoming an international forum that can be developed by researchers, students, industry, and government to communicate their research results and exchange ideas about its basis and application in the environment. INCRIT can also be a conduct for ideas to help improve technology and produce a better earth from year to year. As we know, today's technology is increasingly advanced. People are competing to apply technology to streamline their work, especially artificial intelligence technology, which is very popular everywhere. This technology can be used in various sectors, including the environment. It is time for us environmental activists to see this technological development as an advantage to manage the environment effectively and efficiently. For this reason, the International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues, and Community Development, or INCRE, 
gives a platform for professionals, researchers, and academicians to share their experiences and explore the possible influence on the future. In Cree 2023 comes with the theme of reinventing integrated solution to environmental problems in the era of environmental intelligence, where the theme this time is very new and follows technological developments. Increase can be a place to build connection between researchers, students, and industry to continue working together to produce work for the environment. Increase 2023 provides a platform to continue exploring, discovering, and developing works that can later become a new start for environment development. Increase 2023 bring several topics and subtopics regarding the environment that revolves around zero carbon by implementing a circular economy in other methods, namely environmental health and safety, environmental science, technology and education, green infrastructure, energy conservation, and efficiency. Increased progress from year to year has great hopes of becoming an international forum that can be developed by researchers, students, industry, and government to communicate their research results and exchange ideas about its basis and application in the environment. Increased can also be a conduct for ideas to help improve technology and produce a better earth from year to year. We know today's technology is increasingly advanced. People are competing to apply technology to streamline their work, especially artificial intelligence technology, which is very popular everywhere. This technology can be used in various sectors, including the environment. It is time for us environmental activists to see this technological development as an advantage to manage the environment effectively and efficiently. For this reason, the International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues, and Community Development, or INCRE, gives a platform for professionals, researchers, and academicians to share their experiences and explore the possible influence on the future. In Cree 2023 comes with the theme of reinventing integrated solution to environmental problems in the era of environmental intelligence, where the theme this time is very new and follows technological developments. Increase can be a place to build connection between researchers, students, and industry to continue working together to produce work for the environment. Increase 2023 provides a platform to continue exploring, discovering, and developing works that can later become a new start for environment development. Increase 2023 brings several. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to INCREED 2023. Now we are arrived to eighth session, which is the second material session. And in this session, we will have three keynote speakers. 
The first one is Santi Phong Quen from Vietnam. Second is Dr. Victor Glid, Doctor of Philosophy from Hungary. And the third one is Professor Koichi Yamamoto from Japan. This session will be guided by Insinyur Ganjar Samudro, Sarjana Teknik, Magister Teknik, Doctor of Philosophy, Insinyur Profesional Pratama. Before that, we would like to read the moderator's CV. Mr. Ganjar is one of the lecturer in Environmental Engineering Department of Diponegoro University. Currently, he has finished his last latest study at Yamaguchi University and received Doctor of Philosophy title. Some of his research interests are phytoremediation wastewater and soil pollution, ecotoxicity of water and wastewater, microbial fuel cell, water losses in distribution pipeline, and solid waste management and treatment. Without any further ado, please welcome our moderator, Insinyur Ganjar Samudro, Sarjana Teknik, Magister Teknik, Doctor of Philosophy, Insinyur Profesional Pratama. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and presenter, audience here. Thank you very much for coming here. Uh, we will be uh, start starting for this second session of keynote speakers for three keynote speakers. And then for, info, for your information that this international conference will be at the fifth international conference on environment, sustainability, and ISIS and community developments, or we can say in Crete 2023, since the first conference was held in 2019, maybe. And then regarding the venue and dates, Hold on Wednesday, today, uh, on this fifth floor building of TIN. This will come to those who register for this conference offline. So as you are joining this conference today, welcome and enjoy. So, and then it's really fun to join today. It is awesome, amazing for the joining participants and presenters from several countries. We truly appreciate for your involvement. And then for this session, I have a responsibility to, to accommodate the session of keynote speakers as follows. Uh, Dr. Tran T. Puang Kyun. Second is Victor Kilet from, uh, sorry, Dr. Tran T. Puang from Vietnam. And then uh, Dr. Victor Kilet from Hungary. And then Professor Koichi Yamamoto from Japan. So, in order to save time, I would like to invite Dr. Tran Thi Phuong Kyun from Vietnam as the first speaker to present her work. The time allocation is around 30 minutes. And then maybe I would like to read the biography first. Please wait a moment. Okay, so Dr. Tran Di Puang Kyun, uh, 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 her educational background is from the Graduate Institute of Environmental Engineering, College of Engineering National Taiwan University, and then Ming Chi University of Technology, Department of Safety, Health, and Environmental Engineering, and then Don Don Tuk Tang University, Center for Eco Occupational Safety and Environmental Technology. And then continue to Don Tuk Tang University, Faculty of Environment and Labor Safety, 2011 to 2015. Uh, and then for save the time, uh, please welcome Dr. Ta 
Dr. Tan Tranti Puang Kyun to present your works. Please, uh, time is yours. Yeah, thank you so much for your introduction. Yes. Yeah. Maybe you can share your screen now. Uh, excuse me, can you see my PPT now? Uh, not yet. Maybe. Okay, let's me. Let's try. So, excuse me, can you see my my screen now? Uh, still, I can I cannot see. Yeah, okay, now is your uh, maybe for the full screen. Please try to click the full screen mode, and so the audience can see your presentations. Yeah. Uh, excuse me, can you see it now? Yes, but please uh, try to click the full screen mode so we can... Yeah, I already clicked the full screen mode, so in my uh, laptop is now full screen mode. Ah. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So... Oh, yes, yes, I... yes. Maybe from the committee, we'll try to help you to screen your, yeah. uh, to share your presentation. Maybe you can close your presentation now. Oh, okay, okay. Is it, is it clear from the audience offline here? And then yes. the audience from the online, is it clear? Okay. Yes, it's okay. free it's now. Yeah. Okay, please start thank your presentation. Uh, yeah, Trump. thank you so much. And I'm so sorry for my a little bit low tech. Yeah. Good afternoon, Professor, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as you know, my name is Jong Thi Phung Wen, and I'm from Faculty of Environment and Labor Safety at Jonathan University, Vietnam. So it is my big pleasure to present uh, my title in the conference. The, my, my talk today will be Converting Waste into Value at These Materials. So can you please go to the next slide, please? Slide, please. Yeah. yeah, excuse me. Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so this is my the whole story is my study. You know, like I'm a lecturer in Tony Tang University and I also alumni in my department. And I did my PhD in NTU uh, Taiwan and my uh, my master in also Ming to Taiwan. And I have more than uh, six years I'm stay in Taiwan. Most of my study focus on the semiconductor and electronics industry wastewater. You know, it's like uh, it's very toxic and they have the different many like many kind of stream and for my PhD, i focus on the one stream for cleaning we call like uh, the volatile organic compound and especially isorbyl alcohol and uh, you know like with the high purity around uh, more than 20 percent in concentration the industry they will recover by distillation with but with the lower concentration likes around five percent uh, they usually dilute it and uh, directly discharge to the wastewater treatment system. So in this case, it will enhance the um, K 
chemical oxygen demand concentration and it also inhibits the activity of uh, microorganisms so reduce the efficiency of treatment system so in this case the industry give me a small project try to uh, retreat the ipa before uh, the track into the wastewater treatment system. So my study tried to use microwave, the rapid heating, uh, combined with advanced oxidation process to treat IPA. It's my PhD uh, studies. For my master study, I also work on the semiconductor wastewater treatment. Like first, I focus on the acid stream, and I will talk about this later. It's also my uh, topic for the talk today. Yeah, can you go to the next slide, please? So um, for today's uh, the first uh, first topic, I would like to talk about the recovery of high purity fluoride from concentrated hydrofluoride wastewater. Uh, please for the next slide. Yeah. So what is fluoride? You know, like fluoride compounds are all related by containing fluorine. And fluorine is the naturally occurring element in the earth. It combines with hydrogen to make uh, hydrogen fluoride. And it is a colorless gas with a strong irritating odor. Hydrogen fluoride dissolves in water to make hydrofluoric acid. And hydrofluoric acid can corrode more substance except lead, was uh, polyethylene and platinum. Yeah, next slide, please. So, where uh, fluoride come from? They come from uh, for the industry. Come from most from industry, uh, especially semiconductor and electronics industry. Other maybe from alum. Uh, uh, Aluminum, oil reels, chemicals, agriculture, and metal cleaning operations, glass elements, uh, manufacturing. So the next is how it is affect to our health as the uh, very low levels around uh, 1 to 1.5 milligram fluoride per liter in drinking water is essential for maintaining a solid bone and uh, prevent the dental cavity. However, with the high level, it may be harmful for our health. Uh, it's, uh, Example like in children whole tea are for me. A safe fluoride level may cause dental fluoroses, which visible change in the teeth you can see is the figure. Yeah. The next slide, please. So the high uh, level of uh, fluorine or hydrogen fluoride gas also can cause the uh, muscle pain, harmful lungs and heart and cold death. At low level, it may be irritate the eyes, skin and lungs. Contact with a uh, hydrogen uh, fluoride acid, even diluted, it also can burn the eye and skin. And if we contact with a uh, long term uh, Hydrofluoric acid in workplace, maybe it can damage our kidneys and liver. Yeah. Next, please. Yeah. So for the for the, the environmental effect, how is effect like the it can hurt the wildlife, especially fish holes uh, can be trapped in the waterway with high level of fluoride and knows where to go. The concentration of hydrogen fluoride is very corrosive and it would badly burn any flame birds or animals. So the small quantity of hydrogen fluoride is, oh, is can be neutralized by natural anchoring in the water, but the larger quantity may be roughed out the pH and you know, like fluoride, are not expected to bioaccumulate. Yeah. So next, please. So um, as I told you, like you know, like due to the rapid expansion of semiconductor and electronics industry in Taiwan, a uh, large amount of wastewater contain high concentration of hydrogen fluoride were generated. And in Taiwan, they use the traditional chemical precipitation 
to recipitate fluoride and generate, they will generate the huge amount of rich, uh, water rich blood calcium fluoride. It means they convert the waste from water to solids and the sludge become the hazardous waste. So in this case, the purity of calcium fluoride in the uh, sludge around 60% is cannot apply in any industry. But you know calcium fluoride is the uh, potential material for industry. So based on this idea, my study was designed to generate the high purity of calcium fluoride, especially with purity eight, more than 80% we can apply in industry. So in our study, it's almost similar to the traditional one precipitation. You can see we yield calcium uh, carbonate and the calcium salt to precipitate uh, fluoride, and then we add a polymer uh, for, for, for coagulation and fluctuation. Then we remove the water, and then we just collect the sludge and dry it and then we will analyze the purity of calcium fluoride and impurity of sili uh, silicon dioxide. Yeah, next slide please. So in our study, we apply the central composite design with three independent variables Calcium, uh, calcium to fluoride, molar ratio, silicon and polymer concentration at five level. As you can see in this figure, it shows the effect of silicon and polymer concentration on the purity of calcium fluoride. Uh, in this figure, we keep the molar ratio of calcium to fluoride in the constant uh, as the central point zero point six. Four, five, and we will vary the silicon concentration from 1.48 to 2.32 and polymer concentration uh, vary from uh, 16 to uh, 19. And you can see the result like um, the color strain from blue to red color. The blue one is uh, corresponding to 8 58% uh, of calcium fluoride and the red one is corresponding to 85% of uh, calcium fluoride. You can see like when we in re, uh, uh, sorry, like uh, the sili silicon concentration is have a huge effect to the calcium fluoride uh, purity. Uh, you can see like it's uh, the very small amount of uh, silicon dioxide uh, sorry, silicon concentration, it will have the high purity, more than 80% of calcium fluoride. It's easy to understand like um, the silicon can compete for calcium source with fluoride to form silic dioxide impurity. So um, next slide, please. So the next slide, you can see the effect of molar ratios and silicon concentration on the purity of calcium fluoride. Uh, in, this, uh, in this test, polymer concentration will keep in the central point as 18 ppm. And you can see like uh, when we ingredient the molar uh, ratio of calcium to fluoride on in in calcium fluoride purity will fall. But if the uh, ratio access uh, 0 0.672, uh, the reduce in calcium fluoride purity was achieved. Uh, it's easy like uh, uns access of calcium iron may increase the super uh, saturation index and it's leading to the low risk uh, risk and it's also enhance uh, the stability of the effluent. So, next please. So the next one, we, uh, we invest the effect of molar ratio uh, and polymer concentration on the purity of calcium fluoride. And um, you can see like uh, 
when we increase the polymer's concentration from Excuse me, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, and the, the internet word is the rough arms. Yeah. Okay, so uh, for, for this one, is it the effect of uh, molar ratio of calcium to fluoride and polymer concentration on the purity of calcium fluoride? You can see like when we increase the polymer concentration from 16 to 17 ounce in rate in the purity were found. But if it's over, over those of uh, polymers, it will uh, make the gel, it will form the gel and it reduce the purity of uh, calcium fluoride products. Next slide, please. So, Based on the CCD uh, central composite and response surface uh, design, we found the optimal condition for uh, calcium fluoride is as uh, E1 and E2, and we also this uh, we also this uh, the duplicate experiments, and you can see it's not much different between. Uh, the model and my drills result. And uh, to demonstrate that our uh, calcium fluoride products had the high purity of calcium, so calcium fluoride, so we try to test and compare it with a commercial calcium fluoride powder. That's from Taiwan. And you can see in the table is my, our calcium fluoride is around 88%. Uh, compared to the commercial one is over 85 and we have the less silly silicon dioxin, dioxide in my sample but for the commercial one is you can see around 14 this very huge one the reason why so you can uh, maybe I can explain you in the next slide The most uh, important one in our studies, we try to remove the impurity SiO2. So the easy one you can see uh, in this uh, diagram. Based on the pH of SiO2, we try to control all our experiments less than with pH less than two. And during this pH, most of SiO2 form can be kept in a liquid phase. And we did the second step is the alkaline leaking. And that's the reason why the SiO2 concentration in our products is very less compared to the commercial one. And even compared for the traditional chemical precipitation methods in Taiwan. So we keep on more similar, but we just uh, control the BS for the chemical one. So it may be easy to apply in the future in Taiwan. Yeah. So can you go to the next slide? So in the next is some small project that my undergraduate student, uh, the ongoing working, like ongoing. So the first one we try to uh, recover the calcium oxide from the eggshell. And we try around uh, five types of eggs, uh, like the well, the rebrand chicken, factory farm chicken, dust, and goose eggs. And uh, we try, like, it's very easy one. We dry it, pour it, and remove the membrane, and dry, and uh, we will calcine it at the temperature around uh, over 500 degrees Celsius. Then we can collect the calcium oxide. So how we apply it, maybe we can see in the next slide. The sea cell. Sea cell is also another source uh, with the free calcium. And we also recover calcium from 
uh, sea cell and who you know like calcium from egg cell and calcium from sea cell we apply is a the low cost disinfectant to treat to uh, remove the E. coli and bacillus spore and they have two mechanisms the first one is due to the alkaline and the second one is due to the hydroxyurate hyro generated in the solution it will uh, uh, have the it will damage the bacteria cytoplasmic membrane and dna yeah next slide please so uh, for the following one, we try to generate the uh, low cost absorbent. This one is uh, made from lamb cell, and we modify it with uh, FNO2 to treat the um, hot water. Yeah. So next, please. And this is the, our design. We try different uh, layers of material, and one of the layer will be our uh, generated low cost absorbent. Yeah, let's please. Because this is a student uh, project, so we use very simple one to design. It's, the, it's all of their design, you can see. We use the empty uh, plastic post hole as the column. And we fish with the um, hard water that collected in our country. So next slide, please. So the other the other one we use the masca masca cell, and it also make the low cost absorbent. First for the masca cell, and the next slide is the coconut coconut cell, we try to use it to treat the big farming wastewater, especially the nutrient pollutant. Next slide, please. Yes, that's it, our uh, products. Because it's all going uh, project, so I haven't collected the data yet. So next slide, please. So it's, as I told you, like the coconut cell, we also make, uh, we also try to make the low cost absorbent to compare with macanu cell. You know, because in our country, is the coconut tree is very popular, and that's why we try to yield the cell to make the low cost uh, absorbent. Yeah, the next slide, please. And this is the products when we heat up at different temperature. The next one, and this is uh, we apply it to treat the big farming wastewater. You can see it's, uh, uh, this is the colors. It's very concentrated uh, wastewater, and when we apply uh, the uh, coconut and macanu cell in the the third column, the treat this wastewater have color. It's very dark color. The reason is my students, uh, they forgot to wash the uh, absorbent before apply into the column. That's why after the water pass to the column, it will have, uh, it will uh, contain uh, the particle, the, the small particle uh, from absorbent. It's make color. And for the next study, I asked my student try to wash the serpent uh, several times until the which no color will found before applied to treat any kind of wastewater. Yeah, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, that's all for my studies uh, and my talk today. Uh, I'm so sorry uh, for my uh, low tech uh, technique today, and I'm also sorry that I cannot join the next step discussion uh, because I have the committing with the faculty right now. But for the next slide, you can find my uh, contact. If you have any question, you can download me or you also can uh, send a message to my email. Yeah, can you go to the next slide to show my email to the participant, please? Yeah, please committing to yeah. uh, screen, uh, to share the email of 
the first uh, uh, sorry, like for, sorry, like mm. this person don't have the email. Maybe you yeah, can, yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Mm, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Maybe from Thank the committee will be next yeah. to uh, inform the email yeah. or the audience yeah. next. So maybe yeah. uh, for the Dr. Tran, uh, please stay for a moment because the committee yes. will give you a certificate for this presentation. But maybe from my, uh, okay, okay. This is the certificate for you. Congratulations for Dr. Tran T. Wong-kun for present uh, converting waste into validated materials. And I believe this material is very interesting, especially from the methods uh, and then the products. Uh, especially like uh, same countries like us, Indonesia, developing countries. So I think this is very, very good, interesting. Maybe in the future, myself will be contact you. So maybe uh, please, please, please wait for the next collaborations, Dr. Tran. Yeah. yeah, thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much, Professor. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Uh, okay. Thank you for your presentation today. Maybe big applause for Dr. Tran Thi Wong. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you yeah. so much, Dr. Tran Thi. For the second, uh, yeah, for the information from the committee that uh, for Dr. Tran, there is no uh, Q&A session. So I will move to the next keynote speakers from Hungary. So maybe please welcome Dr. Glit Victor if you available now. So please committee share the curriculum vitae or biography of Dr. Glit Victor. So Dr. Glit Victor is from the University of Pax, Hungary educational and training historian and teacher and political scientist from University, uh, University of Pax, Hungary. And research interest is civil society, civil NGO, networks, environmental conflicts, the green movement and green parties in migra migration and multiculturalism, 21st century global and central European political processes. So are you there, uh, Dr. Glit Victor? Yes. Ah, Hi okay. there. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. How are you today? Great. Thanks uh, a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, great. Amazing. So maybe... Can you see my presentation as well? Mm, not yet. It is still black screen here. I try to uh, share it once again. Yeah. So maybe if you have uh, any difficulties, maybe the committee will help you to share your screen that you sent before. Is it okay or? Yes, no? the presentation is the same. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I try to use a full screen and then, what about now? Uh, still black screen, we can see, black we cannot screen, see. Okay. Yeah. May I ask your? Ah, okay, okay, okay. We, we can say uh, very clear now. Uh, great, great. Yes. So maybe okay. for the information for Dr. Glit Victor, so the time allocation for presentation is 30 minutes. So please, uh, reasons for 30 minutes. Uh, time is yours. Yes, thanks a lot. Hi there, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the iCrit conference. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's my privilege to discuss um, um, universities' role in sustainable development efforts. My name is Viktor Glid, as you mentioned, from Hungary. It's a small country, and our university also a small university. Um, my presentation basically focuses on two major topics. On the one hand, it affects infrastructure development carried out for the sake for sustainability. On the other hand, uh, it affects the soft part of this, the educational opportunities. Mostly our core question is how universities could play a role in green transition, the paradigm shift, what are their contribution in this process and how can they help 
changing students' attitudes. So, um, unfortunately, I can't move, make move my presentation. So, may I ask you to just move my presentation, please? Uh, okay, okay. Maybe the committee could help Dr. Glit to share his presentations. So, maybe he has uh, difficulties to move his presentations. So, please. Please wait for a moment, Dr. Glit. Thank you so much. So until they set my presentation, then I will continue my, my, my presentation. Unfortunately, I need to leave at uh, 9 o'clock according to Hungarian time. That's why I try to give you a short insight into our project launched in 2016. This project's name is Green University Program, Green University Program. And the mission of this program is the encouragement of all innovations, good practices, initiatives, and local policies regarding environmental sustainability. And furthermore, to shape and strengthen ecological awareness by the means of science and education. This wide-ranging program serves as a foundation for the implementation and, if necessary, for the correction of the university's sustainable uh, strategy. Uh, could you please share my presentation if you don't mind? Yeah, yeah. Uh, how about the committee? Are you have a or, okay? Please, please, please wait for may, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But the presentation. May I try to share it once again? Oh, okay, okay. Please, please, please try. Please. Okay. Okay. It is clear now. Okay. Maybe you can try for the first step to move your presentation from slide one, slide two, to ensure that your presentation is smoothly. Unfortunately, I can't hear you. Uh, what's the problem, Dr. Glit? Can you try to move your presentation for... Can you hear me, guys? Okay. Uh, from my uh, computer, that your presentation first slide is very clear, but I cannot... So, can you hear me, guys? Uh, full screen, maybe, please. Can you hear me, Dr. Glit? So maybe on the uh, at the bottom uh, menu, you can click the full screen mode. Yep. Can you try? What ah, now? okay. Yeah. Right. Great. Bottom. And I can make it move. Great. Okay, okay, okay. So, can, may can, I continue my presentation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you move to the Thanks. second slide, maybe? To yes, answer... it is the second slide. Okay, okay. Okay. So, green thinking, our core message, or this green university program's core message was the green thinking. How uh, universities can help this, uh, this paradigm shift this transition from the regular and old-fashioned thinking to the green thinking. I know it's a very radical shift, but unfortunately, we need to make these steps in order to create a greener, um, uh, a cleaner uh, future for us. So in 2022, uh, the UP, UP is my university, University of Page has participated in the international program of uh, UI Green Metric World University rankings. 
This program was launched by an Indonesian university and managed, coordinated by an Indonesian university, and for the sixth time finished among the leaders of the world's green universities on the 21st place. So now University of Page is the 21st so-called greenest university uh, on earth. It is also worth mentioning there is one, um, uh, no one single and universal receipt for solving problems and managing our organizations, institutions. However, there are several initiatives, paradigms, theories, strategies, and plans which could be suitable for provide solution. One of my obsessions is to uh, provide alternative. It is the most important thing out of other initiatives because if we have an alternative choice, if we have the opportunity to choose a cleaner, greener, more environmental friendly, more eco-friendly solution, then we can do our best. So, of course, it assumes an openness of the part of decision makers and implementation, the green initiatives, and, and, and naturally, we need uh, to provide the financial background as well. Nowadays, access to quality education is crucial for sustainable, sustainable development and the prerequisite for the achievement of other goals. Uh, higher education facilitates social mobility, empowers people through critical thinking and provides them with the skills needed in a rapidly changing labor market. Higher education contributes in various ways to making people more resilient and able to face various uh, challenges. And you can see on the slide, hopefully you can see uh, 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 the, the findings on the slide, what we have already implemented through this green university uh, project at our university in order to uh, carry out um, new green innovations regarding transport, transportation, energy use, waste management, water use, etc., uh, etc. Et there are more than 50 themes, 50 topics I'm sorry, um, Dr. Victor? in this green university program. Dr. Victor, I'm sorry because the slide is cannot move now from uh, slide to next slide. So could you please to uh, take an action? Yeah. properly so on my laptop. Ah, okay, okay. So you have, you, if you have a difficult to share and then to present your presentation material, so maybe the committee will try to solve this problem. So could you please wait for a moment? Maybe so from first, the committee? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, because sorry. your slides okay. now is only in the first slide. It cannot move to... Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Sorry for this. Okay, no problem. Maybe this is just a uh, <laughs> technical problem. Yeah, okay. Uh, how about this, Dr. Glit? Can you see? I can see it. Unfortunately, so, okay. I cannot navigate it now. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you can... Uh, give uh, some which slides maybe next or like yes just mm. go on go ahead please yes so, go ahead please uh, we were here somewhere just stop stop here please stop here uh, please. Uh, step goals and results okay yes yes, oh, yes. okay, okay, okay. please thought. please continue please continue. okay okay thank you so much so sustainable development is only possible if we radically change, as I mentioned, the way we produce and consume innovative solutions must be developed in a collaborative effort. Universities work with companies, uh, naturally other education providers and local stakeholders. In this regard, often supporting business creation through startups. This makes higher education a key facilitator in open innovation. Universities also provide the international links and pipelines needed to nourish local innovation ecosystems 
and achieve sustainable growth. So just let's go to the goals and results by skipping some slides. What can the universities do in order to fulfill the sustainable development goals? Because, because um, our core uh, initiative laid on to fulfill, to adjust to the sustainable development goals, the so-called major topics of sustainable development goals, um, and the so-called minor topics, um, uh, minor themes of sustainable development goals. And uh, we created three so-called ideas that I would like to share with you now. According to the first bullet, incorporate all aspects of the sustainable development goals in the university curricula, thus providing students with the knowledge, skills and scientific culture necessary to address the complex challenges of sustainable development through their careers. According to the second point, university governing bodies should adopt policies and implement strategic actions to address the SDGs. And the third point uh, talks about the specific examples. We have to practically eliminate the use of fossil fuels for heating and transportation. All university vehicles should be electric in the future to achieve high energy efficiency. And we should become energy producers instead of energy consumers. May I ask you to go ahead, please? Please, next. Next slide, thank you. So, what is that green idea means to us? Um, firstly, self-conscious protection of the environment and the mitigation of the environmental load caused by humans can contribute to the improvement of the quality of life and the well-being of people. Environmental awareness and the conduction of such a lifestyle is partly based on inner motivation, but it is also a form of behavior turned into action. While a conscious decision on the part of the individual assumes openness and a sense of responsibility on the part of the decision makers in addition to openness, will is the most important factor. Turning environmental awareness into action depends on several factors, but basically it means creating the possibility and providing an alternative so that employees, professors and students of the university have the chance to act responsibly and conduct environmental friendly, a more environmental friendly lifestyle. Would you please go forward? And let's see the results, what we have already achieved, fulfilled uh, through this Green University program uh, in the last eight years. The first was the implementation of the plastic bottle free university concept, renewable energy resources using mostly solar panels on the roof of our buildings, the university buildings, campus buildings, the enhancement of the electric car, and you can see some examples of uh, these achievement, this progression. Uh, I am very proud of our paperless administration program because we could save four tons of paper every single semester, four tons of paper, when we um, abolished, eliminated the print of uh, thesis and evaluations. So everything is going on online, um, uh, on an online platform. It is called Neptune in Hungary. And um, uh, students can upload, submit their thesis um, onto this platform. And the professors can evaluate, evaluate their thesis online also. And uh, it, it, it resulted four tons of paper, every, saving four tons of people every single semester. The university also participated in the mobile phone collecting event called Pass It Back Pro, 
Passit Back Pro. It was an action of waste management. Moreover, it has received the communication special award uh, by tossing uh, the, the outdated, um, the bad mobile phones, uh, Passit Back uh, uh, Pro. So we are also um, uh, proud of this, uh, this project as well. So uh, I would like to also emphasize the growth of the ratio of smart buildings and the utilization of water, water uh, efficient solutions. So it was also important for, uh, for us, uh, as I mentioned, alongside the SDG project points, we try to also adjust and implement those actions that could facilitate, help, foster uh, to achieve um, uh, to achieve the the results of uh, or goals of uh, sustainable development goals. So, what would you do differently at uh, the University of Page to create a more environmentally aware and more energy efficient and healthier lifestyle? It was our question. And go go forward, please. Next slide. Thank you. So, <clears throat> moreover, we um, um, installed the smart benches all over the university campuses operated by solar panels to charge uh, students' uh, mobile phones, cell phones. Uh, it was also a campaign. We, we tried to, to launch always campaigns in order to draw students and colleagues and professors and administrative stuff as well, uh, attention to the environmental problems, as well as at the same time, uh, we try to provide alternative solutions. And one of these, one of these solutions was the Smart Benches campaign. Of course, um, just uh, just it was a so-called sorry for this uh, this concept uh, ex expensive investment, but we try to to um, uh, expand and continue this project as well in the future. So use batteries and mobile phones could be dropped safely, pass it back pro campaign, uh, balloons were put out where anybody can refill their bottles. Uh, that's how we try to save uh, our, uh, the water and try to phase, it, phase out uh, the plastic bottles that you, students and professors um, have bought before a creation of the solar park. Um, it was also subsidized, um, um, uh, supported by the Hungarian government as well. So we use the biomass of the heating system. That's why uh, this biomass, biomass power plant could help the green transition, but of course, um, um, it wouldn't be, or or uh, it couldn't have implemented and uh, and and carried out without the help of our city. That's why the university strove to make a very close cooperation with the city. And we try to coordinate the university de development, developments, investments with the urban planning and city developments because the city and, and the university is like two cities, but we cannot separate them. It's really important. That's why we try to always strengthen the cooperation, collaboration with the leaders of our city. And installation of electric car charging point, it is also important uh, because, because the, uh, the electric car, car uh, fleet always expanding. That's why we needed to install this kind of charging uh, points. Next slide, next slide, please. Thank you. It was a very good uh, and progressive um, a project, the Solar Decathlon Europe. Uh, in 2021, uh, University of Page and, and colleagues of University of Page, together with students, uh, created the so-called passive house. That was a huge step, a way step 
uh, um, toward a greener, greener construction. And they won this Solar Decathlon Europe uh, award. It was a, a competition, an academic competition, uh, by creating, by constructing a so-called passive house that doesn't um, um, uh, 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 consume uh, energy, but produce energy at the same time. Next slide, please. Thank you. We have a decarbonization strategy. You can see later on if organizers share my presentation with you. It was also a very, very expensive project, but the European Union, the European Union Fund provided the sufficient amount for financial uh, background for this project. Next slide, please. And now I would like to talk about education. Uh, thank God we had many Indonesian students as well, and foreign students as well. I am one of the professors who, who uh, teaches um, sustainable development at University of Page uh, out of 200 other professors and students. We have more than 200 courses dedicated to sustainable development. And that's why, to me, it's really important to share my thoughts on uh, education. And I, I know I have only five minutes left and I need to leave also, but I would like to share um, a project initiative, what we have developed in the last uh, several years, couple of years. Please, next slide. Alongside the SDGs, we try to make a so-called role-play game, a simulation game, in order to involve students into a negotiation, negotiation process, in order to uh, um, uh, just broaden, broaden their, um, their view, their world view, their, their beliefs and, and mindset on uh, sustainable development. And uh, that's why we use the sustainable development goals and the 17 sustainable development goals in order to make a new project, a new so-called platform for teaching how to use sustainable development goals, UN sustainable development goals, in order to enhance the environmental awareness and trying to plan, trying to place uh, the, the, the importance of sustainable development goes into decision-making processes. Go on, please. Okay, next slide. You can see the 17 sustainable development goals. And next slide, please. So it was a so-called simulation game. Uh, I named it after uh, one of the buzzword of green movement, never say never. And I raised the question, do you want to live in a world with no poverty, no hunger, no racism and no war? A more green and more clean um, uh, future world. Is that the future you want? And then you can see how the simulation game uh, works. Uh, um, we try to enhance, we try to also develop the knowledge, the skills of students and uh, trying to, to change the attitudes of students, becoming more interested in policy making at global, regional and local level, became interested in local issues, engage at civil and political level. Go ahead, please. And you can see the phases of this simulation game. We have already organized five pilot games involving students from Hungary and foreign students as well, including Indonesian students as well, Polish students as well, Italian students as well, uh, uh, African students as well from Tunisia. And we try to, just through this project, we try to uh, develop, improve their negotiation skills by making very, very strong arguments alongside 
the 17 uh, sustainable development goals next slide please and at the end of this simulation game this uh, this role play game um, they needed to deliver a summary speech by making a con conclusion what were their findings on the one hand on the other hand what were the results results they achieved during the negotiation system uh, one pilot game just uh, uh, took place at our university in a classroom and and lasted 90 uh, uh, 100 not between somewhere 90 and 100 100 minutes um, uh, combined next slide please and then you can see feedback discussions but go on please then we we just go on please so you can skip these feedback discussions because at the end we checked, we, we assessed their, um, their knowledge, what they have gained over the simulation game. And our experiences are good, I need to say, because, or I can say, but I can hardly evaluate this project because we are in between, it's an ongoing project. We will finish, complete this project uh, next year on March and later on I can I can share my experiences how could we use the simulation game all over the world in order to help students professors colleagues to enhance our environmental awareness uh, sentiment our our eco-friendly eco-friendly attitude would you go on please skip the feedback discussion Maybe the, yes, of course. The, yes, the, you can. You can. Yeah. The conclusion, uh, you can, maybe. Uh, yes, you can find find questions and. Oh. Okay. 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 The recording regarding what students what students have studied studied during this uh, discussion this simulation game. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for Dr. Victor Glid for your presentation. But thank you, thank yeah. you so much for your attention. Yeah, unfortunately, so the committee only just have the presentation material until the feedback discussion, but I have your presentation material until conclusion. And then, okay, maybe that is no problem, but maybe some uh, a summary from me that, uh, and for your information, Dr. Grid, that uh, the Bonagoro University or University Bonagoro has also the program, namely as a green matrix, I think. You, yes, green matrix ranking, yes. Yeah, I think, yeah. Maybe, maybe in the next future we can share or collaborate for project maybe in the, in the, in the next future maybe. So maybe uh, hope your guidance in the future. Uh, and I think this is very interesting because I just know about the non, I'm sorry, uh, the game, yeah, non-formal activity. I think it's very fun if it can be applied to students or maybe high school students. I think this is very fun to know about more the SDGs. And well, thank you, thank you. It sounds great. I am really yeah. open to share my experiences yeah. and know-how and it would be really mm. great uh, uh, collaborating with your 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 university and other Indonesian mm. universities as well. Ah, thank you so much. Maybe for the next uh, agenda, maybe we have uh, maybe more time to discuss this, but However, because uh, I heard from the committee that you cannot uh, attend for the Q&A for the next session. Unfortunately, I need to leave. Ah, so okay. thank you so much for your attention so, and see you, see you in the future. Yeah, no problem. Uh, please wait for a moment. Dr. Glit from the committee will share your certification, certificate, yeah. So, congratulations, Dr. Victor Glit. Is it true? Is it okay? Absolutely, your ah, pronunciation is perfect. Good. Thanks a lot. Amazing.
Okay, Dr. Victor Clit, thank you very much for your presentation. For the audience, please give a big applause for Dr. Victor Clit. Congratulations, uh, Dr. Victor Clit, and stay safe and keep healthy. No, thank you so much. Yeah, thank next. you so much. The same, the same to you guys. Stay safe mm -hmm. and see you. Bye bye. Uh, bye bye. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, maybe I would like to uh, introduce for the third uh, keynote speakers as the last keynote speaker. Uh, how are you, Sensei Yamamoto? <laughs> this is Ganja. Hi. <laughs> yes, yeah, Ramas. Oh, yeah. Ganja. Um, yeah, yeah. Ah, Apakah Ganja? Kabar? Okay. Yeah, apaka, Yeah, bike, bike. <laughs> Saya. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, my I'm in Bunkal uh, Saran, uh, so yeah, <laughs> same time. <laughs> this is uh, I'm, I'm glad to yeah, see okay. you again now, maybe around six months from from April. Yeah. <laughs> so I would like to uh, introduce Professor Koichi Yamamoto from maybe could you please committee to share? Yeah, so Professor Koichi Yamamoto. Uh, Educational background is from uh, Faculty of Engineering, Hokkaido University, and then Graduate School Division of Engineering, Hokkaido University. And then research history is uh, recently, yeah, as a professor in Graduate School of Sciences and Technology for Innovation, Yamaguchi University. So maybe that is the brief introduction from me to save a time. Uh, so I think now the time in Japan is two time, yeah, uh, maybe four p.m. Is, is it is it correct, Sensei? Yeah, now I'm I'm in Indonesian time, so <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> now uh, two p.m. Okay. <laughs> so for this session, for uh, Yamamoto Sensei to present, time allocation is thirty minutes. So uh, could you please to share your Presentation? Maybe from the committee, please close. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, the audience, online, offline, could you, can you see the screen? Oh, not yet. Okay, okay, okay. It, okay. it, it is clear now. Uh, Yamamoto okay, Sensei, okay. please. Presents uh, in time allocation 30 minutes. Time is yours. Oh, thank you very much, Pak uh, Ganjal. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me as a keynote speaker. So I talk about the blue carbon storage and the water storage in degraded coastal peatland with green, gray combined infrastructure challenge to be overcome. So I'm showing here the situation of the coastal peatland uh, in Riau province. So my, uh, I'm now doing a research on the coastal peatland. And uh, now I'm coming to Bunkai Island again and uh, doing a research in the student exchange event in Bunkai Polytechnic. Okay, I will start. So I will be addressing three key topics that are of utmost importance in our fight against climate change. First, we will explore the carbon cycle and the crucial role of blue carbon in mitigating its impact. Then we will delve into the current situation of tropical coastal peatland uh, vital carbon sink facing significant challenges. Lastly, we will discuss the concept of ECHO-DRR, the integration of ecology and disaster risk reduction. Emphasizing the importance of green infra infrastructure in building resilience against climate-related hazard. It's ready to uncover the power of the carbon cycle. The blight of tropical pit, coastal peatland 
and the promise of eco DRL and green infrastructure. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the latest finding from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are clear and alarming. Human influence has undeniably caused rapid and unprecedented changes in our climate. Whether extremists are already being affected by our actions and the evidence is stronger than ever. This is a wake-up call that demands immediate action. We have a moral obligation to safeguard our planet for future generations. It's time to transition to a low-carbon economy, invest in renewable energy, and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. We must adapt and build resilience to the changes already underway. While uh, prioritizing the protection of very vulnerable communities and ecosystems. The choice is ours to make. Let's seize the opportunity for innovation, collaboration, and trans uh, transformative change. Together, we can create a more sustainable and resilient world. The carbon cycle involves natural and human activities that move carbon between different reservoirs in the environment. Humans are rapidly releasing carbon from st storage areas, causing carbon dioxide accumulation in the atmosphere in, and oceans. The global carbon cycle has fast and slow domains with turnover time ranging from few years to millennia. Since the industrial era, human activities have disrupted the cycle by transferring fossil carbon from the slow domain to the fast domain. This has increased CO2 levels in the atmosphere. The terrestrial Biosphere also plays a significant role in the carbon cycle, containing carbon in vegetation, soil, and the other resources, uh, other sources. Today, we are exploring the fascinating world of the carbon cycle and its association with global warming. Recent development have introduced a color-based framework to describe different type of carbon. This allows for more nuanced understanding of carbon role in our changing climate. Blue, green, and tail, red, brown, and black. So blue, green, and teal represent carbon stored in marine ecosystem, forest, wetland, and algae on the ice. Highlighting their crucial role in climate change mitigation. Conversely, black, brown, carbon impact, earth, heat balance and contribute to cryos cryospheric melting. Black carbon stems from combustion process affecting air quality and public health. Brown carbon refers to carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel combustion, a primary driver of global warming. This color-based approach expands our knowledge to comprehend to diverse functions and impacts of carbon. As we confront climate change, 
Understanding tailor strategies for mitigation adaptation. Today, I want to highlight the incredible carbon storage capacity of our coastal habitats, also known as blue carbon. These ecosystems play a crucial role in the global carbon cycle, burying and storing vast amount of carbon in the sea floor. Studies show that they can bury up to 329 teragrams carbon per year globally, accounting for at least half of carbon barrier in marine sediment. This capacity is 180 times and uh, the open oceans average bears the value of these blue carbon sinks and protects them from threats like coastal development and pollution. By investing in, the, in their conservation and restoration, we not only combat climate change, but also benefit from other ecosystem services. Let's shift our focus to tropical peatland, specifically in Southeast Asia, among the countries in the region, Indonesia has the largest area of peatland. As you can see from the figure, peatlands distributed regions such as East Sumatra, West and Central and South Kalimantan, and West Papua. Peat possesses unique characteristics. It contains over 20% carbon content, is acidic, and has a low bulk density compared to mineral soils. Additionally, it exhibits high porosity, approximately 80% resulting in excellent water holding capacity, but limited nutrient availability. In the image displayed, you can observe the peat core found in central Kalimantan, due to the presence of humic substances, peat exhibits a brown color coloration. Occasionally, we may come across remnants of root debris within the peat. Tropical peatlands are fascinating ecosystem with their distinct properties and distribution. Understanding their dynamics and characteristics is crucial for sustainable management and conservation efforts. I want to shed light on integrating aspect of it, uh, pit run. And their carbon compositions. Peat can be classified as green carbon or teal carbon due to the net product production plants within these ecosystems. However, during dry seasons or ex exceptionally arid years like 2019, peatlands can emit both black carbon and brown carbon. Take a look at the picture of the crowd. It may look like a mist of water, but it's in reality, 
It is a massive cloud of carbon particles, specifically black carbon. This invisible, invisible form of carbon dioxide along with brown carbon is emitted from peatland also. I had the opportunity to travel alongside the small key crowd in Jambi province. It serves as a stark reminder of the carbon emission that can arise from the peatlands. See this uh, a picture, uh, the vast area of the uh, Jambi uh, land has already uh, uh, the effect of the fire. Understanding the different forms of carbon released from peatland is crucial in addressing climate change and equality concerns. By researching and implementing measures to reduce these emissions, we can mitigate uh, the environmental impacts of peatlands and work towards a more sustainable future. future. I will explain the impact of combustion on carbon emi emissions. Peat combustion released around 0 0.19 to 0 0.23 gigatons of carbon to the atmosphere and an additional 0 0.05 gigatons from burning vegetation above it. These emissions account for uh, 13 to 14 percent of the global carbon emissions from fossil fuels. Moreover, this resulted in the largest annual increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration since records began in 1957. The consequences, uh, consequences of peat combustion on climate change are significant and demand urgent uh, attention. In just 30 seconds, so let's discuss the alarming greenhouse gas emissions caused by peat fire in Indonesia in 2015. These emissions surpassed the GHG emission from burning fossil fuel uh, in Germany. Notably, in 1997, an astonishing uh, 4 billion tons of carbon dioxide were estimated to have been discharged into the atmosphere. This figure highlights the severe environmental impact of peat fires and undergoes the urgent needs for action to address and minimize these emissions. So the, this is an example of the black carbon from tropical peatland. So I uh, lived in uh, Pukambar city in 2019. I experienced severe uh, uh, the smoky air uh, at that time. So the smoky air coming from the uh, combustion or the pit fire uh, and uh, it moved to the city and uh, people suffer from the, this uh, dirty air. So I remember that uh, all the people uh, suffered from the uh, dirty air at the time. Next is a tropical coastal peatland degradation from coastal erosion and bog bust uh, we are now uh, treating. So the, uh, besides the subsidence problem or the uh, emission of the carbon dioxide, we found that uh, uh, coastal peatland degradation, uh, especially by wave or the current uh, at beside the sea. So that uh, it, uh, extends the uh, erosion rate is totally uh, over 30 meters per year. 
So this is the current situation of coastal peatland degradation. Uh, I, I cannot uh, explain uh, much time to that one. So the, after mangrove de degradation, degradation, after 1960s, the mud flood erosion and coast, peat coast erosion uh, ha happened, and it caused unsustainable coast, coastal community. The uh, coastal erosion uh, is enhanced by the bog burst, uh, such as a uh, 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 similar uh, kind of the landslide. So this is uh, caused by the high groundwater table uh, by heavy rain at the pit run. So it caused uh, such a landslide uh, phenomena happen. Uh, beside the uh, coastal uh, pit run uh, degradation and uh, uh, discharge the pit materials into the sea, the uh, automatically re rehabilitation of the mangrove uh, observed in the Bunkais Island. So we need, uh, we will have the blue carbon uh, by this uh, effect, but the green carbon still, uh, uh, still uh, loose from the uh, land. So we are now trying to do with uh, uh, this kind of the uh, problem, and uh, uh, we are continuing a study with uh, JSPS and also the uh, the matching fund of the BRG uh, by Rio University colleagues. So the strategy to mitigate and prevent of the tropical coastal peatland degradation uh, is such a uh, schematics. So mainly by the uh, objective is uh, ma uh, mangrove rehab rehabilitation. And uh, to do that, uh, we need we need uh, uh, the measure for the coastal uh, protection by gray infrastructure and also the green infrastructure. So green infra infrastructure, uh, in this case, are the mangrove. But uh, to uh, rehabilitate mangrove, we need a uh, uh, gray infrastructure also. So we need uh, uh, water management to uh, decrease the bog burst uh, by uh, maintaining the water uh, and also the uh, enhanced discharge from the water in the wet season. So by the uh, uh, advanced dam. So we need, uh, we propose uh, such kind of technology uh, to the uh, government section. So the gray, uh, green gray infrastructure in coastal pit run is very important. Uh, so uh, this is my, uh, our uh, country's uh, gray infrastructure in Yamaguchi Bay. Uh, so the uh, green infrastructure and gray infrastructure uh, a uh, hybrid uh, can be seen at the uh, Bunkai Island. So the gray infrastructure successfully uh, uh, rehabilitate the mangrove. So once the uh, green infrastructure uh, will be mat matured, uh, we, uh, the, we can use this uh, green infrastructure to diminish the wave. So I uh, show the conclusion, and thank you very much for your attention. Right. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Yamamoto, for your presentations today. So maybe for the next uh, session is Q&A. But unfortunately, it is only for Professor Koichi Yamamoto because uh, the first keynote speakers and second keynote speakers has uh, another schedule. So maybe, firstly, I lead the Q and A sessions. Uh, so it will start from two thirty Indonesian local time. Maybe in Japan for thirty p.m. So this session will be fifteen minutes in length. So I'll give a chance to the offline audience here. Please give three questions. 
raise your hand and introduce your name and institutions. So, please, yeah, there is one question. Uh, the others? Is there any questions? The others? So maybe uh, for the first uh, questions, please uh, introduce yourself and especially your institution. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. And I want to ask to, <clears throat> to Professor Yamamoto from Japan. The question is, could you explain more about pit fire prevention through gray green infrastructure? Thank you. Okay, uh, can I uh, reply? I share again someone, something, something. Yeah, just because of the pit uh, materials property. So the, I talked about the uh, pit has a large uh, port, uh, large pores, and uh, if there is a uh, not so much water. Uh, with dry season and also the, uh, you know that uh, uh, in the oil palm, plant oil palm plantation area, uh, there is a ditch to convey the uh, fruits. And also the, uh, in Kalimantan case, uh, uh, there is uh, many ditches to uh, convey the uh, timbers from the uh, tropical, tropical peatlands. So such a ditch enhances the groundwater depletion by the discharging the groundwater from the peatland. It enables to use peatland for agriculture, uh, when uh, because the uh, peatland in nature, uh, wet, uh, very wet, uh, and wet in wet season, the groundwater table uh, attain around the surface of the pit. So, such in such a condition, uh, people cannot make uh, uh, any. Uh, uh, plants or fruits. So people want, if, if people want to uh, use pit run, uh, people need to uh, make dry. But making dry, uh, the carbon dioxide emit with, uh, by biodegradation. As you know, so the question was the how to stop the uh, pit drying. Okay, so let's see some picture. Yeah. For example, uh, this is a, in a case of the uh, real uh, province uh, ditch of the uh, in the pit run. Uh, there is a dam to store water to in, uh, enable uh, to enable the groundwater table rise up. Uh, government reg by the government regulation, the groundwater depths in pit run should be within 0 0.4 meter. And also, uh, the uh, far, uh, farmer use this ditch to convey the uh, roots. So to uh, to make uh, uh, to, to don't don't make fire in a pit run, the groundwater table rising is essential because uh, the moisture is. Uh, key to diminish fire in pit run. 
if the ground water table decreases, uh, peat uh, finally dry up, and uh, in case the peat uh, material should be uh, powder, it is very uh, easy to get fire. So to make uh, pit run uh, not to make fire, uh, many sectors are doing uh, such kind of the damming in the pit, uh, pit ditches. But uh, sometimes it, it is not success, successful because of the uh, this weakness of, uh, by, uh, from the degradation. Okay, was it uh, your answers? So, how about the answer? Is it enough or? <laughs> okay, okay, maybe that is enough, Sensei, from the. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe if you have uh, uh, another questions for the, you can uh, raise your hands. Maybe two. Questions from okay, okay, please. Okay, thank you for the opportunity. So my name is Ariadna Yovita, and related to carbon, you explained before. I want to ask, why do we distinguish the color of carbon? Is there any specific reason other than its specific sources? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a question. Uh, yeah, the color of carbon enable you to distinguish the source of the carbon. Yeah, so the carbon color, uh, yeah, so that you can imagine the rock as the yes, carbon particles and gases. And green carbon means that uh, uh, vegetation, body, and also the stored uh, organic materials in soil. And the blue carbon, uh, blue carbon is uh, 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 means that the uh, carbon material in the uh, marine environment. So teal and red is somewhat uh, newer, newer uh, color of carbon. It also uh, organ carbon it, uh, by uh, uh, biological activity is similar to the green. We, we cannot hear your voice. Professor, yeah, please wait for. Uh -huh. oh, okay, okay, please, uh, please, please continue oh, okay. because okay. there is okay. some. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, so, maybe the uh, internet connection problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that you can imagine the. We are sorry for this technical problem. Maybe Professor Yamamoto has uh, trouble in internet connection. So uh, please wait for a moment. Mm -hmm. Maybe is there any one questions more? So before I move to the online audience. No? Okay. Uh, hello, Professor. Okay. Maybe unconnected now <laughs> from Professor Yamamoto. Ah, sorry. Ah, okay, 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 no problem. No problem my, my hotel Wi Fi is not so good. <laughs> ah, no problem, Sensei. Please continue. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that, yeah. A uh, carbon color is very easy to uh, remind you of carbon source, so you, you can use it. 
Yeah, that's all. Oh, okay. How about that? Uh, is it clear or you have other? Okay. Okay, that is the uh, from uh, the question from the offline audience here. Maybe I will will give an opportunity for the online uh, asker. So please, uh, I I I saw I, I see here there there are forty two participants from the online. Please ask the questions. We still have a time, maybe around 10 minutes for the Q&A. If you uh, have a dif difficult to give a questions uh, uh, online, so maybe you can chat, uh, text the chats here, and then I will try to read your questions. Is there any question from the online audi audience here? So I will not uh, close the questions from the online, so uh, from the offline aud audience here. So maybe if there still have uh, questions from the offline here. So, okay, uh, maybe I will give uh, Sensei uh, maybe one question, Sensei. Is it, okay, Sensei? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so it is interesting that colors of carbon is mm, consist black, brown, green, teal, red, and blue. So in case of your studies now, your works in pet, uh, Pitland, so it is focused only in uh, black and brown carbon. Is it correct, Sensei? Mm, yeah, yes, mm -hmm. various carbon is emitted from the pitland. Yeah, so the black uh, by the combustion and uh, uh, so the. Okay. Yeah, black is a combustion and pit. Uh, yeah, small, small particles from the. Oh, right. small, small particles. Sm smoke, smoke. Oh, smokes. Okay, see. Yeah, yeah. So, and also the, yeah? Yeah, so the goals of this uh, study is how to mitigate, and the target is blue carbon. Is it correct, Sensei? Or ah, yes, finally, a blue carbon okay, by okay. Uh, green and gray infrastructure. Mm. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, we need to store blue carbon and also the green carbon. Uh, we need we need to keep the green carbon. Yeah, yeah. Maybe as you know now in Indonesia, we still have a problem with the fire forests. Uh, maybe you know that from the Sumatra Island and maybe Kalimantan Islands. So I think yeah. Uh, still difficult but i think this study will help some stakeholder here uh, maybe scientists researcher to develop more so maybe if sensei opens the opportunity for the researcher around the world especially if, uh, the audience here maybe sensei uh, can invite to uh, Yamaguchi University, maybe, or collaborate in the Riau, because as I know that Sensei uh, uh, have a time, uh, pleasure time in the Riau, but I don't know now. How about now, Sensei? Uh, now, uh, have you, 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 go, uh, you you're talking about fire? Yeah, about your opportunity to uh, Riau University Riau. Yeah, now mm. I'm uh, seated in. Uh, now I'm in Rio. <laughs> oh, not now in Rio. Oh, in Indonesia. Yeah, yeah, yes. So, yeah. if Professor Yamamoto have a chance, maybe please come to Semarang. <laughs> yeah, I hope. Okay. Uh, can, can I? 
talk about the next uh, mm. conference uh, with uh, what? Uh, no, no symposium. I we will have just a minute. Yeah, this. Just a minute. Yeah. On ninth, uh, please come to our uh, symposium online. Just like this. Oh, okay. Yeah, I register. I register also for this uh, seminar. Yes. Yeah. So the yeah. So the uh, I run researcher coming here. Uh, coming coming to the uh, online seminar, and we talk about the peat mass movement yeah. issue in tropical peatland. That's uh, very new. But uh, so today we yeah. cannot uh, talk about it. Uh, I cannot talk about it because of the time. Yeah. Yeah. So, very so the, yeah. 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 Please uh, subscribe. <laughs> that yeah. So I. Yeah. Yep. Maybe for the offline and online audience, please register if you have a time. At, uh, on what time, Sensei? Nine September. Yeah. So the September. Nine, nine September. Oh, okay, okay. From th three p.m. and to seven p.m. In okay. Western Indonesian time, three to seven p.m. So yeah, in the afternoon. So maybe is there any questions from yeah. the? Yeah, I will post to the chat. Yeah, thank you so much, Sensei, for the sharing. Yeah, uh, this is uh, Sensei give a link for the re registration. So please, if you have a chance or occasion time, so please register. This is. Definitely free to involve. So I could not find any question more, Sensei, online or offline. Uh, how about committee? Can we close the yeah, session? So, oh, Sensei, thank you so much, Sensei. This is the certificate for yeah. presenting your works. Uh, is it correct, Sensei, Professor Koichi Yamamoto? Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, Thank you very much. Congratulations, uh, Professor Yamamoto. Terima kasih banyak. Yeah, greetings from Diponegoro uh, University here, and uh, I say thank you so much for your opportunity to present your work here, and thank you. Goodbye, Sensei. Yeah, thank you very much. Goodbye. Yeah, yeah. bye bye. Big applause bye. for uh, Professor Yamamoto. Okay, uh, closing from me, thank you very much for to audience online and offline for attending these sessions so far. And likewise, I would like to say thank you very much for the committee giving a good, good opportunity to be involved in this international conference. As a chairman, I want to apologize for any mistakes in accommodating these presentations from keynote speakers. So at this time, I'll give time for the committee to take the next sessions. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you very much. First of all, we would like to say thank you to Insinyur Ganjar Samudro Sarjana Teknik, Magister Teknik, Doctor of Philosophy, Insinyur Profesional Pratama as the moderator in this session. 
And also thank you for the amazing material session from Dr. Tranti Pong Quinn from Vietnam who already gave the material regarding converting waste into value-added materials. We also would like to say thank you to Dr. Victor Klit, Doctor of Philosophy from Hungary, who already gave the material regarding every green step counts. As well as big thanks to Professor Koichi Yamamoto from Japan, who already explained the material regarding blue carbon storage and water storage in degraded coastal peatland with green gray combined infrastructure challenge to be overcome. We hope that the knowledge will be useful for us in the future. Now we are moving to the most awaited session, which is the awarding session. The awarding session will be conducted by Chairman of INCRED 2023, for Dr. Yustina Metanoia Pusparis-Kita, Sarjana Teknik, Magister Teknik, please moving on to the stage to announce and give the certificate to participants who got the best paper and the best presenter. Good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. In this occasion, as the chairman of INCRIT 2023, I will read uh, the best pep presenter from each class and two best paper uh, that have held today. So first, I will uh, read for the best presenter Class A. Congratulations for Mr. Michael Ambarita. Class B. Mrs. Nur Anissa Putri Manggarini. Class C, Hu Jia Sun. Class D, uh, Mr. Wiwi Budiawan. Class E, uh, Melanie Litwina Pandiagan. Class F, Rini Suryatini. Class G, Alda Putra Bagaskara and Wiken Mayarati. Class H, Nur Udin. Class E, Elma Rosana. And Class G, Landung Esa Riti. Moving to the next, it's the best paper. Uh, congratulations for Natasha Umga Amtia and Teams with the paper Analysis of the Potential of Watershed as a Source of Raw Water in the Batang Integrated Industrial Area in Cluster One. Congratulations. And the second one is uh, Zahura Choudhury and Teams with the title of the paper Comparison between the plastic waste influx of a rural river in Indonesia and Japan. Congratulations for all the best presenter and best paper. Hopefully this award can give us a lot of benefit. As a chairman of INCRIT 2023, I would like to say thank you for your attention. Good afternoon, and we will see in the next year. Thank you.
Congratulations once again. We hope this achievement will strive you more to create new innovation for environment. Before we close this event, we will watch together the company profile of Increate 2023. <laughs> As we know, today's technology is increasingly advanced. People are competing to apply technology to streamline their work, especially artificial intelligence technology, which is very popular everywhere. This technology can be used in various sectors, including the environment. It is time for us environmental activists to see this technological development as an advantage to manage the environment effectively and efficiently. For this reason, the International Conference on Environment, Sustainability Issues, and Community Development, or INCRIP, gives a platform for professionals, researchers, and academicians to share their experiences and explore the possible influence on the future. INCRIP 2023 comes with the theme of reinventing integrated solution to environmental problems in the era of environmental intelligence, where the theme this time is very new and follows technological developments. INCRIT can be a place to build connection between researchers, students, and industry to continue working together to produce work for the environment. INCRIT 2023 provides a platform to continue exploring, discovering, and developing works that can later become a new start for environment development. INCRIT 2023 brings several topics and subtopics regarding the environment that revolves around zero carbon by implementing a circular economy in other methods, namely environmental health and safety environmental science, technology and education, green infrastructure, energy conservation, and efficiency. Input progress from year to year has great hopes of becoming an international forum that can be developed by researchers, students, industry, and government to communicate their research results and exchange ideas about its basis and application in the environment. INCRIT can also be a conduct for ideas to help improve technology and produce a better earth from year to year. to listening the closing remarks that will be delivered by the head of environmental engineering department please welcome dr engineer sudarno sarjana technic master of science Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that this event should be start of something great because we have a gathered here right now and we could make something real about it. Finally, the iCrit event has come to an end. I hope that was conveyed and be maximized and applied in the future and will be useful. With the focus topic being environmental health and safety systems. And we really hope that this can be applied for our common welfare, which, although not currently needed, will definitely be needed in the future. I hope what I'm delivering today can make us care about our environment, because the good environment has the good effect to our health. Thank you very much for your attention today and for everyone who have and support these events. 
I'm sorry for any words I'm pleasing you. Hopefully, next year we can meet at this event again. That is all for me. I think that's enough. And once again, I say thanks a lot and see you soon. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Thank you to Mr. Sudarno for the closing. Ladies and gentlemen, we're coming to the end of the conference. It has been an insightful conference and enjoyable experience for each and every one of us. To close this conference, we have special quotes for you. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. I am Sabrian Sah Arya Pramuditya. And I am Ataya Salsabila Putri Maharani. On, On behalf, behalf of, of all, all the, the committees, committees, we would like to say thanks to all the participants for your enthusiasm and participation. All participants may leave this meeting after we play the credit video. Stay, Stay safe and, and see you in the next Increase 2024. 2024.